another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. <laughs> Tonight's curious adventure is... The Echo of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Phantom Clue. No, no, please. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Hold him still. They're just like that. This has got to look right. No, I'll... I'll do anything you say. I'll forget everything I know. Only don't... <laughs> Ugh. All right. He's dead. Now, come on. Hello? Yes, this is Nick Carter speaking. A case? What kind of case? A disappearance? Well, that's hardly in my line. Uh... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Yes, I understand. All right, expect us late this afternoon. Did you get that on the extension, Patsy? I should say so. Echo Valley Lodge, private amphibian plane waiting for you at the airport. Come at once, never mind the fee. <laughs> who is this Howard Manstead who tosses money around like confetti? A well-known millionaire sportsman, Patsy. But, um... Wouldn't it be more to the point to ask about the man who's disappeared? Oh, you mean James Dello, the columnist. Why, he... he... Hey, who is he, anyway? That's what you get from not reading the financial pages of the paper, Patsy. Well, come along. We've got to find a taxi and get to the airport. Well, aren't we going to take anything with us? Oh, yes, of course. I was forgetting. I thought you were. I'll need my new dress. You want I... Scubby. Call him and tell him to meet us at the airport. He knows Thurlow. They write for the same paper. But well, aren't we going oh, to... Oh, and take... one other thing, Patsy. Bring along volume three of the encyclopedia, E to H. Scubby Wilson in volume three of an encyclopedia. That's just what a girl needs for a visit to a millionaire's hunting lodge. Though seldom visited because of its somewhat inaccessible location, Echo Valley is a natural freak of singular interest. I have friends you could say the same thing about, but the encyclopedia doesn't mention them. Quiet, Scubby. Let Patsy finish reading. Echo Valley is of great interest to scientists. Sounds occurring in certain areas of Echo Valley may be repeated as many as 13 times, echoing from cliff to cliff in gradually diminishing volume. Why do encyclopedias always use so many words to say so little? Hmm. That's what I wonder about newspaper reporters sometimes, too. So we'll change the subject? <laughs> what else does it say? That's all. Well, that's no help. Thurlow certainly wasn't carried off by an echo. Oh, he's probably just lost in the woods. In any case, I don't see why Manstead insisted on you coming out to look for him, Nick. You're no Indian guide. Patsy, if Thurlow isn't found alive, it may cost the public millions. Millions? Well, he's just a columnist, isn't he? Just a columnist? He's the smartest financial reporter in New York. And Thurlow's more than just a reporter, Patsy. In the financial column he writes, he sometimes tips the authorities off to big stock swindles and other kinds of financial skullduggery. Right. It was Thurlow who broke open the Nemo Bank scandal three years ago and sent the whole board of directors to prison. And for some time, Patsy, Thurlow has been hinting in his column that he was on the verge of revealing some kind of tie-up between certain politicians and uh, one or two big operators. It would rob the public of millions. Oh, then if anything happened to him now, before he's had a chance to tell anybody what he knew, the scheme would go through his cash flow. Right. That's why he went to Echo Valley Lodge. Manstead, an old friend of his, invited him out so he could work in peace for a few weeks. Scubby. Huh? Is it true that Thurlow was on the verge of a nervous breakdown when he left? Oh, he was walking around in circles talking to himself, Nick. Hmm. He had almost all the dope he wanted, but he still hadn't got the name of the guy behind the whole scheme. He took along a whole bunch of records of stock transactions. He said they might give him the clue he needed. And, hey, look, ahead of us. Echo Valley. It is, isn't it, Nick? No doubt of it, Patsy. But look, that isn't any echo flying toward us. A plane. Nick, it's a plane flying up out of Echo Valley. Yes. Yes, it's a private amphibian. I thought this plane of Manstead's was the only one in these parts. Now, the pilot's seen us. Huh. He's turning out of our line of flight. 
You suppose he wants to avoid us? I'll bet he doesn't want us to see his markings. He is trying to avoid us. Oh, pilot, swing over so we can get a look at that plane down there. Right, Mr. Carter. He knows we're trying to get closer to him. Look at him bank to avoid us. He's turned back. He's heading away from us now. A pilot, overtake that plane if you can. Yes, Mr. Carter. Say, isn't that the Manstead hunting lodge down there, right on the edge of the lake? Yes, Cubby, it is. But we're not going to land until we get some idea what that plane's up to. Look, he's diving straight down now. He's going to try to get away underneath us. Oh, he'll never make it. Those private planes aren't filled. His wing is breaking off. Couldn't take the strain. He's heading straight for the ground if he hasn't got a parachute. Oh, but he has. Look, he's jumping. The other shoot's jumping. And there goes his plane into the trees. Well, that was a narrow escape. He didn't have more than 500 feet of altitude. Oh, he's come down on the top of that tall pine. He's caught there. See, his parachute won't come loose. Yes. Well, we'll have to land and rescue him. Besides, I want to know why he was so anxious to avoid having his plane identified. Oh, pilot. Yes, Mr. Carter? Land in the lake and taxi up as close as possible to the place that fellow came down. Yes, Oh, wait a minute, Patsy. I'll lift this one up for you. There Watch you go. Okay. Branch doesn't Thanks. snap back in your face, Patsy. Oh. Well, aren't we almost there? Yes, there's the clay ringer. Just ahead. Only a few more steps. Oh, and they say exercise is good for you. Oh, there. There's his parachute. I think I can see him hanging among the branches. He's hurt or he'd call to us. Come on. His shroud lines are caught among the branches. I can see that much. Well, he's just just dangling there. Yeah. Hey, you up there. Can you hear us? You all right? He doesn't answer. Look, I'll climb up and see if I can... No. Wait. What is it, Nick? Look at those shroud lines. They're, they're wrapped around his neck. Yeah. Look at the way his head is twisted to one side. Yes. His neck's broken. He's dead. What? Oh. When he landed in the tree, he got tangled in the lines and... I wonder. Nick, what do you mean? Look down at your feet, Scubby. Huh? Cigarette butt. What? Somebody must have been here before us. Maybe. But its position makes me think the cigarette was smoked by him up there. Oh, but that's impossible, Nick. It's been just about an hour, Scubby, since he crashed. He knew we'd come after him. So if he was hurt and couldn't get out of his chute harness, what would be more natural than for him to smoke a cigarette and wait to be rescued? But he... he's dead. Because somebody reached him before we did. And murdered him. <laughs> That's the story, Mr. Carter, as much as we know, anyway. Thurlow just wandered away yesterday morning and never returned. Hmm, I see, Mr. Manson. And you don't think this mysterious airplane we met just before we reached here has any connection with Thurlow's vanishing? Well, I don't see how it could. But then, as I said, I haven't the slightest idea where the plane could have come from or who was flying it. Well, now let's go over the facts again, if you don't mind. Oh, of course not. Thurlow arrived here a week ago? Yes, with his wife. I had them flown in in my plane. They had the lodge to themselves with my permanent housekeeper to look after them. And you arrived yesterday? In the middle of the afternoon. But Thurlow wasn't here when you arrived? No, he'd already gone out. Hmm. He told his wife he was taking his revolver along and would take pot shots at the trees and rocks. So you never actually saw him? That's right. The woodsman I employed to look after the property asked me to come and examine some trees he wanted to cut down. About sundown, I got back to the lodge and Thurlow still hadn't returned. Mrs. Thurlow was becoming worried. I ordered the floodlights we used for landing the plane at night, but he didn't show up. And then in the morning, you called me. Well, first I phoned the nearest forest ranger station. And after that, Mrs. Thurlow was so agitated, I had promised I'd send for you. Where is Mrs. Thurlow? I'd like to ask a few questions. Well, she's sleeping now. She was up all night, and this morning the housekeeper gave her a sleeping tablet. Shall we wake her? No, 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 no not just now. There's still an hour of daylight left. I'd like to take a look around outside. Perhaps I'll... Fi- I'll open it. Uh, Mr. Manstead. Johnny. What is it? His hat. 
We found it. Thurlow's hat? Where? Near the waterfall. Why, that's not far. It's only a mile from here. It's still light. Do you want to come with us and look for him, Mr. Carter? Yes, I think I do. Oh, boy. There, there. There's the hat, Mr. Manstead. In that bush. But what in the world could Thurlow have been doing in here? This isn't the trail to the waterfall. It isn't a trail at all as far as I'm concerned. It's a jungle. It used to be a trail to an old one-room cabin, but there's no reason Thurlow would go there. Well, maybe if we yell, he'll hear us. He might be in there with a busted ankle or something. Go ahead and try, Scabby. Thurlow! Thurlow! Good gosh, will you listen to that? Well, that's one reason this is called Echo Valley. The cliffs around the waterfall down the trail make a perfect sounding board. Well, if he didn't hear that, he must be dead. If there's a cabin in there, we'd better take a look at it. Right. I don't see what in the world Thurlow could have come this way for, but maybe he did. Let's find out. There it is. Where, Manson? Oh, there, between those two trees. See it? Oh, yes. It's only another 40 yards. Well, come on, then. Oh, Scubby. Wait. Well, sure, Ned. What is it? That bare patch of ground there. Those footprints. Thurlow's footprints. You sure, Scubby? Sure. I've seen those pointed shoes of his too often not to recognize the footprints any place. Come on, Nick. Um, yes, yes. I'm coming. Thurlow's a tall man, isn't he, Scubby? He's a tall man like I'm Henry Ford. He's about five feet five. Why? I thought it... Well, never mind. There's the cabin. Gosh, it doesn't look as if it had been opened in years. Well, it hasn't that I know of. But there are Thurlow's footprints going right up to the door. And somebody's opened the door recently. Look at these broken spider webs around the door jamb. And it won't open now. Here, let me try. It ought to open without any trouble. Yeah, but... Doesn't budge. <laughs> That's strange. Let's take a look through the window. The window's boarded over. The boards haven't been touched. I nailed the window up myself three years ago. Nobody came here since. And someone has come here. Thurlow. And he must be inside now. But the window hasn't been touched. And the door is barred on the inside. It looks bad. We'd better break the door down. Suppose we have old Johnny use his axe on it. That'll be quicker. Of course. Johnny, smash the door open for us. Stand back, please. That door was locked to stay locked. Starting to go. Yeah, that does it. It's open. You don't mind? I'd like to go in first. Of course. Uh, it's dark inside. Here, take my flashlight. Thanks. There he is. Thurlow. He's... He's dead. He came here, bolted himself in, and shot himself with his own revolver. Yes, he's dead, all right. And it does look like suicide, doesn't it? <laughs> now, now, Mrs. Thurlow. Jim couldn't have killed himself, Mr. Carter. He couldn't have. I'm sorry, Mrs. Thurlow. I wouldn't intrude on your grief if it wasn't necessary. Now, first of all, what kind of mood was your husband in yesterday morning just before he disappeared? He was very agitated. Agitated? Well, do you know any reason why he should have been? I, I think he just found a clue to the identity of the man he was seeking. The one behind this plot to upset the stock market. Did he say who it was? No. No, he just said he'd stumbled on a clue. And he was so shocked he could hardly believe the evidence. That was why he went out into the woods. He wanted to be alone to think the matter through. And perhaps his notes will tell us what he found. Yeah, I thought of that, Nick. After Mrs. Thurlow woke up and I talked to her while you and Scubby were out with Mr. Manstead, we tried to read his notes. But they're in some kind of a shorthand that nobody can read but himself. I can make out a few words here and there, but not enough to help. Well, we'll have another try at it later. Uh, please go on, Mrs. Thurlow. Well, that's almost all, Mr. Carter. Jim went out about ten in the morning. 
I stayed here in my room reading. About half an hour later, I thought I heard a shot. All of a sudden, I was terribly frightened. Frightened? Of what? I, I don't know. It was just a feeling. Then, then I heard the far-off echo of somebody hammering. It was... Oh, it, it sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. And I'm positive it meant that Jim was dead. <laughs> it's probably someone chopping down a tree, she heard me. Anyway, she went back to her reading and forgot about it. Then around one, man said from the village, that's a little town about ten miles from the hills, for Johnny to come for him in the station wagon. Man said phoned. Well, didn't he fly in by plane yesterday? Seems not. A plane was in New York getting a new propeller, so he took the night train. Is that so? Anyway, Johnny went to meet him. He got here about 2.30. The rest of the story is just the way he told it to us. Nick Thurlow must have killed himself. There just isn't any other answer. I wonder, Patsy. I wonder. Hello? Yes, speaking. Did you get the dope I wanted? He was. And the plane? Then check every airfield within 50 miles of the city. Yes, I know it's a big order, but somebody's playing this game for big stakes. No, that's all. Call me back when you've learned something. Oh, uh... Oh, hello, Carter. I... I didn't know anybody was here in the library. I took the liberty of phoning New York. I was trying to check on that mysterious plane that we saw crash yesterday afternoon. I see. Did you learn anything? Nothing yet. You know, I have a theory about that plane, Carter. I'd be interested to hear it, Mr. Manstead. Well, we're only a hundred miles from the border, and in the past, planes engaged in smuggling aliens into this country have landed in this region. Now, I'm willing to wager this chap, who was so anxious to avoid being seen, was engaged in doing something like that. Hmm. Certainly sounds plausible. Nick! Oh, Nick! Oh, yes, Scubby. Oh, there you are. Oh, top of the morning to you, Mr. Manstead. Good morning. Say, I was looking for the two of you. Or a stranger Thompson or two of his men are down at the landing waiting in your launch, Mr. Manstead. They want to get started down the lake to bring in the body of that flyer who, uh, <clears throat> who was so unlucky when he bailed out of his plane yesterday. Uh, of course. Uh, you're coming with us, aren't you, Carter? I guess, indeed. I'm just as interested as you are to see if your theory turns out to be right. Oh, what about Patsy? Shall I go find her? Oh, no, Scubby. She's staying here in the lodge with Mrs. Thurlow. They're going to spend the morning going over Thurlow's notes, trying to decipher them. Well, let's get going. I want to get back in time to phone a story to my paper. <laughs> I'm afraid it's no use, Miss. Please, just call me Patsy. It's just impossible to read these notes of Jim's, Patsy. They're not only in his own shorthand, but most of them are in code, too. Here's something that seems as if it might mean something. See, it says, I can H-B it. H-B. Mm-hmm. Hardly believe. I can hardly believe it. Yes. Yeah. Of course, that's what it means. And here's some more. It's clearer. Shall I tell Manstead what I know? The next line. Better not. Instead, must get back to New York. Well, that's clear enough. But the next line. My life. M-B-N-D. That doesn't mean anything to me. My life. M-B-N-D. My life may be in danger. Oh. And then there's just one last sentence that he never finished. To think that the one man in the world. And that's all there is. Oh, oh, if it only finished. To think that the one man in the world. Oh, who do you suppose he could have meant? I can't even make a guess. The one man. Mrs. Thurlow. What's that? Mrs. Thurler, we're going to go and take a look at that cabin now while all the others are away. I have a theory, and we're going to find some evidence to prove it. It has to be there. It just has to be. Hello, Nick, my friend. 
Hey, what's troubling you? You've been sitting out here on this rock for an hour ever since we got back. Looking mean enough to bite your grandmother. Scubby, that poor devil of an aviator whose body we brought in was murdered. And Thurlow was murdered. And I can't prove it. But, Nick, couldn't you be wrong? The aviator certainly looked like a natural accident. And Thurlow, if I ever saw a case that looked more like suicide, well, I don't know where it was. Well, that's just it. The aviator, I can explain. Someone slipped through the woods, reached him before we did, climbed the tree he was caught in, and strangled him with the shroud lines in his parachute while pretending to help free him. But Thurlow, his own footprints leading into the cabin. The window boarded over and the door bolted on the inside. If somebody killed him, well, how did they get out? I don't know, Scubby. It isn't possible. And it was done. I'm going to break the... Hey, Scubby, what's that in your hand? Oh, just a shiny new nail I picked up somewhere. Somebody must have been fixing something. A nail? And Mrs. Thurlow said she heard the echo of hammer blows the morning her husband died. Yeah, said they sounded like somebody hammering down the lid of a coffin. <laughs> they sure have imagination. But that's just what she did here. Huh? She heard the echoes of somebody nailing down the lid of a coffin. <laughs> must be a clue. There must be. But we've been all over the cabin inside and out a dozen times now, Patsy. If there was anything here, we'd have found it. Mrs. Thurlow, somehow your husband was murdered here. And his body left inside this cabin so it would look like suicide. And I'm going to find out how the murderer got out, leaving the door and window bolted, or or die. I'm afraid you're much more likely to die, Patsy. Oh, oh Mr. Manstead. Yes, Mr. Manstead. After we returned to the lodge and I learned the two of you had disappeared in this direction, I thought I'd better find out what you were up to. You? You killed my husband? Of course he did. Who else could your husband have meant by the one man in the world he'd never have believed guilty? But, but he was Jim's friend. That's what he wanted you to think. He pretended to be a friend so he could always keep checking on what your husband learned. And he invited you both here so he could commit murder if he decided it was necessary. Oh. A very interesting theory. But I'm afraid I can't give you a chance to tell it to anyone else. Johnny! Right here, Mr. Manstead. Come inside and close the door. What are you going to do to us? He thinks he's going to kill us. He hasn't got that gun in his hand for fun. Johnny, the old mine shaft is close by. Now, if these two ladies out walking had the misfortune to stumble into it, it would be very tragic, wouldn't it? Lots of people fall down old mine shafts. So they do. And I'm afraid another such accident is about to happen. You can't get away with it, Mr. Manstead. Nick Carter won't let you. Oh, well, perhaps even clever Mr. Carter may have to have an accident. Help me silence him, Johnny. Quickly. No, no, Nick! Nick! Quiet! No! Quiet, I say! All right, now, Johnny, knock them both on the head and keep them quiet. All right, let Manstead, go. let go of her. You, Carter! Nick, look out, his gun! Drop it, Manstead, or I... Johnny, kill him! Kill him! Johnny, put down that axe or I'll shoot. Yes, sir. He, he's dead. I'm afraid so. That's it. Uh, either of you hurt? No, Nick. You came just in time. But how? How did I know Manstead was a murderer? I knew that from the time we found this cabin. But it took an echo to prove it. The echo, Mrs. Thurlow, that you said sounded like someone hammering. But, but I don't understand. Scubby's bringing Ranger Thompson. As soon as they get here, I think I'll be able to clear up a lot of mysteries. So Manstead was behind the plot that Thurlow uncovered. He invited Thurlow here in order to find out what he knew. He discovered Thurlow had evidence which would tell him the truth. And therefore decided to eliminate Thurlow. But, Mr. Carter, Manstead didn't get here until after Thurlow was dead. He came by train. And... Oh, Ranger Thompson's right, Nick. He appeared to come by train. Actually, he flew in the night before, in a plane whose pilot was used to taking big fees for keeping his mouth shut. That was the plane that we saw crash. Something delayed it from leaving in time to avoid us, and in the pilot's effort to keep away from us, well, we all know what happened. But, Nick, why was the pilot murdered? That was Johnny's work. As soon as Thurlow saw the crash, he sent Johnny by a secret trail through the woods to make sure the pilot didn't live to talk. Otherwise, his murder scheme would have collapsed. Isn't that right, Johnny? Yes, sir. So Manstead flew here the night before he murdered Thurlow. In the morning when Thurlow left the house, he and Johnny waylaid him. Is that it, Nick? That's it, Patsy. They brought him to the cabin here. 
Manstead put on his victim's shoes and made a trail of footprints. I see. Then they killed Thurlow, put his shoes back on him, and left him in the locked cabin. A clear case of suicide. But Manstead made a mistake there. His footprints were too far apart. They were the steps of a tall man. When Scubby said Thurlow was a short man, I began to suspect. Well, it certainly does sound plausible, Mr. Carter. But you've still got to convince me Manstead could get out of that cabin and leave the door barred from the inside. Make it good, Nick. Johnny knows the answer. You all remember that Mrs. Thurlow said she heard the echo of hammer blows. You mean she really did hear someone hammering? Exactly. This is a small cabin with a roof lightly nailed in place. Now look up there. What's that flashing in the sun? Looks like nail heads. Somebody's hammered new nails into that roof all along this side. Nick, is that the clue I was looking for? That's the clue you were looking for. Scubby and I saw it yesterday, but we weren't smart enough to know what it meant. Here, I'll take Johnny's axe and push the blade in under the eaves and pry upward like that. What the... The whole roof's lifting up. Well, blow me down. Manstead and Johnny pried up the flimsy roof before they killed Thurlow. Then leaving the door pod, they climbed out. And Johnny nailed the roof back into place. Right. So they were hammering the lid on the coffin, so to speak. Thurlow's coffin. And due to the curious echoing qualities of the rocks, the sound carried to the lodge. And Mrs. Thurlow heard it. I didn't think it meant anything until I noticed the nail Scubby picked up someplace. The nail Johnny must have dropped. And then I remembered the hammering sound Mr. Thurlow spoke of. And suddenly the whole thing was clear. Well, it sure wouldn't have been clear to me if you hadn't explained it, Mr. Carter. I certainly wouldn't ever have worked it out with just an echo for a clue. Oh, but that was an unusual echo. Remember how cleverly it answered? And when it comes to answers, Scotty, Nick Carter is the man who gets them. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter called The Echo of Death, or Nick Carter and the Phantom Clue. The curious adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, are brought to you every Monday night at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. We'll let Nick himself tell you about next week's story. What'll it be about, Nick? I call it Death Across the Tracks. It began with the murder of a detective. A railroad detective who lived in the station alongside the tracks. He was working on a case, but he had it only partly solved when he was murdered. And I picked it up from there. I'll say you did, Nick. You almost picked up a few bullets into the bargain the way the victim did. (laughs) When you called it death across the tracks, you were right in more ways than one. This sounds more and more intriguing. And how did it wind up, Nick? Well, we'll tell you that next week. But I can say this much. I had a stroke of luck. Nick always calls it luck when he uses foresight. Good night, folks. (laughs) Yes, good night, folks. And good night, Patsy and Nick. In tonight's strange adventure, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy was impersonated by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at half past nine o'clock Eastern Wartime, listen to another curious adventure of Nick Carter entitled... Death across the tracks. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight train. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. And here's a special note. Beginning next week, Nick Carter will be heard over most of these same stations on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. The Cisco Kid will be presented on Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Calling Nick Carter. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. This week's curious adventure is... Murder in the Crypt. Or Nick Carter and the Jekyll God. There. 
He'll never know that I came here this time any more than he did the other times I was here. <laughs> Those footsteps coming this way. It, it's Anubis. Anubis. Oh, it can't be. I am Anubis. Guardian of the dead. No, no. I must be dreaming. I am Anubis, the jackal god. But you're not... No. No, no. Scarabs from Abydos. Condition good. Come in. Are you Dr. Waldemar? I am. I'm Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. You called me about a museum guard who disappeared? Of course, of course. It's about Shelby, the chief attendant here at the Egyptian Museum. Uh, where and when did this Shelby disappear, Doctor? He failed to report to me as usual before leaving last night. The guard on the door say he did not leave the building. Mm. We've hunted everywhere for him, but we haven't found him. Oh, you've hunted everywhere, have you? Yes, Lieutenant. Everywhere except in the crypt of Snepru. Uh, the, the what of who? The crypt of Snepru, an Egyptian king of the fourth dynasty. Mm. And where is this crypt? In the basement? No, it's on the second floor, directly above this office. Mm. It was installed especially for Professor Glidden, the archaeologist. He alone has access to the crypt. It has a special lock on the door. Oh, you mean he has the only key, huh? Precisely. I called Professor Glidden's apartment a while ago, but he did not answer. I presume he is on his way down here now. I hope he can shed some light on this mystery. Hmm. Nick, isn't this the Egyptian Museum across the road? Yes, Patsy, it is. Never been in it? Mm Mm-mm. Looks too much like a mausoleum for me. Are we going in to look at the mummy? That, Patsy, depends entirely upon Professor Glidden. Who's he? That bearded man who is beckoning to us from the doorway of the museum. Oh, I see him. Is he a client of yours? Yes. He phoned just before you arrived at the office this morning. What does he want? That, I don't know, Patsy. Suppose we join him and find out. And you say, Professor, that the Archaeological Society gave Dr. Walnemar the money to complete the museum. Yes, Mr. Carter. Mm-hmm. Provided that he would install a special crypt where uh, I could place the relics from the tomb of King Snepru for examination and classification. So the crypt is officially your property? For the present, yes. When my work is finished, it will be open to the public. I see. And uh, just where do I come in? I want you, Mr. Carter, to be present when we search the crypt. So there will be no question that Shelby is not there. This is Dr. Waldemar's office? It is. Oh, good morning, Gooden. Uh, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Hello there, Lieutenant well, Riley. Uh, well, Hello, Nicholas Lieutenant. Carter and Patsy, too. We haven't seen each other for a long while. Uh, now, don't tell me that you're looking for this man Shelby, too, Nick. I am, Riley. At the request of Professor Glidden. Oh. So since Dr. Waldemar has asked you to perform the same service, Riley, why don't we work together? We're glad to, Nick. Fine. So you wouldn't object if Lieutenant Riley helped search the crypt, would you, Professor? Not at all. Well, Riley, shall we adjourn to the crypt? Right, Nick. The crypt is on the second floor, right over this office. Come, come, Glidden, unlock the door. This is an intricate lock, Waldemar. It takes careful handling of the key. There. Uh, where's the light switch, Professor Glidden? Uh, just inside the door to the right. Very well, I'll... <laughs> well, would you look at that now? <laughs> I never saw a statue to resemble that beast. The body of a man and the head of a dog it has. I'd call it the head of a jackal, Riley. Uh-huh. Am I right, Professor Glidden? You are, Mr. Carter. A bronze statue is a life-size figure of Anubis, the jackal god. Anubis was the guardian of the dead, 
And his statue was set at the entrance of ancient tomb to keep out thieves. The jackal face is enough to scare anyone away. Come along, Riley. Let's look around inside the crypt. Okay. Well, here's a mummy case, which I suppose contains old King's nephew in person. Quite right, Mr. Carter. Yeah, now here's the old boy's throne. <laughs> it looks like the original Morris chair. Let's see. There's nobody hiding under it, Riley. Okay, Nick. See, yeah, now look over there. In the alcove over behind the statue. Now what is it? An ancient Egyptian bathtub? That, Riley, is a sarcophagus. Huh? The stone coffin. The one that once contained the mummy case we just saw. Gosh, now it's a big thing now, ain't it? What's all this crazy writing on the front of it? Those are hieroglyphics, Riley. Inscriptions about old King Snapru. Hmm. What's inside this thing, Nick? Oh, probably nothing now, Riley. Just the big oak. Now, what is it, Nick? This sarcophagus is not empty, Riley. Huh? Shelby's in it. Oh. And he's dead. <laughs> Once again, Lieutenant Riley, I must reply that I know nothing of this matter. As I've told you, I scarcely knew Shelby. Now, look here, Riley. Your evidence against my client is purely circumstantial. Ah, uh, Nick, it's a disgrace to the memory of old Sim Carter, the way his one and only son tries to misinterpret the bald facts. The bald facts in this case is this, Riley. You have no proof that Professor Glidden even came to this museum last night. Look, all I want is one more bit of circumstance, Nick. Dr. Waldemar, can you think of anything else that might be... Will interest him in this case? Now, let me see. Look, Nick. A strange woman coming down the corridor toward us. Ah, she looks like something revived from ancient Egypt. She walks like a cat. You can't hear the slightest footstep. Quiet, Patsy. She's stopping close enough to overhear us. Uh, Lieutenant Riley, huh? I have it. Ask the professor just how he knew that Shelby was missing when he telephoned Carter this morning. I yeah. shall answer that question, Dr. Waldemar. Who, say, where did you come from? Who is this lady, Dr. Waldemar? Allow me to introduce Madame Dakla, our librarian. Oh, you have a library in this museum? Oh, yes. The library is in the other wing near the elevator. I was the person who informed Professor Glidden that Shelby was missing. I telephoned him this morning. After the search began. And Professor Glidden telephoned me, Riley, asking me to come here to protect his interests, which I have so far tried to do. Mm. Madame Dakla comes from Cairo. She's an Egyptian, well-versed in ancient lore and legend. Madame Dakla, do you really believe those old Egyptian legends? I must believe them. With my own eyes, I have seen the living Anubis walk through the corridors of this museum. But that statue couldn't possibly get out of a lost crypt. To Anubis, anything is possible. It is his duty to guard the treasure in the crypt. What treasure, Madame Dagla? Treasure that is found in the tomb of every Egyptian king. Anubis, the avenging jackal god, knew that the museum god Shelby sought the treasure. So Anubis sought Shelby and killed him and put his body in the crypt as a warning. Anubis is all-powerful. You mean you've actually seen this, uh, this jackal god walking around this museum recently? Anubis, the guardian of the dead, leaves the crypt of King Snefru and prowls these corridors every night. I have seen him do it. Gosh. That will be all, Madame Dakla. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Nick, suppose we go through that crypt again and see what we can learn. An excellent suggestion, Riley. Patsy. Suppose you go around and wait in the library with Madame Belka. We'll join you there later. Ah, Nick. This crypt is as solid as a rock. We've tested every inch of floor and walls and ceiling here. Yes, Riley, every spot we've tapped seems to be solid stone or concrete. Uh, Nick, suppose we check those measurements again, eh? Oh, no use in that, Riley. The room's 30 by 30, with four feet out for the door on one side, and eight feet out for the alcove on the other. Mm. Uh, how big did you say that sarcophagus was, Nick? It's eight feet long and six feet wide. Practically the same size as the alcove it's standing in. Mm. And it's four feet, six inches high. Why? And I was just thinking, Nick, that's an awful big chunk of rock there. Well, Professor Glidden says this one weighs over 1,100 pounds. Uh, it's over half a ton. 
This goes to show that the floor in this crypt must be solid to support such a weight day in and day out. There's an answer to this case somewhere, Riley. Mm. Even if I don't know yet where it is. Come on. Let's get back to the office. Yeah. If I'd followed my better judgment, I'd have locked Professor Glidden in a jail cell first. It wouldn't be wise just yet, Riley. Uh, you're wrong there, Nick. And I'll tell you why. This door here is the only way in and out of that crypt. And this key, the only key there is now, belonged to Professor Glidden. Riley, I want to learn the motive behind Shelby's murder. There were some strange things going on around this museum. Three ancient anklets, one job. Come in, come in. Oh, it's you, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, are you convinced that only Glidden could have entered that crypt upstairs? I never like to accept the obvious, Dr. Wallabar. Oh, there goes the closing bell. I must put these Egyptian relics back in the vault. Oh, we're right ahead. A large vault, that is, Dr. Waldemar. Yes. The museum requires a large vault. I have this one built here in the wall, especially. Was it included in the original plans for the museum? Well, no, not exactly. This wing of the building was still unfinished when the architect died. In completing it, we made some minor changes. I see. Doctor, do you think Madame Dacla... You must excuse me for a few minutes, Carter. I must speak to the attendants before they leave. It was one of poor Shelby's duties. It will only take a few minutes. By the way, Patsy, Hmm? there's something on Waldemar's desk that should interest you. You mean that odd-looking jar? Mm Mm-hmm. It contains some ancient Egyptian perfume, he said. Hmm. Smells like roses. Very strong. You better put it in the vault, Patsy. All the arm must have overlooked it. And can you smell it, Nick? Powerful stuff. Yes, I can smell it all right. Put it in one of the shelves in the vault. Oh. What's the matter, Patsy? I just tripped on a small step at the front of the vault. You didn't spill any of that priceless perfume, did you? Oh, I'm afraid... Yes, I did spill a few drops of it, Nick. Well, don't tell Waldemar. Oh, I hear him coming. Come out of the vault and look innocent. Okay. Well, Carter, another day is done. Oh, if you please stand away from the vault, Miss Bowen. I should like to close the door. Thank you. By the way, Doctor, was there any treasure buried with King Sneferu? Probably. It was the custom... But it is also probable that such treasure was stolen centuries ago. Well, isn't Lyndon interested in the matter of treasure? Possibly. But he's more interested in translating the hieroglyphics on the sarcophagus. Hmm. Well, Patsy, I must be going. You must be going? You mean you're going to leave me here in the museum? Only for a little while. I want you to go back to the library and have a talk with Madame Dacla, Patsy. Talk about what? I'll tell you that while we're walking to the other wing. Good night, Dr. Wallemont. Good night, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter isn't interested in ancient manuscripts, Madam Dacker. He wants to see the architect's plans for this museum. Oh, but he should ask Dr. Waldemar for those. I don't think Dr. Waldemar has them. Mr. Carter wants the original plans. I shall be glad to see if I can find them for you. I shall try the file cabinet by the door. Well, they're not under A for architect. And they are not under B for building plans, either. I shall try under M. Mm. Museum plans. What's that clumping sound out in the corridor? Yes, yes, here they are. In this folder. Plans for Egyptian museum to be erected Look, in the... coming through the door. Anubis. Welcome, Anubis. Anubis gives no greeting to those who defy him. I have never defied you, Anubis. You have sought the treasure that I got. Never, never. I have always... <gasps> Let go! Let you are! Let go! Away, away, you are! Hey, hey, now, what new mischief is going on here, Nick? O'Reilly, a dozen times. Huh? Patsy was just going to tell me. Who was it took Madame Dacla away, Patsy? It was somebody... Somebody who looked like Anubis, the jackal god. What? 
Really, Nick? Madame Dacla had the plans of the museum in her hand. And they're gone, too. Nick, this time we're going to look in that crypt upstairs first. Come on. I'd find that light switch now, Nick. Right, Riley. Yeah, there she is, laying right at the feet of that that creature Anubis there. You mean the statue of Anubis, Riley? Well, it may be a statue now, Nick, but I am near to believing that the thing comes alive when it chooses. Madame Dacla alive? Oh, oh, she, she, she's still breathing, Patsy. Oh, what do you make of it, Nick? She's oh. in drug, Riley. Quick, get her over to the door where the air is pressure. Yes. Oh. That's right. Ah, she's oh. coming around now. Where, where am I? You're all right, Madame Dacla. Oh, but I am, I am in the crypt now. And the last I knew, I, I was in the library. I knew it. I knew steel doors are no barrier to Anubis. Uh, help her outside, Patsy, so, so I can lock the door. Here. You lean on me, Madame Dacla. But I tell you, it is useless to lock that door. Anubis can pass through all barriers. Maybe so, but Professor Glidden can't. Come on, Madame Dacla, I'll take you back to the library. Then I'm going to put the professor in jail where I can keep my eye on him. From now on, there'll be no Patsy. Hmm? When Riley opened the crypt just now and found Madame Dacla, did you notice the peculiar fragrance in the place? I must have been too excited to notice it, Nick. What was it like? It was the perfume of roses, Patsy. Musty, ancient roses. You should have recognized it. You mean... It was like the perfume from the bottle I spilled in Waldemar's office? Yes, Patsy. It smelled exactly the same. I admit nothing, Lieutenant Riley. I can't tell you how either Shelby or Madame Dacla got into the crypt. It's like I've been trying to tell you, Clinton. It's very simple. You had two keys, but you only gave me one. And as I've been telling you, Lieutenant Riley... There was no duplicate key. Stay out. I'm busy here. I said stay... Hello, Riley. <sighs> Hello, Glidden. So it's you again, Mr. Nicholas Carter. Well, I don't care whether Professor Glidden is your client or not. We're not releasing him. I don't want him released, Riley. I just want to ask him a few questions. Tell me, Professor Glidden, when you sent those relics of King's nephew to the Egyptian Museum, did Dr. Waldemar have any chance to examine them? Why, no. They were all heavily boxed and crated. That is, everything except the sarcophagus. That was handled separately. Waldemar installed the sarcophagus in the crypt before I arrived. I see. I, I seem to recall that Shelby helped him set it up. The boxes and crates were all upstairs when I got back. But I opened them alone and set up everything myself, including the statue. That's all I wanted to know. I'm sorry, Professor, that you'll have to spend the night here. But I hope to arrange a release by morning. All right, Sergeant. Take the professor to his cell. Yes, sir. Come along, Professor. Say, Riley. Mm. Will you do something for me? Why should I? Why shouldn't you? You'll learn something yourself. And that's always a help in a murder case. Mm, all right, Nick. When can I lose? Fine. Pick up Patsy. She has all my notes. And you may need them. And both of you go to the crypt. Where will you be, Nick? I have to attend to another matter first. Now, listen carefully, Riley. Mm. Here's what I want you to do. When you get to the... How long have we been in this crypt, Lieutenant Riley? Oh, it's about 15 minutes, Patsy. If you didn't have a luminous dial on your watch, I'd say it was hours. Why did Nick say that we should stay here in the dark? <laughs> You'll have to ask Nick that when he gets here, Patsy. Where did Nick say he was going? Well, no, it might be that he's calling on Madame Dacla. What? Oh, it's just a questioner, you understand. Oh, Riley, of all the ridiculous notions. <laughs> well, Dacla's boyfriend, Anubis, is right here beside us, Patsy. Do you see it? Yeah, this statue of Anubis must be solid bronze, Patsy. If nothing happens here, something will happen when I find Mr. Nick Carter. <laughs> Only ten minutes more, Patsy. I'm getting so used to this darkness, I can see the sarcophagus plainly. It looks so big. Yeah, it is big. It's almost... What's that? I don't know. It sounds as if something was happening at last. 
Riley. Hey, what is it, Patsy? You're not, you're not getting hysterical now, are you? Riley, I smell something. The perfume of roses. And it's getting stronger. Now, what is the perfume of roses to do with all this here? Riley, look. Look at that sarcophagus. Patsy, what we're looking at can't be happening here. Oh, but it is. That sarcophagus is rising straight up in the air. I've always said that, that, that seeing was believing. Look. I see what's doing it, Riley. You, you, you can't tell me that, that anything that will make a stone coffin weigh, weigh in half a ton go floating up in the air five feet off the floor, Patsy. It's on top of an elevator, Riley. Uh, an elevator? Sure, that's what's lifting it. Well, glory be. You're right, Patsy. That's what that rumbling sound was. Riley. Yeah. The man coming out of the elevator with a flashlight. Wait till I draw my gun, Patsy. I'll fix it. You're too late, Riley. Uh, I have you covered. It's Dr. Waldemar. Why... Riley, that elevator is the vault from Waldemar's office. Quite right, Miss Bowen. I have you both covered. Don't try anything, either of you. Well, what would you be trying, Waldemar? There will be two new victims in this vault, Lieutenant Riley. Uh, two fools who, like Shelby, found out too much. But I'm sorry it isn't three. Nick Carter would be a welcome addition. You really mean that, Waldemar? Nick, where are you? Carter, how did you get here? I've been waiting for you in King Snepru's sarcophagus. And now if you... I'll kill you first, Carter. I doubt that. Uh. Okay, Patsy. Look out, Patsy! He's knocking over that statue! It's falling over! Uh. The professor will be along any minute now, Patsy. He called me at the hospital and asked, they asked me to meet him here outside the crypt in 15 minutes. Said he wanted to examine the elevator in the crypt. Was Waldemar dead, Nick? No, Patsy. I only wounded him. He knocked himself out when he staggered against the statue of Anubis. Waldemar made a complete confession when he recovered consciousness. He's admitted that he was hunting for the king's treasure and wanted to find it before Professor Glidden finished translating the hieroglyphics. And he was using the elevator to make secret trips between his office and this crypt. Exactly, Patsy. When Waldemar completed the new wing of the museum... He modified the original plans and put his office at the end of the first floor corridor. Then he built this crypt on the second floor, right over his office. Evidently, the elevator was already installed, and Waldemar brought the sarcophagus up on top of it. And there was a sarcophagus standing in an alcove that was really the elevator shaft. Mm -hmm. The elevator itself became the vault in Waldemar's office. He disguised it with shelves and loaded them with curios. But it was still an elevator. And you think Shelby found out about it? Shelby must have helped Waldemar arrange things. Since it was more than a one-man job. And then later, Shelby decided to look for the treasure on his own. Apparently. Waldemar confessed that he murdered Shelby for those very reasons and left the body in the crypt to blame the crime on Professor Glidden. And Waldemar put Madame Dakla in the crypt so Glidden would be blamed again. Exactly. But he didn't have to kill Dakla. She knew nothing, you see. He merely grabbed Dakla in order to get the original plans of the museum. Here comes the professor now, Nick. Oh, hello, professor. Right on time, I see. I'm so glad to find you here, Carter. I wanted you to be here when I examined the crypt in the elevator. I want no more surprises. Well, I don't think anything else is going to happen up here, Professor, but I'll be glad of the chance to do a little extra looking around myself. Oh, there's that Anubis again. He's on his face this time. It was quite clever of Waldemar to disguise himself as Anubis. He really did resemble the statue. Look, Nick. Where, Patsy? There at the statue lying on the floor. Uh, why, the head is completely turned around. Yes, the fall must have knocked it loose. Oh, Give me a hand with it, Professor. We'll set it up again. Oh, certainly, Carter. Uh, it's pretty heavy. But yes, it is. It... Oh, no. Go. What? Go. Oh, Nick, is it real? I imagine it is, Miss Bowen. Why, this must be the treasure of old King Snuffloos. So that's where the royal treasure was hidden. Valdemar must have looked everywhere except in the head of this statue. So Anubis was really the keeper of the treasure. Well, congratulations, Professor. Mm -hmm. And I hope this discovery makes up for all your troubles. It does indeed, Mr. Carter. I shall now be able to visit Egypt again. Well, Nick, there is just one problem that still bothers me. And I suppose, as usual, that the problem represents the crux of the whole case. It does. When I put that jar of perfume on the shelf, did you already know that the vault was an elevator? I did, Patsy. The elevator floor wasn't quite level. That's why you tripped as you went into the vault. But of course. But, Nick, what made you think it was an elevator in the first place? It's quite simple, Patsy. 
There had to be an elevator to take the sarcophagus up to the crypt on the second floor. But, Nick, there's an elevator in the other wing of the museum. They could have taken the sarcophagus up that way and wheeled it across to the crypt. Patsy, how large is the sarcophagus? Why, it's eight feet long and six feet wide and four and a half feet high, didn't you say? Mm Mm-hmm. And how wide is the door to the crypt? Four feet, according to your measurement. Exactly. Now, Patsy, do you think you could put a sarcophagus four feet six inches high through a door only four feet wide? Of course not, Nick. Of course not, Patsy. Not even Dr. Waldemar could do it. Up through the alcove was the only way. Waldemar probably hoped that no one would think to compare the size of the door to the size of the sarcophagus. And nobody did, except Nick Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called Murder in the Crypt, or Nick Carter and the Jackal God. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick and Patsy, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story is full of action, isn't it, Patsy? Action is right. You see, Nick investigated a murder on a lonely place called Skull Island. Yes, And there were only four people on the island who could have committed the crime. But it took a model of a clipper ship and a sea serpent to find out who the murderer was. It also took Nick Carter and a smart piece of deduction on his part to work out the answer. But what did a sea serpent have to do with the murder? Well, we'll tell you all about that next week. In the meantime, I'm glad I don't have to say sarcophagus again. So long. (laughs) So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by John Clark, Patsy by Helen Choke. The story was written for Nick Carter by Walter Gibson. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Murder on Skull Island, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Sea Serpent. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Patsy, out you go. This is it. This is what, Nick? A studio of magnificent pictures, of which Joseph Stone is the owner and director. Well, there goes another illusion. I thought movie studios were all bright lights and glamour. This place looks like a stage set for the deserted village. Well, it's been locked up for the past ten years or so. Oh. Oh, That's funny. The gate's locked. And that's our cue to turn around and go home again. You've got a nice, tasty jewel robbery waiting for you to solve back in town, and you should be working on that. Instead of being way out here at the end of nowhere, playing around a forgotten movie studio. I guess I'll have to pick the lock. Okay, if you must. Patient Patsy will bear with your little game. This is no game, Patsy. Why, what do you mean? The house of Lulu Doré, the star of Stone's new picture, was broken into last night while she was at a dance. She was wearing her jewels, including the famous emeralds. Fortunately, though, nothing was stolen. There. There we are. All right, Patsy, go ahead. Huh. It's funny there isn't a gatekeeper around. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, I guess they haven't got a full staff for the studio, considering they moved back from Hollywood just to do this one show. Why did they do that, Nick? Oh, Doré had a run-of-the-pay contract for the show she's doing on Broadway and couldn't go west. Hey, there, where do you think you're going? Oh, so there is a door, uh, Gateman. I am looking for Mr. Stone's office. Well, you can't see him. I'm afraid you don't understand. I'm Nicholas Carter. Mr. Stone's expecting me. I'm taking my orders from Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police. He says to admit no one. Riley? What's he doing here? 
Investigating the murder. Murder? I thought you said robbery, Nick. What murder? Come on, get out of here. I got my orders. Come on, Patsy. Let's find Riley or Joe Stone. Hey! You can't do that. Come back here. It's all right. I'll explain to the police. Hurry, Patsy. Hurry. What, what is this, Nick? So I plan to find out right now. Then I take it this fellow Boyd who's been killed is a fairly unimportant chap, eh, Mr. Well, Stone? Well, yes, he, he was just a darn good electrician. Huh. Doesn't seem to be any connection between his murder and the attempted robbery of Miss Doré. Well, no, there doesn't. Is Lieutenant Riley here now? Yes, yes, he's over on stage five. It's that building over there. Do you want me to come with you? Yes, I wish you would, Mr. Stone. There may be points I'd like to ask you about. Well, I'd be glad to help, of course, if I can help. There's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Stone. You say Boyd was shot in the back with a poisoned arrow from a blowgun. It's an odd weapon. It should be fairly easy to trace. You don't have to trace it very far, Mr. Carter. The blowgun and the arrow were mine. Yours? Yes, well, you see, 11 years ago, I tried to do a picture about a voodoo witch doctor who used the blowgun in it. I don't suppose you remember the picture, Mr. Carter. It was called the voodoo curse. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You had a bit of trouble over it, I believe. A bit of trouble? It practically drove me into bankruptcy. I'd imported a real voodoo witch doctor from Haiti, and he put a curse on the whole studio. Oh, come now, Stone. You don't really believe that. I don't know what I believe anymore. Eleven years ago, we had fires, we had explosions, we had mysterious thefts. We, we had just about everything. It got so that everybody was scared to work here. I had to close the studio, and, and now we have a murder. Why should the witch doctor put a hex on you? Oh, I had an argument with him, though, with a salary of some sort. He, he swore he'd break me, and he almost did. Well, here, this is stage five. Here. Well, well, Nicholas Carter. Hi, Riley. <laughs> and Patsy. Hello. Well, what might you be doing here? He's come to help you, Lieutenant. Well, that's very obliging of him, I'm sure. Say, was that a crack? Why, of course not. Well, let's get to work. Riley? Where was the body found? Right over there by that door, Nick, where the chalk marks are. Hmm. I wonder what he was doing way over here. He, he was setting up the stage, as I told you. But all his equipment's over there, clear across the set. Riley, how was he facing when he died? He was lying on his face with his head towards that door, Nick. Shot in the back, wasn't he? Yep. We figured from the angle of the arrow that the blowgun fellow must have been sitting up there on that catwalk when he killed him. Mr. Stone... What's behind that door that Boyd was heading for? Well, special electrical equipment, I believe, for special effects. Would Boyd have known that? Well, yes, of course. He worked on this stage years ago. He, he probably would have remembered. That's it, then. He was going into that room to see if he could find some special equipment he needed. That accounts for his being way over here. And you think there was something in there the killer didn't want him to see, Nick? Right, Riley. Let's go in. Just lock, Nick. Oh, Stone, uh, give me your keys, will you? Keys? I... I, I have no keys for these rooms. Well, did Boyd have any? Well, I believe he had borrowed the caretaker set. Riley, did you search the corpse? Of course I did, Nick. No keys? No keys. I, I can get a locksmith out from the village. What? You have no duplicates? The place has been locked up so long. I, I never expected to come back here. I was trying to sell it, as a matter of fact. Take the lock, Nick. This seems to be your day for doing that. Just what I'm going to do, Patsy. I'll, I'll get you more light. Oh, he doesn't need light. He can see in the dark, practically. No, you don't have to see to pick a lock. There, there, and there. That's it. Now we'll get a look at what your killer didn't want Boyd to see. Here, here's a light switch. Oh, wait, wait, mm. wait. Don't crowd in like that. Uh-huh. Look. Footprints. Footprints in the dust. Golly, Nick, there goes your theory. Boyd was here before he was killed and took out whatever it was he wanted. Well, it was a cute theory while it lasted. Maybe it's still a cute theory, as you call it. Uh, all we have to do now, Nick, is to measure the prints and see if they're boids or not. They're not. How do you know? Yeah, you haven't even seen see the body. These prints were made by leather sole shoes, right, Riley? Well, yeah, you're right, but... And Boyd was wearing rubber soles. How do you know he was, Nick? Correct me if I'm wrong, Stone. Don't all technicians on the soundstage wear rubber sole shoes to kill any noise that the soundtracks might pick up? Well, you're right, Carter, they do. Now, those leather sole prints mean that it wasn't Boyd, but our friend the murderer who used the keys he took from Boyd to get in here. And they lead to that crate. Let's see what's in it. No, don't walk on the footprints. We need them as evidence. I'll wager you'll find the crate empty. The murderer didn't just walk over to it, look in and walk out again. Oh, no. He took away everything he didn't want Boyd or anyone else to find. You're right, Nick. The crate is empty. Uh, shall we search the room, Nick? Well, what's the point in that? If there was anything here. It's gone by now. Murderer seen to that. I wonder what was in this crate. I wonder if... Help! Help! No! Oh, 
Oh, Nick, the poor kid. What is it, Carter? Another murder. Another? Good Lord. Can you identify him, Stone? Why, it, it's Bill Daly, our camera punk. Camera punk? What's that? Oh, it's studio slang for assistant to the camera. Hey, oh. you, you people all run too fast for me. Hey, oh, what's up here? See for yourself, Riley. Well, good gosh, another murder. Uh, and it looks from his position as if he was just coming out of that door over there. Well, that's funny. Both he and Boyd... Any idea what he was doing around here, Stone? Uh, yes, I... I sent him over here myself about an hour ago to look in that warehouse, see if there was any of that old photographic equipment we could remodel and use. Priorities, you know. Daly was very clever at that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a mean-looking knife he's got sticking in his throat, Nick. Knife? Good Lord. Well, what is it, Mr. Stone? That, that knife. It's from that same voodoo picture. There seem to be a few too many of those old props hanging around. Are there any more? Yes, there's a complete stock of weapons. Everything we used in that confounded picture. The voodoo curse? Yes. I rather think I'd like to see that film, Stone. Is there a copy of it around here anyplace? Well, as much as we ever shot of it, it was never finished, you know. Could you run it off for me? Well, certainly I will. I'll go arrange it now. Thanks. Well, Nick, what do you think? I'm not sure. Any opinions yourself? Yes. My money's on Stone's doing it. Stone? Why in the world would he do it? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out the reason for it yet. But he acts kind of funny. Nervous, sort of. And he keeps talking about the place maybe being haunted. Oh, good heavens, Riley. Who wouldn't be nervous with all this murder going around? I know I am. Well, take the weapons, Nick. They all belong to him. But other people could have access to them, Riley. After all, Stone hasn't been here for over ten years. Mm. And there's something more important you've overlooked, Riley. Mm. What's that, Nick? How did Stone manage to throw that knife at Daly while he was with us? How do I know? We were all so busy looking at that star room on the set, he, he could have sneaked up. By golly, I'll bet that's how he did do oh, it. Oh, that's Stone beckoning to us. You want to go to see the movies, Riley? I got better things to do, Nick. I'm going to search this joint. How about you, Betsy? Sure thing. But why do you want to see it? I'm not sure, Patsy, but I've got sort of a hunch that the answer to all our questions lie hidden in that old picture. Did all movie projectors make this racket ten years ago? Most of them, Patsy. Mm. Now listen. You don't believe in our voodoo magic, eh? Well, if you've been here long enough to see some of the things I've seen. Really, Ross, there's something uncanny about these natives. Call it coincidence if you like. Who's the woman? Me, it's Gosh, she's good looking. That's Lula Dore, the star of the picture stone shooting here now. Well, their voices sound funny and teeny. Yeah, they certainly do. Easy enough to scoff when you've just come down from the States. But it is magic. There's no other way to explain some of the things that happened. Magic mumbo-jumbo, you mean. You'll never convince me it's anything else. I suppose this is another of those wild dances. Now, there's a really good voice. Who is he, Nick? Now, don't tell me you don't remember him, Patsy. Uh -uh. The name was Bart Tyson, great leading man, ten years back. Oh, I remember his name, of course. This is rather better than most of the dances I've seen. Patsy, I've heard that voice very recently. picture must be almost over now, Nick. Have you discovered anything? I'm not sure yet. Gosh, they had some pretty fancy photography in those days. I, I thought all that underwater swimming stuff was comparatively new. Oh, no. Stone was the first person to use it. Well, how did they do it? Look at that man swimming. It couldn't be faked. It isn't. It was taken through some sort of a glass tank. That native has been underwater for 20 minutes. No human can hold his breath that long. That's what I've been telling you, Ross. They're magic, these natives. Magic. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. That voice. I've heard it somewhere before myself. I never heard Tyson act before. Hey, don't we see the ending? No, nope. that's all they made, Patsy. The picture wasn't finished. Well, did you find out what you wanted to? I'm not quite sure. Well, Mr. Carter, did you like the picture? Oh, a very interesting stone. Oh, well, that Lula Dory certainly is beautiful, isn't she, Mr. Stone? I've never seen her in pictures before. Has she done anything else? No, nothing. Until now that she's starring in my new show on Broadway. That's funny. I think with her looks and her voice, she'd be a sensation. Mm, that's what I've always claimed. But, well, she got scared off after all these things happened during the filming of this one. And, well, she's stuck to Broadway ever since. 
And when Tyson and her leading man were searched, she rather felt... Oh, I was wondering what happened to Tyson. From what I could gather from this show, he should have been a natural for talking. Oh, he was. But we had a bad explosion, and his whole face was terribly scarred. That's why we could never finish this picture. He never could act in pictures again. Oh, what a shame. Well, Stone, thanks for showing us the film. Mind if we scout around after Riley? Oh, no, not at all. I, if you need me, I'll be on stage three. We're going to start shooting soon. Good. It's funny about Dore. She seems to be cropping up in our lives all over the place. Yes, she does, doesn't she? Betsy, if you find a telephone, get hold of Scubby. Mm-hmm. Find out what you can about Bart Tyson and what's happened to him since the accident. Okay, Nick. Where'd you be? If I don't see you before, I'll meet you at Stone's office at noon. Right. Oh, Nick! Nick Carter! Oh, Riley. Just looking for you. You found anything yet? Yeah, we found all the weapons from that voodoo movie. All except the ones we'd already found, that is. How'd you know you found them all? Uh, Stone had an inventory. We checked on it. Well, if your theory about Stone's correct, Riley, he could have falsified that inventory. Uh, well, why should he? Well, perhaps he had a couple of weapons hidden somewhere and doesn't want us to know anything about them. Nick, the, the, the more I think about it, the less I like that guy. <laughs> Find anything else? No, 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 not a blessed thing. Search the whole lot, have you? All but stage nine over there. That's locked up tighter than a drum. I can't pick locks the way the great Carter does. Okay, I'll take care of those. Uh, Riley, why don't you go on down to stage three? They're going to start shooting the picture pretty soon, and I'd feel a lot more comfortable if someone were on guard there. We've had enough murders for one day. <laughs> I suppose you think this is a gag, having us get all dressed up like merry villagers or something. It's not a gag, Patsy. It's insurance. What do you mean? Just what I said. When we're dressed up in our regular clothes, everybody in the lot knows who we are. But anyone seeing us dressed up like this will think we're actors and never look at us twice. I never thought I'd live to see the day when people wouldn't stare at Nick Carter, master detective, all dressed up in knee pants. Quiet. Did you check with Scubby? Yep. But just as Stone said, Tyson was hurt in that explosion and then just sort of vanished. Hasn't been heard of since. Hmm. That takes care of that. Well, here's stage nine. The only place that hasn't been searched either by Riley or me. What do you expect to find? I don't know. It's funny, this door isn't locked. Everything else in the lot has been. Yes. Riley distinctly said it was locked when he tried it. Well, keep your eyes open. There may be a reason for it being open now. Golly, it's dark inside here. Here. Take this flashlight. Okay. I've got another. Hey, Nick, look. There's an old makeup table. I wonder what kind of makeup they used in those days. Patsy, we haven't time to stop for Nick, you to look at makeup. Look here. Well, this makeup isn't old at all. What's that? No, this is the very latest type of movie makeup, and it's all new stuff. Well, good for you, Patsy. Yes, there's something funny about this. Definitely, Nick. Well, this panchromatic makeup wasn't developed until Technicolor came in. They didn't use this type of makeup back in the days when this studio was in use. Somebody must have been here since. And none of the actors are making up way over here. Right, Patsy. I'll make a detective out of you yet. Now let's see if we can find anything else. Oh, I'm getting creeps, Nick. I don't like it here. Patsy, I think we're getting warm. This is one of the first real clues we... Hey. Hmm? Recognize that? Wait. Well, that must be the glass tank they used to take that swimming sequence in the voodoo movie. Right you are. I wonder why they left it half full of water this way. When they finished taking that scene, they probably just walked off and left it here. Maybe. Don't forget they closed this place in a hurry. What are you doing? Patsy, this water is fresh. What? It'd be stale if it had been here ten years. Stale and smelly. Say, I'm beginning to think maybe Stone's right and there is a hex on this place. Too bad that voodoo picture wasn't in Technicolor. Those colored stones at the bottom of the tank would have showed up beautifully. They are beautiful, aren't they? Yes, you bet. Hey, Patsy. What? Look here. Those aren't just colored stones. They're... Douse your lights, Patsy, quick. We've got callers. Duck back here behind this crate. The corner saw in a clink this morning with this snooping. Why the boss always swipe such important rock? Why didn't he settle for just a small fry? The boss is big time, that's why. You've got enough dough to pay all the bills until that stuff cools off. And when it's safe to handle it, he'll smuggle it out of the country and sell it for plenty. What's he leave it lying around here for? Hidden in the old equipment. Now, now we know why Boyd was killed. would have thought that anybody would ever come back here. Gosh, when that punk went into that storehouse, I bet he saw the works. Uh, he did. A boss spotted him going in and just had time enough to get that knife and come back and nail him. 
And the kid was dashing back the stone to spill the beans. Gee, your boss is sure lucky. He ain't lucky. He's smart. He had Lippy planted up on that catwalk just in case somebody got an idea to go into that electrician's storeroom. And somebody did. Just in That here. takes brains to know that. Well, we better get going, huh, Jake? Yeah, you start draining the tank so we can get the rocks. I'll get the makeup stuff. Why is he moving everything out now? He figures it'll have cooled off by now, and with the stuff he's going to lift from that Doré thing this afternoon... I think I'm going to scream. Hold it, Patsy. Hey. Oh, oh. Who's that? Hey, look. Over there, Jake. Two guys. Only come here. Run for it, Patsy. Run, run where? Go with me. Let her go, you lousy rat. Get away. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Hey, I'll handle it. Stop it. Get your helmet at Go with me. Get your hands off her. I got to get rough. Go with me. Get your hands off her. 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 Get your hands off it's Nick Carter, the dick. Well. Nick Carter? Hey. And a good-looking doll. Well, it's a good thing you called me in time. Now, what are we going to do with them now that we got them, huh? We can't just leave them lying around. Somebody's bound to notice them. Hey, the fish tank. Yeah, that's right. We'll throw them in there. Then when they're good and drowned, we'll drain the tank and get them and the other stuff out at the same time. Good idea, Lippy. Okay. Here, Pete, you lift the lid. You shut the girl in, Lippy. All right. Jake and I will dump that Carter guy in. It'll be a real pleasure to do something like this to a copper. Yeah. Come on. Hey, go Ready? Ahead. Go ahead. Put Carter in first. Okay. Here he goes. Happy swimming, Carter. Yeah. Uh, now dump the dame in, Jake. In you go, lady. Ah, that's okay. Uh, hey, listen, guys. Suppose they get out. We'll see that they don't get out. Stokey, huh? Put the lid down on the tank. Okay, Jake. Yeah. And I'll put this padlock on, and they're safe as if they was in jail. <laughs> That's good work. Hey, hey, look, boys, they're coming too. So what? Who cares now? Yeah, who cares? Lippy, huh? turn on the water. Okay. Here she comes, Jake. Get those two baby spots set up there, will you? Is this what you want? Ah, uh, that's better. Now, uh, open number two a little more. Okay. All uh, right, this is the take. Ready? Ready. All set. Lights. Camera. All right, action, Miss Dory. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the... No, 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 Lula, darling. Mean what you say. Remember, your lover has returned. Now, this is your big moment. Now, relax. Take it easy. Now, now, come on. Once more. All right, action. Come on. It was when I first opened your letter that I knew at last. As I opened the envelope, even before I read the words that you'd written there, I realized that what I'd hoped for so long had at last... <laughs> Hey, hey, what's the matter with those lights? Why aren't they... Turn on those lights. I'm in charge here. There'll be no confusion. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. The masked man. Who are you to tell me under the bed on this phone? This is a holder. A holder? This is a Look here, you. You can't pull a holder. Quiet, I said. Quiet if you don't want a bullet hit you. Quiet. 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 The man's mad. That's better. Now, nobody will get hurt if you just keep quiet and do as you're told. Turn on that spotlight. Okay, boss. That's it. Now, all of you, line up against the wall there. What, what is it? Come on, get moving. I don't want to shoot, but I will if you make me. And shut up. Uh, you can't tell me to shut that up. That order includes you, know. you too, Riley. Now, don't forget that although you can't see me with this spotlight shining in your eyes, I can see you very clearly. Now, each one of you in turn will step forward and put your valuables on that table and center stage. <laughs> and don't try to hold out on me or it'll be bad for you. All right. We'll start with a star performer, Miss Lulu Doré. Please, Miss Doré, if you think I can't see you trying to hide behind the drapes over there, you're wrong. You're in this too. 
Your jewels, please. No. No, not my emeralds. Surely you won't... Surely I will. It's those emeralds I'm particularly interested in. You don't think I care for the little wristwatches and pocketbooks I'm going to get from the rest of these people, do you? But you can't mean to take my emeralds. One more word out of you and I'll come after them myself. And if I do it... Stand where you are, Tyson. I've got you covered. Nick Carter! Nick! Praise be! Is that you? Come and get me, Carter. Watch him, Ali, if you can. Turn the lights on, Patsy. Right, Nick. Here they are. There he goes, Nick! Ah, I missed him, darn it. Did you see where he went, Nick? There he goes, Mr. Carter, climbing up the... Climbing up the catwalk. Tyson, come down from there or I'll shoot. You haven't got a gun, Nick Carter. Yours is too wet to shoot after your little swim. But I've got my gun. Here! You missed me, Tyson, but I won't miss you. You may not know it, but my guns are absolutely waterproof. Oh! Nice work, Carter. You shot the gun right out of his hand. And now your gun's gone, Tyson. Come on down. Yeah? Come up here and get me. You haven't caught me yet. So long. Oh, look at him run. He should make a misstep ever lose his balance up there. He'd fall off and get a... Tyson! Tyson, stop! Stop! Look out! You don't slip there! Nick! He lost his balance! Watch out, Tyson! Oh! You say you want us to drop you at headquarters, Riley? If you will, Nick. Okay. Your men got the rest of Tyson's gang, all right? He did. They're coming right behind us. Was Tyson badly hurt from his fall? Oh, no, not much. Just a broken ankle. He'll be all right. <laughs> all right, that is, until he gets to the electric chair. Oh, Nick, when I think of how close we came to drowning, I'm scared all over again. Hey, how did you say you got out of that tank, Nick? Believe it or not, Lieutenant. He cut a piece of that heavy glass with a diamond in his ring. Well, what do you know? But, but look, if it was as easy as all that, well, what took you so long doing it, Nick? I had to wait until the thugs got out of the room. Then I just cut a nice little circle out of the glass right beside where the padlock was, reached out, and picked the lock. All very simple. Uh, simple for you, maybe. Not for me. And you say you found the jewels Tyson had stolen in the bottom of the tank, eh? Yes, Riley. What Patsy and I thought were pretty colored stones turned out to be all the jewels Tyson had stolen during the last ten years, all unmounted and dumped in with the pebbles in the tank. But what made you first suspect Tyson, Nick? Well, Patsy, it was his voice first. Remember I told you after we saw him in the movie that I knew I had heard his voice somewhere very recently? Oh, so that's why that voice sounded so familiar. Can you imagine that? A movie star turned crook. Then there was the fact that Tyson had faded so completely out of sight after his accident. That looked fishy to me. No great star would have let his career be ruined without bringing a suit of some kind. Unless he had some plans of his own. And from what I learned from Scubby, we realized he never had brought suit. Yes, and a suit like that would have made all the tabloids. But how did you know Tyson and the watchman were the same? I didn't, Patsy. Until you found that makeup kit. That panchromatic makeup is often used to cover scars. And then I remembered the scarred gateman. It fitted. So did his voice, and the fact that he had the only remaining set of keys to the lot. And, of course, he had all the opportunity in the world. But I bet you didn't realize that the murders were tied up with the robberies. Not until we heard those crooks talking, I mean. Well, the makeup kit told me that, too. Remember, Patsy, how you always claimed that all those robberies were done by individuals, not a gang? Yes, but I still don't well, see Well, Tyson that. was a consummate actor, and he had complete knowledge of makeup. He disguised himself as a different character, I imagine, for each robbery. Evidently, he played his role expertly, since he succeeded in giving the impression that different people were committing the various thefts. But say, if that makeup was so good, well, why couldn't he have gone back to the movies instead of turning thief? Well, Riley, it was good enough for dim lights, but not for the sharp eyes of the camera. Oh, I see. Poor fellow. What an end for a great star. Yes. The explosion probably injured his mind, too. Well, one more thing, Nick. How did he get to be caretaker? Oh, I asked Stone that. He said he felt sorry for the man and had given him the job out of kindness. Oh. Well, that's all over now. Except that from now on I'm allergic to water anywhere, except in drinking glasses. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Glass Coffin, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Voodoo Curse. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by W.O.R. Mutual. 
And now, Nick, will you tell us something about your story for next week? Well, next week we leave this part of the country and are going out west to the mining districts of Montana. Did you go too, Patsy? Yes, I went along. But Nick and Scubby did most of the work and had most of the excitement. I just stayed in the hotel and waited. Yes, that was the first case that Scubby and I really worked out together. And before they were through with it, Scubby very nearly went crazy, literally. And Nick just missed being buried alive. You see, it started out to be a case of robbery. But it ended up with at least two murders and more excitement than I've had in a long time. Well, I hope it's as good as it sounds. It's better. But more of that next week. So long. So long, folks. We'll be seeing you. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Nancy and Jean Webb. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at this same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Flying Duck Murders. Or Nick Carter and the Mysterious Gold Thieves. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. My name is Humphrey Davis. I've been playing the part of Lieutenant Riley in tonight's show. Just now, though, I'm speaking as myself. Actors, you know, appear at many war bond rallies. We like to know that what we can do may help in selling more bonds. But after all, selling more war bonds is everyone's business. You can talk to your friends about the third war loan campaign just as any speaker might. You know the reasons why we must buy extra bonds. You know how purchases of extra war bonds back the attack. You know that they're a great investment. And you know that giving up something you were planning to buy for yourself and buying war bonds instead isn't really any sacrifice. And as you think of these things, how about doing more in this third war loan yourself? Because you can't do too much for the men who are fighting for us every minute somewhere in the world. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Gold Thieves. Carter, unless you think more of a large fat fee than you do of your life, I advise you to throw up the case at once. Apparently, we don't look at this in the same light, Mr. Dalrymple. I expect danger, and I'm prepared to meet it. I suppose you know that two other detectives have come out to this wild Montana country where the flying duck mine is located trying to find the trouble. But do you know that neither of them lived to tell what they found? How are they killed, Mr. Dalrymple? They went crazy, Miss Bowen. Kessler, the San Francisco man, fell over a cliff, while Riley, the man from Chicago, dropped 600 feet down the main shaft of the mine. Very interesting. I feel quite sure that Nick won't share their fate. May I inquire for whom you are acting, Mr. Carter? You may. For Mr. Cecil Trunwick, an old friend of my father's and a large shareholder in the Flying Duck Mine. He said that you'd cooperate with me in every possible way. I shall do what I can, certainly. Good. I should like you to give me a letter to the superintendent of the mine, telling him that I'm a good workman and that you promised me a job. I shall disguise myself as a miner, using the name Dave Jarvis. Very well. Uh, you said your name will be Dave Jarvis? Right. Oh, well, settle to what you want. Give it to Mr. Nate Crosby, the mine super. He happens to be here in town this morning. Unless you change your mind and decide to return to New York, 
Thank you, Mr. Dalrymple. But I'm staying here till my work is finished. Good morning. Goodbye. Good morning. Wait a minute, Patsy. I wonder if Mr. Dalrymple... Is... 431 operator. Yeah. Here. Hello? I want to speak to Nate Crosby. Okay, I'll wait. Crosby? He's the mine superintendent. Yes, things are beginning to move already. Yes. If I open this door a crack, we'll hear better. Nate? This is Dalrymple. Krennic has done what he's been threatening to do for so long. He sent Nick Carter out here to investigate. Yes, Nick Carter. The one man in the world I'm afraid of. Well, you've got the mark of the stuff right away. He can't wait any longer now. I've given him a note to you. Give him the job he wants and then take care of him. Well, yes, if you don't, it may mean curtain for all of us. Right, so long. And that will settle your future, Mr. Nick Carter. I very much doubt that, Mr. Dalrymple. <laughs> Thanks for the attention, Mr. Dalrymple. But I intend to take care of my own future. So, Mr. Dalrymple is in on the deal. He certainly is, Gubby. Up to his neck. Well, at least we start off with one good hot prospect. What do we do now? Get into your miner's office. Then take this note down to this address. And give it to Nate Crosby, the mine super. Now, remember... Your name's Dave Jarvis, and Crosby's to give you a job in the mill. Okay, Nick. Then what? Well, first and foremost, keep your eyes open. Crosby will believe you're Nick Carter. So watch out for him. He'll try to put you out of the way. And don't forget, Scobby, the detectives from Chicago and Frisco both seem to greet. Well, it's going to be different with the guy from New York. Now, Patsy, you wait here at the hotel where we can get in touch with you if we need you. Sure, Nick. All right, get going, Scobby. I'm going out to the mine right away. You wait, though, and ride out with Crosby. And watch out for him. Right, Nick. I'll keep one eye on him and one on the mine. <laughs> Thanks for the lift, bud. That's okay, pal. That's the super's office right there. Thanks. I'll be seeing you. Hey, you looking for someone? You the super of the Flying Duck Mine? No, I'm the assistant super. Clem Hendricks is your name. Well, my name's King. I'm writing up an article about the mines of Montana for the Miners' Times of Kansas City. Any objection to me sticking around a while, looking things over? None at all, Mr. King. Just so long as you say something good about us in your article. You want me to show you around? No, thanks. I'll just drift around and see what I can pick up. Well, if anyone stops here, tell them I said it was okay. Thanks, I will. Be seeing you. Now, to find the boss of the day shift and get some information on how this place operates. These are the most camping machines, Mr. King. They crush the all very fine and it is sent through, through the battery boxes and carried over the plate. I see. The plates are coated with quicksilver or mercury. And the quicksilver picks up most of the gold and from the crushed ore. And this combination of quicksilver and gold we call amalgam. And you scrape this amalgam off the plates and take it to the refinery? Yes, Mr. King. The refinery separates the gold from the quicksilver and casts it into bars. Very interesting. Well, thanks very much. I'll roam along and look the rest of the place over. See you later. I'll drop it between your ribs. You don't mind drop that knife, I said. You, uh, you're the fool. Knock me down, will you? I'll show you. Hey, Ledger, put up that gun. Uh, but Nate, just pull it. Put up the gun, I said. What are you trying to do? Well, I was trying to make Zolander behave. This fellow interfered. It made me mad. Zolander, where is she? Why is she right? Well, I'll be darned. She wants to run away while me and him was arguing. Ah. So you interfered, did you, mister? I certainly I did. You're king, the newspaper man, aren't you? That's right. I'm here to... I've been looking for you. I'm Crosby, mine superintendent. I'll give you just 15 minutes to get out of this camp. So you're Nate Crosby. I am, and I'm the boss here. And I say, get out. All right, Crosby. I'll get out. But I'll be back. I never leave a job unfinished. All right, pick them up. You can carry them. I know they're heavy, but they have to have a solid lead lining so we can ship bodies in them. Put him in the old powder house and shut the door when you're through. Okay, boss. Come on, fellas. Okay, oh, get it up there. That's the stuff. That does it. 
Now we're going to have to move some of these empty powder kegs to make room for all three caskets. Jarvis, you stay here and pile them up out of the way. The rest of you get the other caskets. Okay, boss. All right, hop to it. Hey, Scubby. Scubby. Is that you, Nick? Where are you? Behind these kegs. And start piling them up. We can talk while you work. Oh, sure, Nick. What happened, Nick? Why are you hiding in here? Crosby ordered me to get out of camp immediately. But the assistant super suggested I hide here until he get me a ride back to town. He doesn't like Crosby any better than I do. What's with you? Well, I got a job as crusher man on the night shift at the mill. Hey, what are these boxes you're bringing in here? Caskets. Crosby told the teamster the bodies of the two detectives who got killed were to be taken up and shipped to their friend, White. Here come the men with another box. Get in there, Let's All right, well, Okay, let's get it. Nick, there were only two detectives who were killed. Who do you suppose the third box is for? For you, I imagine, Scubby. What? Remember, they think you're Nick Carter. I'm only Mr. King, newspaper reporter. Uh, well, I'll certainly see that that casket stays empty. Scubby, you know where the detectives are buried? Well, the teamster told me that Crosby knows because he and a couple of the mill hands took the bodies away. I see. See what's in these caskets. Here, I've got a screwdriver in my knife. Well, so have I. Look, I'll help you. Good. Well, I'm glad that you only use four screws to fasten these covers down. Make it simpler. But why do you want to see what's inside, Nick? Got a hunch, that's all. Yeah. There, it's got it. You all ready? Yeah. All right, let's get her up. Give me a hand. Yeah. All right. There. Uh-huh. My hunch is right, Scubby. The caskets are not lead lined. The extra weight is due to this scrap iron in the bottom. Like Crosby said, they had to have lead lining so they could be shipped to the body. These caskets figure in this game more than just as caskets, Scubby. Well, Crosby told the teamster to have a fresh team hitched to the large wagon for him at midnight tonight. I thought so. Now, Scubby, he's going to take these caskets somewhere tonight. And I want to know where. Yeah, but how are you going to find out? I'm going with him. Hidden in this casket. I'll get in it and you put the lid, their lid back on. Oh, but Nick, you'll smother in there with the lid down. Yeah, but you can put four small pieces of wood under the coffin lid before you screw it down. Oh, but Nick, I won't shoot it. Hurry up. All right. Pretty good fit. All right. Now hurry up. Okay, Nick. Keep your head down while I put the lid on. Okay. There we have it. Have you learned anything yet, Scubby? Well, the only place in the mill where the gold could be stolen is the room where the battery box is in the plate. Hey, have you found out how they did No, not yet. I hope to learn tonight when I'm on duty in the mill. Good stuff. You take care of that end. Now, what's this end? Yes. Yeah. Well, here's good luck to us both. I suspect we both may need it. Fighting lay him out with a crowbar. Uh, Don't take any chances. Okay. Stay right here, my God. <laughs> Did you see that? He's heading for the cliffs. Just like the others. Galanda's mixture hasn't failed yet. Now, what's next, Crosby? Let you get my team from the stable at midnight tonight and meet me at the old powder house. Now we can put Nick Carter's name on the third casket. Boss, boss. All right, Leonard, you sit on the top box. I know that voice. That's Crosby. 
fingers. I'd like to see his face if he knew I was in this casket. Hey, what did you take such wild broncos for, Super? Any the only fresh team in the stable. We got a hard run tonight over rough country, where no truck could possibly go. All right, Sam. Let him go and then climb up here with me. Here they go. Watch him. Okay. <laughs> afternoon. And what was he doing in that casket? Never mind that now. Get him. While he's only half conscious. Come on, Sam. Now you... Oh. 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 Good work, boys. That tricks is Mr. Reporter. Tie his hands and feet with that rope. Okay, boy. <laughs> he won't fight no more for a while now. Hey, look, Super. Here's a pair of handcuffs in his pocket. And a couple of guns. Hey, what kind of reporter are you? Going around with handcuffs and guns in your pocket. You have to draw your own conclusions, Crosby. I've drawn them already. You're here to help Nick Carter. But by this time, Carter's where neither you nor anyone else is going to help him. He's loco. Plum loco. <laughs> now, you never can be sure about Carter, Crosby. I can this time. Then I can be sure of you, too. All right, put him back in the casket, boys. Put the cover on. Nail it down if you can't find the screws. Here, here's some nails. Come on, you. In you go. I got out the last time I was in here, Crosby. But you won't get out this time. Get the lid on, boys. That does it. That's well, that's enough. He can't do anything with his hands tied. Lydia, you and Sam get the shovels that were in the wagon and dig a nice deep hole. We'll bury our reporter friend with our blessing. <laughs> senses now. You see, you hear, you know what me say. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Good. You eat better now. Hey, who are you? Me, Zolanda. You saved Zolanda life. Zolanda, your friend. You drink this. You feel eat better. Quick. Thanks. Now, hey, tell me, how did I get here? Just before sun come up, me chase crazy man through woods. Then me here gun shoot. See you run. You come fall down by Zelanda, hurt in head. So, me bring you here, Zelanda hut. Well, certainly glad you were around when I passed out. Crosby, you enemy? <laughs> certainly is now. You say you were chasing a crazy man? Mm. Him drink loco, like two other men come before. I wonder if that could have been Scubby. Crosby said he was loco. Zelanda, what did you want to find him for? Me want to save him life. Give medicine. Make him well. But, but, but what did you want to save him? Crosby, give him look at this man. Zolanda, he, Crosby. Want save man. Crosby, want kill. Zolanda, listen. I think this crazy... <laughs> Quick, Zolanda. Give me some rope. I'll tie his hands and feet while he's unconscious. Ah, oh, poor Scabby. Looks as if he'd been through the war. Oh. You go. You try. Thanks. Oh. Now. Me get medicine. Make them all better from local. Uh, Scabby. That should hold you now. 
Thanks. All right, Scabby, old boy. Come on, drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, 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 no, no, I'll tie your arms anyway. Take this coat off you. And you'll be more comfortable. Hey, what this? A long coil of wire with a lot of metal discs attached to it. But, but that's the answer. Of course. The mystery of the flying duck mine is a mystery no longer. <laughs> Well, Scully, oh. you feeling better now that you've had some sleep? Yeah, I feel pretty good. Why? You don't remember what happened to you yesterday morning? Well, the last thing I recall is going to the water bucket and taking a long drink. I think that the more I drank, the more I wanted. Well, that water bucket was loaded with local weed juice. What? Surprised you didn't notice it. Well, I'm surprised at myself now. But both the amalgamators, even Crosby himself, kept drinking. Or pretending to from that same bucket. Well, they certainly had me fooled. Now hey, look, Scully. You remember seeing these discs strung on this coil of wire? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I recall seeing one of the amalgamators have it last night. Why, did I bring it here? You did. And it breaks the case wide open. Well, good for me, even if I don't didn't know it. Hey, tell me, Nick, what are those discs used for? Here, I'll show you. Yeah. Now watch. Now, you see? This stuff I'm scraping off is amalgam. A mixture of quicksilver and gold. The men who worked in the battery boxes in the mill, the amalgamators... Hung these discs, and a lot more like them, in the battery boxes, right where they catch the best of the gold before it flowed over the other plates. They took out over half the gold that flowed into the boxes this way. So that's where all those thousands of dollars worth of gold disappeared to. Yes, Scubby. A very clever method of stealing the gold. Now, if we could only find out what Crosby and his gang do with the amalgam after they scrape it off their discs. Hmm. You want to catch Crosby? I'll say we do if we can... Hey, Nick. Who is she? Oh, that's Zolanda. She saved my life. Oh, and yours too, incidentally. Saved my life? Oh. Well, that local weed juice you drank is fatal. Well, Zolanda gave you a nice antidote for it. Well, gosh, thanks, Zolanda. Gee, I'm sure much obliged. Crosby drank in me. Me, it seems. Zolanda know all about Crosby. You come with me. Well, where are you taking us? Hmm. Crosby got cave inside mountain where he hides stuff. Come, me show you. This is where Crosby hides out, huh? Yeah. Too bad there's no one here now. But they've been here today. Look there, Scubby. Oh, that looks like the scrap iron we took out of the casket in the old powder house before you hit in it. Right, Scubby. And this scrap iron was in the other two caskets. So they brought them up here. I wonder why. There's the answer. Over there in that corner. And the stairs front it. And it's still warm, Scubby. So we must have scared them off when we came up. Wait. Let me take the cover off this retort. There. Nick, is that gold in there? That's just what it is. Part of the gold stolen from the mine. This is where the gang refined the amalgam they scraped off their discs. It's much easier to handle gold this way because it weighs so much less. Now, since we know from what Dalrymple said that they never disposed of any of the stolen gold, they must have eight or nine hundred pounds of it by now. Hey, maybe they've got it hidden around here somewhere. They did have, Skippy, but not now. Well, what makes you think so, man? Here. Take a look outside there. I've been digging there very recently. Oh, but of course, Nick, they had to dig up the bodies of the two detectives to ship them back home. No, 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 Scully. The way it looks to me is this. After I got away from them last night, Crosby and his men took up the casket they tried to bury me in. And tried to bury you in? Hey, you didn't tell me about oh, that. later, Scully. Right now, I'm interested in what happened here. They brought the three caskets up here early this morning. Loaded them up. How did they load three of them? They only had two bodies. No, Scully. Three caskets were loaded up. Don't you understand yet? No, Nick, I'm afraid I don't. How could they be loading up? How good are you at riding a horse? Riding a horse? Yeah. Well, I used to ride years ago. Why? Good. Zelanda, can you get us a couple of good fast horses right away? For you, me, get two good horses quick. Good. Come on, Scubby. Let's get the horses and ride to the railroad station before the eastbound train gets in. <laughs> Well, unless I'm wrong, Scubby, the 
these three caskets are going east on the next train. We've got to get there in time to stop them. Well, even Crosby himself would recognize us these Indian costumes are liable to let us. Well, we may need to be disguised before we get through. Hey, you didn't finish telling me how you got away from Crosby and his gang when they started to bury you alive. What did happen, Nick? Well, they dug the hole, and they put the casket down in it. I tried to pry the lid loose, but my hands were tied behind me. I worked on them, and just as they started throwing the dirt back on top of the casket, I finally got my hands free and untied my feet. Just then, I heard shooting, and some female screaming. A female? Out there in the wild? Yeah. It was Zoland, I found out later. But I managed to loosen the cover and push it up enough to see that Crosby and the men were watching something across the clearing. So I seized my chance and climbed carefully out of the hole on the opposite side. I started to run, and they saw me and started shooting. Fortunately, though, they were bad shots, and I was almost free when a bullet grazed my head. It must have stunned me, because I remember nothing more till I woke up in Zolanda's hut this morning. Well, do you know what it was that distracted the men's attention? Well, Zolanda told me that you were chasing her, trying to shoot her. She was screaming. You chased her around the other side of the clearing, and then went off after something else. It was just about then that she saw me running toward her. When Crosby saw me drop, he gave up the chase. Zolanda waited until they went back and then dragged me to her hut. Gosh, Nick, we all locked us, Zolanda. Right, Scubby. And the best way we can pay that debt is to see that Crosby and his murdering pals end up where they belong, behind bars or in the electric chair. <laughs> Of course, Nick. You want the police chief to meet you at the station in ten minutes. And you want Mr. Dalrymple and the president and treasurer of the mine to meet you in the chief's office in an hour. That's right. I'll be sure you get them all. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. These are the ones, Nick. These three here on the baggage truck. Did you notice the names on them, Stubby? Yeah. Joe Briley. Phil Kessler. Oh, look. Nick Carter. Hmm. I'd rather be out here dressed as an Indian than in there dressed as a corpse. One side there, rain in the face. We gotta get these caskets into the baggage car. Oh, just a minute. You see this badge? Special agent. So what? What do you want me to do? Just leave these caskets in the baggage truck for now. But they're supposed to go on this... Staying here, quiet. Hey, look here, baggage master. Get these boxes on the train and be quick about it. No be in hurry, mister. Why, you Indian meddler, what the deuce huh? do you... You look behind you. What do you mean? Take your head off, Scubby. Sure, Nick. There you are, Mr. Crosby. Dave Jarvis. Why, you... Don't try to start anything, Crosby. I've got my gun on hey, you. Hey, get these boxes off. Where you men, officer? These three right here. Get your hands up, all of you, fast. Hey, what you, you, you What is it? Quiet, all of you. You three men are under arrest. Charge of robbing the flying duck mine with the murder of Detectives Riley and Kessler. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy. Now, Mr. Dalrymple, I asked you and the officials of the Flying Duck Mine to meet me here in the office of the Chief of Police because I want to show you what's in the casket that Crosby was taking back east with him. Oh, uh, what's what's the the now, the first casket is supposed to contain the body of Phil Kessler. All right, Scabby, open it. Sure, Nick. Gold. Gold bullion. Yes, Chief. In these three caskets, you'll find the entire amount of gold stolen from the mine. Stolen by Dalrymple, the mine manager, Crosby, the mine super, and four of the workmen who worked in the amalgam room of the mill. They stole the amalgam, refined it in their own furnace, and buried it in two holes in the ground, which was supposed to be the graves of the two dead detectives. Mr. Carter, that much gold would make the caskets pretty heavy. Wouldn't that extra weight be noticed? No, Chief. Because when you ship a body by train, the casket has to be lead-lined and hermetically sealed. That means it weighs much more than the usual casket. Crosby, Ledger, and Perkins... We're each going to take one of the caskets east with them as a personal baggage, which would prevent anybody from examining them too closely. One of the cleverest schemes I've seen in a long time. But it wasn't clever enough. Not with Nick on the job. You have to get up early in the morning to beat Nick. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Gold Thief. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States... 
the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink present Gangbusters. Waterman's pens, every one a master writing instrument, and Waterman's ink, the ink that goes up to three times as far as ordinary ink, are proud to bring you gangbusters, presenting facts in the endless war of the police on the underworld, facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their work of protecting our citizens. And so we introduce Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world who will interview by proxy A.L. Brody, coroner, Cook County, Illinois. Commissioner Valentine. Coroner Brody, the crimes of the gunman, Alvin Krauss, and Edward Damiani are among the most shocking in recent years. Just reading their police record makes your blood run cold. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. These two criminals introduced a new and terrifying modus operandi in their crimes. We're anxious to hear the facts. Coroner Brody, suppose you begin. Well, Commissioner Valentine, it was the hot, sultry afternoon of June 19th, 1943, in a small apartment in the city of Chicago. A man was bending over a table on which were a number of bottles and large jugs. He was a tall man, standing six feet two inches. The room was stifling hot, but the windows were tightly shut and the shades drawn. Suddenly, a knock sounded on the door. The man picked up a gun and moved quietly across the room. A knock was repeated. Oh, come in, Damiani. Yeah, quick, shut the door, Cross. Please, man. We're in trouble. Here, yeah. look at this newspaper. That guy is shot in that hold up, kicked the bucket. It is. Yeah, there's the whole story. See? Walter Push, real estate agent, killed by gunman. Never mind that guy. I want to see the guy's description of him. Nah, just says unidentified gentleman. Yeah, but this is murder, Crow. They can't prove it by us, because they haven't got us. We're in the clear. Ten bank hold up so far, not a finger pointed our way. Yeah, but the cops have that murder bullet. If they get your gun and match it up, it's a one-way ticket. You're so clever, Damiani. You should have joined the cops. Now, look, I'm serious, Cross. Shut up. Don't you think I know about bullets and ballistics? Cops will never get that gun because we're not using guns anymore. No? Now I'm changing our modus operandi. <laughs> Plenty with that, huh? Uh-huh. Now, look, will you cry? How do you suppose I've been experimenting with all these bottles and stuff on that table? We wasted enough time talking. Where is it? Did you get what I sent you for? Oh, yeah. And this paper story, then, is forget. Here it is, Miss Pepper. Let me see. That'll be the right thing. I had a time getting one just the size you wanted, because I had to go to the three office bullets before I could slide one off the wall. Yeah. Did a good job, pal. Exactly what I want. But why? What do you want a fire extinguisher for? I said we're changing our modus operandi, didn't I? Yeah, but you can't pull hold up with a fire extinguisher. That's what you think. That's what the cops think. They're going to find out different. Something new. I expect it. And it'll kill better than any guns or bullets ever made. Sometimes I think you're nuts, Cross. Only your schemes always work out. That's how this thing works. Loaded with food, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Now you point the nozzle and uh, turn this little valve. That's a fine thing to do, shooting that stuff all over me. Look at my suit. Where do you get off shooting that stuff? Come in, Tommy, Annie. You're lucky you can still talk. When I get through with this extinguisher and a few little experiments, the next person I aim at, we'll never talk again. This is our new modus operandi. No bullets, no nothing. Just a little fire extinguisher. Four cars. This is North Pulaski Road. That's right. Louie and Dave did a nice job of casing. We're taking the currency exchange 311, North Pulaski. Yeah, it'll make our 11th bank job. Watch the driving, Louie. Drive the top in that corner. Oh, yeah, yeah, boss. And you're really going to take it with that fire extinguisher, Pounce? Yeah, that's right. My old birthday here gets the first fire. Well, maybe it won't work, Cross. I still say we ought to use guns. I'll make a bet with you, Damiani. 
15 minutes after we pull this hold up, every cop in Chicago will know they're up against the most terrific thing in the underworld. We're ripping this town wide open. Okay, hello, April. Okay. Okay. The bank looks empty. Just one dame inside. He'll do. All we need is one guinea pig. You set for a quick getaway, Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come yeah, on, Tommy. Okay. I'm gonna stay a little further and close action. Don't hurry, it's just back to attention. I feel nervous without a gun. Hey, that's that's the looking necktie in that store window. You mind to get one like it something? What? Neckties at a time like to your nuts. Now, pal, you're gonna see something you never saw before. Morning. Oh, good morning, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, it'll be a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure just talking to you. You look so neat and fresh, like a daisy. I beg your pardon. Maybe I should say a lily. Just what is it you want, please? Well, it's very simple. I merely want all the money you got in this bank. What? Easy does it, girlie. No screaming, no nothing. Just do as you told. Better. Give me the dough. No. Now, look, I'm through playing. This is business. No. Look, the money or I'll kill you. I'm not afraid of you. That's because you don't know how I'll kill you. It won't be pretty. You see this uh, contraption with a nozzle pointing right at you? You know what's inside? Poison gas. Poison gas? Yeah, that's right, sister. Something new, poison gas. You're fooling. Just one whip of this, baby, and your toes turn up. I don't believe you. Hand over that dough, kid. I'm warning you, it won't be pretty. No. She really thinks I'm kidding. Okay, sister. Here's where you find out. Oh, my cat's at work. She did. Let's make certain we'll give another one for luck. Let's go. That was a dough. We didn't get it. I didn't come on this job for dough, you jerk. I came for headlines. Once a word gets out that it's poison gas we use, no bank clerk or teller will argue with us. Come on. Yeah. What do you think a little bit, man? Got a gadget? No fuss. No bother. That's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, Johnson, stay on that telephone. Officer Howard's at the hospital where they took that girl from the bank. Notify me the second there's any more word. Right, Captain Rodney. I'll be in the lineup room with the squad. Yes. Men, I don't have to tell you that the crime this afternoon was one of the most diabolical in the history of this city. It also presents the worst challenge any police force ever had to face. A gang so ruthless and cunning that they know how to manufacture and use poison gas. Why, they've even outlawed the use of gas in war, Captain Rogers. Yet, here's a gang who uses it deliberately on an innocent, helpless victim. The girl hasn't been conscious since she was found. The doctors say she hasn't a chance. The poison gas is eating her life away. Like something fiendish out of the Middle Ages. We've got to get the ones who did this, Captain. Yes, man, we've got to get them, but it's not going to be easy. We haven't much to work on. But there's one fact that may be significant. A woman saw a man drive a car from the bank about the time the crime was committed. She couldn't see his face, but she said he was of an immense size. Now, Sergeant Murphy, you have another report. Yeah, right here, Captain Roger. Now, this reports on the recent murder of that real estate man, Walter Bush. The report says that one of the killers was also of an immense size. We also feel this gang is responsible for other bank robberies, but that they've changed their method of operating. Before, there was no violence or shooting. But now it's murder and poison gas. In the public address system, Captain. Bank robbery at 4755 Fourth Avenue just reported. Man has threatened bank clerks with poison gas before getting money. Leader of gang said to be at least 62 or 63 inches in height. Yes, sir. Okay, person, you handle that. Take two squads of men. Get out there in the double. Yes, sir. A uh, monkey. Yes, sir. Notify all squad cars to converge on that area. Have the dispatcher on all precincts. Have the reserve stand by, ready to move. Uh, By your attention, Captain Rogers. Officer Howard is phoned in that you're a victim of worst hold up today. Has just died of poison gas at the General Hospital. That is all. All right, 
right men, you know what this means. This gang will throw all caution to the winds from now on. They have a weapon that can be terrifying in its use, and it's evident that they intend to keep on using it. Every officer's on 24-hour duty until we get this gang. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. And when the news of this innocent woman's death by poison gas became known, the public was shocked, horrified. But even as the police swung into action, the gang was planning new crimes. We're very anxious to know the events that happened next, Coroner Brody. But before you go into them, here is a message from Waterman. No matter what you buy, if you let quality and the reputation of the maker guide you, you can't go wrong. When you buy a fountain pen, for instance, look at it. Examine its workmanship. Write with it. It's a sure bet that America's newest pens, Waterman's Taperites, will catch your eye at once. They're sleek. They're trim. They're slim. They're beautiful. And when you write with a Waterman's Taperite pen, you'll see how smoothly and easily it glides over the paper. Because Waterman's points are hand ground. Because ink beads are finished to microscopic accuracy. In beauty, in style, in workmanship, and in writing ease, Waterman's pens are far out in front. A new era product of America's first pen maker. If you prefer the more conventional style, just pick up one of Waterman's standard point pens. Notice how these pens are also styled to the minute. So sleek, so slim, so trim. They are beautiful. You are the judge. You are the jury. By every standard of comparison, you'll agree that Waterman's is top among America's finest pens. That's why it is to your own interest to keep going to your dealers until you see these great new pens. Yes, you'll get the best if you look for the name Waterman. Now back to gangbusters and Commissioner Valentine. Coroner Brody, after this gang had killed an innocent man during a holdup and murdered a woman bank clerk, clerk by poison gas, what happened next? Well, Commissioner Valentine, the next event shows the utter brazenness of this gang. It took place just ten days after their second murder, on the 16th of July, in a bank on Montrose Avenue. Okay, everybody, stop work. Our business comes first. You at the typewriter, didn't you hear the boss said? Get up from that desk. Now, folks, I'll just show you one thing so you'll know what you're up against. This extinguisher. The poison gas bag. Shut up. That's better. I'm sure none of you people want a little anesthetic. So just hand over the money and continue to breathe, right? What was that? Dame, shut the glass door to the money case. Yes, it is, huh? Get it, boys. Open it, stop. Open it up. Oh, just a minute, pal. I'll handle this. I got a remedy for any situation. You. Yeah, boss. This is your department. Go to work. Okay, boss. The monkey's next case since you're safe. Smash it in. No. Now, the best thing you can do is hand over the money to my boys and hand it quick. Yes, sir. I'm allotting just three minutes for this job. We've got another stop to make, and we don't want to keep anybody waiting. Snap it up there. Hand over that bill. Attention, citywide alarm. Poison gas bandits who robbed Montrose Bank have just pulled second hold up within the hour. Raid at currency exchange on South California Avenue. Escaped in dark sedan. Watch for this car. Are you sent for me, Captain Rogers? Oh, yes, sir. Just sit down a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, Murphy, in all my years in the police force, this gang is the toughest yet. I've never seen anything like it, Captain. We've got thousands of officers and plain clothes in the streets. And the gang operates in broad daylight, yet they've slipped through our fingers every time. But their luck's bound to run out. It's got to. Yet there isn't a minute of the day or night they may not kill more people. That's what's driving me crazy. Uh, look, Captain, you haven't had any sleep in two days. You really ought to try and get rest. Knowing those killers are loose with poison gas? Yes. Captain, the Lieutenant Preston has witnesses in the lineup room is ready to bring in more suspects. Okay, I'll be right in. Ah, come on, Murphy. Maybe we'll get a break this time. I hope so. This will be the tenth batch of suspects we've had them look over. Well, we'll see. Oh, 
How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? How do you do, Captain Rogers? I uh, want to thank you people for cooperating so fully with us. Let's see if we have any luck this time. All right, Lieutenant, turn out the lights and march the suspects out on the stage. I'll get the lights. Okay. Bring them in. Now, I want you people to look at each one of these men very carefully. You can see them, but they can't recognize you because of the lights. Do you see any of the poison gas killers? If you do, point them out. Well? No, Captain, I don't. No, I, I don't either. Well, make certain. It's no use, Captain. I don't see anyone there that I recognize. Mm-hmm. I see him. Okay, Lieutenant, take the suspects out. All right, get moving. Go on. And Sergeant, put the lights back in. Yes, sir. Yeah, it just doesn't seem possible that we can't get a line on even one of the killers. Mm, we've had these witnesses look at practically every six-footer in Chicago. Captain Rogers. Here are the pictures you wanted. Oh, yes, Johnson. Thank you. Now, if you witnesses will wait a moment more, I've uh, had a detective checking court records on parole violators and bail jumpers as possible suspects. And uh, like all of you who look at these photographs. Now, all these men are big men, over six feet tall. Yes, Captain. I hope we recognize one. Now, study the pictures carefully. This one? No. How about this? This man. That's him. Alvin Krauss. Uh, Krauss jumped a $25,000 bond in a robbery indictment last January. He's the one who held the container of poison gas. Are you certain? I'm positive. I certainly am. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's great, Captain. Alvin Krauss, six feet, two inches. All right, Murphy, come to my office. Johnson, have the entire undercover squad stand by. We're starting the greatest man hunt. Hey, Krauss. Krauss, what's the idea of banging in here like that, dummy Amy? Look what you made me do. Spill a glass of liquor. I'm sorry, Krauss, but look what the absolute paper's got. Huh? What headlines about me? That police said they got a definite lead on a poison gas. That police got a lot of baloney. Those guys got to say something's on the hot spot. Did you see what one newspaper said about me this morning? I mean, them. Makes me laugh. Cops running their legs off all over town, and I sit here nice and peaceful, nothing to worry about. It's not so loud, Krause. These walls ain't too thick. Someone might hear. Why do I care who hears? I got the city right in the palm of my hand. Me, one guy, the whole city's scared sick. Yeah, yeah, sure. Take it easy, will you? I'm a one-man army. That's what I am. When Hitler conquered those countries, he rode around his car and they all saluted. Sig Heil. That's what we're going to do, Damiani. This is my city, and you're going to drive me around while I look it over. No, no, Krauss, don't do nothing like that. Look, look, kid, you've had too much to drink, see? Who does that know? But you are, Krauss. Act like you're nuts. Sometimes I think you are nuts. What? You're nuts. No, 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 Krauss, let go. Go, will you? I don't argue with me. Get the car out. I'll show you if I'm nuts or not. You do what I say with those guys. See, Damiani and the fellow I was drunk, I was nuts. Still nothing to be afraid of. Must have driven past a hundred cops, not one of them gives a stumble. Yeah, all I say is I don't like this. Go ask your opinion. Give me a cigarette. Okay. Oh, they must be in my other pocket. Yeah, here they are. Hey, wait a minute. What else you got there in the pocket? Well, well nothing. Huh? Let me see. No, no, no. Let me explain, Crouch. A see. gun. Didn't I say we weren't using any more guns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, I... Did I was... turn this thing on you? No, no, Christ, you can't do that. I'm, I'm your pal. You and me will Get up, just nibbling. But I'm dumping this gun like I did the others. I'm not having any guns that can be traced. Hey, wait a minute. Pull on. Okay. What is it? What's it like? Necktie. A what? That's a necktie. The kind I like. Let's go back then. I'm going back and get it. Get up, boy. Shut up, you. Get Hey, why don't you look where you're going? Shut up, bro. Cremate you. Hey, you got to sign the story I like. Let's see your sign. Yes, sir. Here they are, right on these racks. You have a large sort, huh? Never mind that. I'm just looking for one. Ah, this is a baby. Yes, sir. I'll put it in a bag. 
There you are. Thank you very much. Uh, just a moment. Uh, you haven't paid for the tie. It's dollar fifty. Who said I'm going to pay for it? This is mine. Just a minute. Get away from me. I'll throw you through the plate glass. That's an idea. Well, come on. Hey, well, let's go. Oh, shut up, Russell. Oh, that's right. I forgot to have this gun in my pocket. Please. I'm a one-man army, Jack. You didn't know that, huh? Everybody in this town does what I say. Come on out in the street. Come come on. On. You can have come this pie. Let me go. Come on. Ah, now, first thing, I don't like the way you got your windows fixed. I'll fix them different. Now let's start across the street. Now watch me make those people scatter. <laughs> Look at them run. I'm a one-man army. I run this town. Be hot. One-man army. Go on, run. I'll make you all right. Hello? Hello, hello? Police? Yes? There's a crazy guy in the street outside my store shooting up the place. Whereabouts? Uh, Winthrop and Bryn Moore Avenue. I can see him from where I'm calling. He's a big guy, like a silly. He's... Oh, good gosh. A soldier, a Marine just ran up and is trying to get the gun away from him. A, a girl's trying to help him. They can't fight him. He's too big. Good Lord, the gun has knocked him down. Get here fast. Get here fast. Shooting at streets. Green and girl trying to stop him. Gunman is said to be of giant size. Get there fast. Step on that market. I've got a couple of blocks in here. Turn left the next corner. You hear that description? A big guy. The poison gas gang. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Step on it. Yeah, there they are. Rolling in the street. Yeah, I see them. All right, come on. Grab him. Yeah, I've got him. There they go. Your covers won't get me. He's getting away. Hey, ready. Come back here. Oh, you're up. Right. I'll kill you both, my bad hand. I'll kill you both. Go ahead and get the cuffs on you. As long as an ox. Yeah, I'm trying. Throw you down. Throw you down. Throw you up. No, look, look out. He's got his arm free. Flash your face open. I've got him again. My arm. Look out, my arm. Good work. Good work. I'll grab his other arm and run him to the police car. Come on. Come on. Come on. I saw you. Now, Mr. Wood, make a good look at you. Yes, like we thought, Captain. It's Krauss. Alvin Krauss, the poison gas band. You guys are not your way. That's enough out of you, Krauss. I've been waiting a long time to get you. You've got a one-way ticket coming. And we're going to say that you get it. Yes, Commissioner Valentine... The law had caught up with Alvin Krauss, and he was headed for a one-way ticket to the electric chair. What about Damiani and the Marine and young girl who tried to overpower Krauss? Well, Commissioner, that Marine and young girl took their lives in their hands when they went after Krauss. The Marine was shot in the left leg during the fight for the gun, but he continued to hang on to Krauss until the police arrived. That Marine and the girl deserve great credit for their exceptional bravery. They certainly do. But unfortunately, the poison gas gang wasn't at an end. Damiani got away, and in the months that followed, began an even greater reign of terror. And that's next week's case, isn't it, Coroner Brody? Yes, it is, Commissioner. Thank you for bringing us these inside facts. In just a moment, we'll broadcast our nationwide clues to persons most wanted by the police. But first, a word from Waterman. Everybody knows the old gag, how high is up and how long is a piece of string. Let me ask you another. How big is a bottle of ink? Oh, I'll answer it. It depends on the kind of ink. A bottle of Waterman's blue-black ink may be the same size as other inks, but Waterman's blue-black ink writes up to three times as much with each pen filling as other nationally advertised ink, as proved by tests conducted by a nationally known independent laboratory. In fact, by actual count, it adds up to 6,500 extra words right from your present fountain pen. Why? Because Waterman's blue black ink is all ink. Nothing added. No dilution. No harmful solvents. Here's another result of the Waterman's all ink formula. It runs free and true. You write letters that are sharper and clearer. And even that's not all. Waterman's writing lasts longer actually seems to be almost impervious to time, to fading, even water. 
Now, add these qualities to the extra word mileage of Waterman's Blue Black Ink and to the fact that this world favorite costs only ten cents and, well, honest now, would you want to buy any other? You can choose among seven other colors, too, all in the handy tip-filled bottle and all only ten cents. So next time you buy ink, buy the ink that all ink, the best. Just look for the name Waterman. Now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues, broadcast as a public service to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Warning, citizens of New York. Watch for dangerous killer, hunted by police in connection with murder of two shopkeepers and attempted murder of a third. This man apparently a maniac. Usually operates at hours when retail stores are not crowded. Holding up victims at gunpoint, robbing, then shooting them. Listen carefully to description this killer. About 45 years old. Five feet, nine inches. 160 pounds. Slim. Dark brown hair. Glassy eyes. Long, pointed nose. Soft voice. Maybe wearing a dark felt hat and dark gray or brown overcoat. Warning. Use all possible caution. This man is dangerous. Wanted for questioning, murder, Michigan City, Indiana, Hollander Bill Rogers. Negro, 24, 6 feet tall, 165 pounds, slender build, black hair, light brown skin, small mustache, walks slightly hunched. Hollander Bill Rogers, wanted for questioning, murder. Wanted, connection, bank robbery, Seattle, Washington. George Town, D A U M, 45, 5 feet 6 inches, 145 pounds, dark hair, very dark blue or brown eyes, unusually heavy dark eyebrows, cut scar back of head, nervous twitch right side of face. At large, dangerous bank robber. Alan Butler Woolworth, 42. Five feet, ten inches, 158 pounds. Dark brown hair, turning gray. Blue eyes, medium build. Small cut scar, corner of mouth. Cut scar, V-shaped, right foot. Be on alert for Alan Butler Woolworth. Fugitive, dangerous bank robber. These are the clues on the most urgently sought persons in the United States tonight, January 26, 1946. If you have any information concerning these clues, Notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Now, here's Commissioner Valentine. Next week, gangbusters dramatizes new facts on the poison gas gang who continue to terrorize citizens of Chicago until a late police found a snapshot on a closet shelf. A snapshot which led to one of the strangest searches ever recorded. Listen next week. Same time, same station, for this authentic case on Gangbusters. And any time, anywhere, when you were buying a fountain pen, or when you were buying ink, always look for the name Waterman. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Coroner, Cook County, Illinois. Commissioner Valentine. Coroner Brody, on July the 3rd, 1943, the city of Chicago was horrified at a brutal and terrifying murder. That's right, Commissioner Valentine. For on that day, three gunmen walked into the currency exchange on North Pulaski Road, where Agnes Olson, the teller, was on duty. You heard what I said, Gary. Don't make a sound and don't move. We want every cent in this place. No. We mean business. We'll kill you. No. Won't be a pretty way to die, sister. See this metal container I got in my hand? With the nuzzle pointing right at you. Now what's inside this container? Poison gas. Poison gas? I... I don't believe... You better believe me. Shut out that dough. No. I said it ain't a pretty way to die, but that's how you're dying. <laughs> Oh,
squad, stand by. Urgent. Gentlemen, this is a citywide alarm from police headquarters. Now listen carefully. Bandits have just murdered woman bank clerk by means of poison gas. Bandits using poison gas have just murdered bank clerk. All police ordered on 24-hour duty. And exactly one month and one day after this horrible crime, Commissioner Valentine, the fast-moving Chicago police had captured the purported leader of this gang, Alvin Krauss, but the rest of the gang was still at large. The terrible danger still remained. Did they, too, know the secret of the poison gas? Fear gripped the city. Officer! Officer! Yes, what is it? I was waiting for the streetcar. Three men came along. I couldn't see their faces. It was dark. But I heard them talk about gas. The poison gas bandits. Where? This way. Come on. Oh, please, listen. I just heard some shots in the street. It may be an auto backfiring, but it may be the poison gas bandits. The ones who murdered that girl. The poison gas bandits. Captain Rogers speaking. This is Officer Sidney, Captain. I just checked that emergency call. Yes? It wasn't the poison gas bandits. It was a man carrying one of those uh, cylinder-type vacuum cleaners. Oh. <laughs> you know, Captain, the, the people in this town are so jumpy, they think everyone they see is a poison gas bandit. Uh, just a minute, Sidney. You're new on the force, a rookie. Let me tell you something. When you're sent on an assignment, don't treat it lightly. Other officers have made that mistake, and they've walked into gangster bullets. Now get back in your post. Yes, Captain Rogers, yes. Another old tip, Captain? Yes, Sergeant. And that's the danger. If we relax for even just one second, the next tip may not be Falkland. That gang has murdered once. They'll murder again. It's like sitting on a volcano, all right. If we only knew if those fellas could make the poison gas or if Krauss alone had the secret. Krauss still hasn't talked? Not a word. And we don't even know who the other three in the gang are. The whole city is counting on us for protection. We don't know where that gang may strike next or when. We've got to crack this thing, Murphy, and crack it fast. Hey, it's dark down here, Damiani. Where are we going, anyway? Just keep following me, Captain. I thought that other floor was the basement. It's like going down in the middle of the earth. If Krauss was caught, I knew I had to find another place quick. You think Krauss talked? Even if he has, it won't stop us. He'll never find this place. Here we are. I can't see a thing. What's that? That noise. Take it easy, Scott. Just the other side of the iron door. Quiet, quiet, Rick. Quiet, boy. Get down, get down. I brought him over from the house the other day. But why? You'll see. Man, this is quite a setup. What's those bottles and stuff on the table there? Poison gas. Poison gas? Holy mackerel. It's stuff cross left. Now look, Scapo. I've taken over and I'm making you my right-hand guy. Oh, thanks, Damiani. Louis don't know about this place and I don't want him to. He'll just follow orders. Oh, sure. Just you and me. We're the big shots. I'm the big shot. Uh, that's what I meant. Now look. These containers are filled with poison gas. But I don't know how good it is. It might have spoiled We've got to experiment to see if it works. Oh, yeah, experiment. But how? Very simple, Scarpo. What are you looking at me like that for, Damiani? Now, wait a minute. You ain't got me down here for no experiment. I'm getting out. How do you open this door? You ain't experimenting on me. Shut up, Scarpo. Quiet, Rex. <laughs> yeah, but now, now look, Damiani. You can't get out of this place unless I let you out. Now, come over here. Okay, okay, but honest, Damiani. Shut up. I... What are you getting in an uproar about? I can use you and the gang. But I don't need the mud. Oh, the dog. You, you mean you're going <laughs> to... Yeah, that's a swell idea. Try it out on the mud. Sure, you, you'll never know what happened to him. I have it all figured out. Put him in this closet. <laughs> then shoot the gas in through this hole and plug the hole. Hey, that's clever. You, you're okay, damn man. Yeah. We'll try it out. Hey, Rex. Come on, boy. Ah, man, that boy. Come on. Into this closet. Go on. Go on. Get in. Get it. Now I'll put the nozzle of the poison gas in through this hole. That's a, that's a swell idea. And turn on the poison gas. Attention, 
and all patrols, special squads, undercover men, repeating previous alarms on poison gas gang. Maintain constant vigilance, poison gas gang. Time is now 1.46 and a quarter p.m. That is all. Well, it sure works swell, Damiani. That mutt died like a hero. The main thing is that the gas works and we have enough on hand to take every bank in this country. Sounds good to me, Damiani. Okay, Louis. Stop right here in this corner. This is the bank we're taking right here. The streets are nice and empty, Damiani. No people. Yeah. Come on, boys. Looks like there's only one dame inside the bank, Damiani. Like that other babe we killed before they could cross. Follow me. Hey, she's a good-looking dame in there, Damiani. Yeah. She won't be so good-looking after we get through using this poison gas on her. Okay, pal, open the bank door. Now, gangbusters listeners, because our purpose is to make these cases authentic, we are going to bring you the personal account of an eyewitness to the unexpected occurrence which followed next. But first, here is a message from Waterman. The best, said Benjamin Franklin, the cheapest in the end. So when you buy a fountain pen, let quality be your guide. When you get beauty added to quality, then you are doubly right. Look at the newest of all American pens, Waterman's Paperite. Ever see such stunning design and such fine taste? Yes, Waterman's Taperites are so sleek, so slim, so trim. They're beautiful. Now write with a Waterman's pen. Notice how smoothly it glides over the paper. You see, you are writing with a point that is ground by hand, an ink feed that's fashioned and gauged down to microscopic precision according to the highest standards of Waterman, America's oldest pen maker. Or if you prefer a pen of more conventional design, pick up one of the new Waterman Standard Point pens. Honest now, did you ever think a pen of this kind could be so strong, yet so sleek, so slim, so trim, so beautiful? So in buying a fountain pen, be careful. Be curious. Be skeptical, if you will. But don't buy a pen without seeing and trying the new Waterman. Once you do see them, we feel sure you'll agree that by every standard of beauty, of workmanship, and of writing ease, you will prefer Waterman. So make sure to see the best. Look for the name Waterman. Now back to Gangbusters and Commissioner Valentine. I'll reenact the exclusive interview Gangbusters had with Miss Elaine Clapper, the young lady who was inside that currency exchange on Harrison Street on August 19th, 1943, when Damiani and his gang walked in with poison gas. Now, Miss Clafford, uh, that's how you pronounce your name, isn't it? Yes, sir. Miss Clafford, on this particular August day, you were employed as a uh, currency exchange cashier. Yes, sir. Now, tell us what happened on this day. Well, uh, it was exactly two o'clock. I remember because I just looked at the clock. I was all alone in the bank, and the front door opened. I looked up, and my heart stopped beating. Yes, Walking toward me were three men. I don't know why, but the minute I saw them, I knew they were the poison gas bandits. I started to tremble. Yes, go on, please. The uh, the leader walked up to my cage and took a long metal container out of a paper bag and thrust the nozzle through the window. He told me to come out or he'd kill me with poison gas. And what did you do? I opened my mouth, but nothing came. He yelled at me again to come out, and from somewhere I... Heard my voice say, no, I'm not coming out. Yes. Then he uh, he did something to the metal container, and the next second, the poison gas hit me in the face. I can breathe. I grabbed my throat and fell back from the window. Yes, yes, Miss Clapper. Go on, please. Well, uh, somehow or other, my hand hit the, the doorknob to the cage. I grabbed it. My knees were beginning to collapse. Uh-huh. And, uh... Then my hand touched a button that locked the front door to the bank. I pushed this button. And that meant that you had locked the bandits inside the bank? Yes, sir, that's right. Miss Clafford, that's the most courageous thing I ever heard of. Blinded and choking from poison gas, yet 
Yet your one thought was to try and trap the bandit. Well, uh, from then on, everything happened fast. I opened the cage door, dragged it out, slammed it shut behind me. And the bandits? Well, the bandits dragged for the door, but it was too late. They couldn't get the money. I fell to the floor. Rest is pretty... Remember, when I came to, I, I was in the Mother Cabrini Hospital. It was three hours later, and a doctor told me I wasn't going to die. Thank heavens for that, Miss Crawford. And thank you for this interview. Coroner Brody, as police commissioner of the city of New York for many years, I've seen many brave deeds performed, but no one could have acted more bravely than Miss Clapper did in this emergency. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Commissioner Valentine. Anyway, following the holdup, the police flashed immediate alarms throughout the entire city and to all nearby cities. Two weeks passed after the attempted killing of Miss Clafford, and then another murder was committed that was to break the case wide open. It happened in Detroit. A police officer making his nightly rounds saw some men trying to break into a warehouse. At the same moment, the gunman turned and saw him. Hey, a cop coming this way. A cop. Get him, boys. Get him. Yeah. Get... Yeah, that did it. You're done. Let's get out of here. Come on. Come on. Right. Make that alley right up. Hold it. Someone ran out of that house. Hey, that's good shooting. Looks like a kid, but you got him before he knew what happened. Come on. More cops. Not the shooting. We're surrounded. Oh, don't shoot. I give up. You got it. Don't shoot. Okay, cops. Sergeant Murphy? Yes, officer. Here's a teletype alarm from the Detroit police. Yeah. Some gunman who killed a 15-year-old boy and wounded an officer. Three men were captured. Others may have escaped. Mm-hmm. When they got in the headquarters, they found papers showing they came from Chicago. Detroit thinks they may be the poison gas gang. Let's have that. Uh, the names don't mean anything right now, but we can check these three street numbers. We'll get this to Captain Rogers right away and then start checking these three addresses. Officer Sidney, search that clothes closet while I empty these bureau drawers. Right, sir. But if we don't find any clue in this place, Sarge, it looks like those fellas they grabbed in Detroit aren't the poison gas gang after all. Yep. The other two rooming houses didn't yield a thing. Well, there's nothing in this bureau. How about the closet? Also nothing. Uh, how about that shelf up there? I was just getting a chair to look. Captain Rogers bought me out once for not being thorough. Yeah. I learned my lesson. Hey, hey, there's some stuff up here. Oh, no. No, no, it's only some old newspapers. Well, hand them down. We'll check them anyway. Here you are. Okay. Hey, hey, something dropped out of that last one. Yes, a snapshot. Of whom? A dog. A picture of a wire-haired terrier. Yeah? Uh, that's no help. Yeah. No. Well, I guess we're through here. We'll get back to headquarters. Captain Rogers has wired Detroit for pictures of the suspects they picked up. It may help to identify. So this is all you found of those three rooming houses, eh, Sergeant Murphy? That's all, Captain Rogers. Just that snapshot of a dog. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any luck on those pictures they wired from Detroit. None of our witnesses recognized the gunman. We're right back where we started, Captain. This thing is getting fantastic. Two murders, an attempted murder... A dozen bank jets, one of the gang in jail, but the rest of them still at large and still unidentified. Yes, Murphy, I've never come up against a case like it. It can be that these fellows are so clever they've covered all their tracks. I'm convinced they're just having a streak of luck that's phenomenal. Well, what can we do next, Captain? Keep pounding away at every angle. There aren't any angles left. Well, a snapshot. I don't see anything there. We checked the landlady, but she said the fellow who had this room didn't own a dog. Neither did the other two. Hmm. Uh. I wonder who does own it. Could be any one of a hundred million people, Captain. Now, I'd like to know how this snapshot got into a gunman's possession. The owner of the dog might be able to tell if uh, we can find him. Or her. It's a will of the wisp, Captain Rogers. As I know. But have enlargements made of the snapshot so each squad can have one. It doesn't look like a mongrel dog, so it might have been bought in some pet store. 
Now, check all such storekeepers and uh, also veterinarians. I get you. But particularly children in the street. They usually know every dog in the neighborhood. So that's a good lead. That may narrow it a lot. It uh, may not have anything to do with the poison gas gang, but we've got to check everything. Okay, Sergeant Murphy. That's your assignment. Yeah, Danny, Annie. Yeah. Enough poison gas in those containers to rob every bank in the city. But I thought you weren't going to keep any of this stuff in your rooms. Only at the hideout. We need it first thing in the morning, Scapo. We're pulling the biggest job we've ever pulled. Yeah, but if someone should get in here by mistake and see those containers, Danny, Annie... Too bad Rex ain't still alive. He was a good watchdog. This is the only watchdog I need, Scapo. These guns... No one better try getting in here. Now, beat it. It's getting late. I want you back here first thing in the morning. We're pulling the biggest job. Captain Rogers speaking. Officer Sidney, Captain. We finally got something on that terrier. You have? Two young boys over here on the west side say it looks like a dog called Rex some man in the neighborhood owns. Where does he live? Well, they don't know the exact house, Captain Rogers, but it's somewhere on Madison Street. Good. But they haven't seen the dog for some time, and they think the man moved away. I see. All right, Sidney, you wait where you are. Sergeant Murphy and myself will be right out and check every house. This way, Sergeant. The landlady says the man who owned that dog lives on the top floor. Just one more flight. Well, it's taken almost three hours checking house to house, but it's worth it. Yes. He said his name is Edward Damiani. And headquarters has a file on Edward Damiani. I think we may have missed him. He's supposed to go out at night. It's almost midnight now. We'll know in a minute. Must be that door at the end of the hall. Yeah, come on. Careful, Sergeant. This Damiani is dangerous. This may be a trap. You never can tell. Try the door. Mm -hmm. Door's not locked. Open it quietly. Empty. Now there's a door leading to another room. Sergeant. Mm -hmm. Look, they're in the corner. Metal containers, laboratory bottles. It could be the poison gas equipment. We'll try this other room. And I'll be ready for anything when I shove the door open. I'm ready. Looks like we're too late. The bed's been slept in. There's a closet. We'll check that. Captain, behind the door. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Now, you... Oh, I've got it. Let go of me. Grab it. Grab it. All right. Get that all right. Let go of me. I tell you, let go. Yeah. Uh, that's one. Okay. Nice work. I'm making a break. I knew you don't know me, I'd advise you not to try that again. We're going to check that equipment in the other room. And if it turns out to be poison gas, I don't have to tell you what's going to happen. How'd you tell me? I didn't make a single mistake. Recognize this? Fix. Did you get that picture? You'll hear about that, dummy Annie, when you stand trial for murder. On January 10th, 1944, Commissioner Valentine, Edward Damiani and Alvin Krauss, who were still being held in jail, were ordered to stand trial. And what was the outcome, Coroner Brody? The electric chair for Krauss and life imprisonment for Damiani. As a result, Commissioner Valentine, the poison gas gang was at an end. These two criminals deserve the judgment they got, Coroner Brody. Just one more example that crime does not pay. Now, in just a moment, we'll broadcast our gangbusters nationwide clues. But first, a word from Waterman. It's true that when you want the finest of anything, you generally have to pay a lot more. But that's not true with ink, not by a bottle full. Just put a dime. Yes, I said a dime. On the counter and say, Waterman's Blue Black Ink, please. And what do you get? One, you get ink that's all ink. Nothing added, no dilution, no harmful solvents. Two, you get ink that writes up to three times as far as other nationally advertised inks. 
In fact, actual tests by a nationally known independent laboratory prove a single filling of your own fountain pen with Waterman's Blue Black Ink gives you up to 6,500 extra words. Three, this world-famous ink formula enables you to write with clear, sharp lines, making letters that almost defy the passing of time itself as well as fading in water. That makes three, count them, three reasons to buy this world favorite of all inks, Waterman, only ten cents in the handy tip fill bottle. Seven other colors, same price, same handy bottle. So next time you buy ink, to get the best, just look for the name Waterman. <coughs> now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues, broadcast every week as a public service to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Commissioner Valentine. And to illustrate how gangbusters listeners have cooperated with law enforcement agencies in helping to apprehend more than 300 wanted persons, over 70 of whom were charged with murder. Here is a letter addressed to me from the Honorable Miles F. McDonald, District Attorney, Kings County, Brooklyn, New York, dated Monday, January the 28th. 1946. Commissioner Lewis Valentine. My congratulations and thanks to Gangbusters for the broadcast on January 12, 1946 of wanted clue and description of Russell Donahue leading to his capture in Houston, Texas. The public owes a debt of gratitude for alertness, courage, and patriotism of the Houston Refrigerator Reaper Man who listened to this clue and reported his suspicions to the Houston agents of the FBI who, with the Houston Homicide Squad, quickly apprehended Donahue. This completes the apprehension of all four defendants in the armed robbery and tavern killing of prize fighter Al Bummy Davis. New York City police and representatives of my office are now in Houston to return the prisoner to our jurisdiction. The case will proceed promptly to trial. Very truly yours, Miles F. McDonald, District Attorney, Kings County, Brooklyn, New York. Thank you, District Attorney McDonald. You, too, may be of similar assistance in capturing some person wanted by the police. Listen carefully to the following description. Warning, citizens of East. At large, fugitive killer. Known to be armed and dangerous. Official description. Troy Blankenship. 39, 5 feet, 7 inches... 150 pounds, black hair, blue eyes, gunshot wounds, left elbow and forearm, slight limp in right leg, toes of foot turn in, slight limp in right leg. Be on alert for Troy Blankenship, dangerous killer. Watch for dangerous escaped federal prisoner. Ray Ernest, 38, 6 feet, 140 pounds, thinning brown hair, brown eyes, wears glasses. Tattoos include hammer and sickle and heart and dagger and initials CB, left forearm. Head of woman, right forearm. Repeating tattoos, hammer and sickle. Heart and dagger and initials CB, left forearm. Head of woman, right forearm. Wanted by the FBI, George Barkley. Age 50, approximately 5 feet 5 inches, 150 pounds, bright hair, gray at temples, blue or brown eyes, blue spot on right temple. Small scar, tip of nose. Blue spot on right temple. Small scar, tip of nose. Watch for George Barkley. Wanted by the FBI. Wanted, dangerous bank robber and murder suspect, Michael James Quinn. 37, 5 feet 9 inches, 149 pounds. Red hair, blue eyes. Occasionally wears glasses. Tattoos, red and blue cubit below outer left elbow. Initials MQJF, left forearm. Tattoo of a girl and bouquet on right forearm. 
Repeating tattoos. Red and blue Cupid below outer left elbow. Initials MQJF, left forearm. Tattoo of girl and bouquet on right forearm. These are the clues on the most urgently sought persons in the United States tonight. February 2nd, 1946. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Now, here is Commissioner Valentine. Next week, gangbusters present Inside Facts on the New Jersey Crime Combine. A mob of gang leaders and master criminals who fought their cunning and daring would outsmart the police, but who learned that even a stolen kiss can change the cleverest plan. Listen next week, same time, same station, to this authentic case on Gangbusters. And then... From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Dave Elwood, Johnny, Northwest Surety. Oh, hiya, Dave. How's the family? Oh, growing like weeds. You wouldn't even recognize I them. guess not. It's been a long time. Say, uh, you free at the moment, Johnny? Well, there's nothing going on here except the rent. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know exactly. Maybe smoke, maybe a fire. I got a girl here in you the office. You executives really live. Well, she's pretty enough to... Say, why don't you come on over here and meet her? Social, or do I get paid for it? You get paid. Uh-huh. Jay Dollar, Gigolo, personal attention to Lonely Hearts, special Lonely rates. Hearts? Why'd you say that? Say what? Lonely Hearts. I don't know. Why? Is it a code of some kind? Well, you could call it that, I guess. What's it mean? Johnny, if this girl is telling the truth, it means murder. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwest Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lonely Hearts matter. Item one, a dollar and sixty cents taxi fare from my apartment to the Northwest Surety Building in the office of Dave Elwood, Executive Claims Adjuster. A hard-working little man with thinning hair who, even after twenty years in the game, still couldn't help making every claim a personal matter. He met me in the outer office and led me off to one side. She's waiting inside there, Johnny. I wanted to brief you before you met her. Who is she, Dave? Her name is Norma Wells. She's from Chicago. She flew in from there this morning. Hasn't had any sleep. and She's pretty upset. Mm -hmm. What about her? Her father died three days ago. Suddenly, unexpectedly. What did he die of? Acute enteritis, supposedly. The death certificate hasn't been signed yet. Is that what you meant by murder? And his daughter thinks so. Mm -hmm. Was he insured with you? $50,000, term life, written five months ago. Who's the beneficiary? This daughter? No, his wife. Uh, His second wife, that is. The girl's mother died years ago. Wells remarried a month before the policy was issued. A woman named Mabel Burke. The insurance is payable to her. And the Wells girl thinks she killed him. That's what she says. She's pretty mixed up. Why did she come here? And I'm not quite sure, Johnny. Suppose you ask her. Okay, let's go. This way. What about that lonely hearts crack you made on the phone? Well, that's how he met this new wife, this Mabel Burke, through a lonely hearts club. Like they say, marriage is a lottery. In this case, it sounds more like Russian roulette. Yeah. In here. Miss Wells, this is Johnny Dollar. He's a specialist, an expert in this kind of thing. I'm sure he'll be able to help you. How do you do, Mr. Mr. Dollar? Miss Wells. Now, I'm going to leave you two alone. I have a couple of things i got to take care of. You just punch the intercom if you want me. Right, Dave. Thanks. Would you, uh, would you care for a cigarette, Miss Wells? No, thank you. I, yes, yes, I will, too. I, oh, please forgive me. I, I just can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's perfectly understandable. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Forgive me for being so blunt, but when was the last time you had something to eat? Why, why, yesterday morning, I, I guess. Uh Uh-huh. Dave. Yes, Johnny? Suppose you could send out for a glass of orange juice, a hot roll, a pot of coffee? Oh, sure. I'll have one of the girls go get it. Good, thanks. No, no, please. I I really couldn't. You're really going to, though. You're shaking so hard you can hardly hold on to that cigarette. I know. It's so stupid of me. 
You and your father were pretty close, I imagine. Yes. Until he married her. What kind of a woman is she? Well, she's strange. It's hard to explain. She's... She's sort of vague. Fuzzy around the edges, if, if that makes any sense. It, it's like she isn't even there sometimes, but but way off somewhere in, in, in time or space. A little batty? Is that what you're implying? No, no, not really. She could be as sharp as a tack when she wanted to. But something about her... Well, I was scared of her, Mr. Dollar. And I don't actually know why. I see. My father and I could never be alone. Somehow she always managed to be there, separating us, driving us apart. Did she ever say anything that would lead you to believe that? She didn't have to. Just being there was enough to... All right. I know what you're thinking. Father fixation. Second wife. Jealous daughter. Neurotic imagination. It's a possibility, isn't it? No. Don't you suppose I thought of that? Made allowances for it? You think I'm a fool? I, I, I don't know what to think, Miss Wells. You told Dave Elwood you believed your stepmother had murdered your father. And so far, the only reason you've given is the fact that she was around all the time. Maybe he wanted her around. Maybe that's why he married her. Of course he wanted her around. That's not what made me suspicious. Then what did? The fact that he took out life insurance, named her as beneficiary? Not at the time. I wasn't suspicious at all, Mr. Dollar. Not until... until the night he... he died. Oh, I... I was hurt, yes, and I felt out of place, so... Well, I moved out of the house three months ago and took an apartment off the loop. But I... I didn't have the slightest idea she might be planning to kill him. Did he carry any insurance before they were married? Some protection for you in case of... Uh... Oh, no. He, he didn't feel that it was necessary. He, he'd set up a trust fund, and, and there are some bonds and so on that I suppose will come to me. I see. No. The policy was entirely her idea. Thinking back, it, it seems to me she started talking about insurance the first week after they were married. And he finally gave in. If he hadn't, I... I think he'd still be alive. Mm -hmm. Just what were the circumstances of his death? I don't know. I wasn't there. She saw to that. What do you mean? Well, he was taken ill suddenly. In the middle of the night. He wanted her to call me, but she wouldn't do it. Why not? She claimed she didn't think it was anything serious. So there was no need of it. Instead, she called the doctor. Her doctor. A few minutes after he arrived, my father died. Then they called me. After it was all over. This doctor, is he the one who has refused so far to sign a death certificate? Oh, he was going to sign it all right. Until I got there and kicked up a scene. An obvious case of acute enteritis, he called it. Then he backed down. Decided maybe he should have another opinion. I went to father's doctor. But he said there was nothing he could do. Because he hadn't been called in at the time. He's the one who suggested I come here. Why so? He said the insurance company would help me. Since they were involved, too, they'd advise me what to do. Well, uh, what did he think about that diagnosis, acute enteritis? He said, he said it was possible, but extremely doubtful. He knew father's physical condition. He treated him for years. Mm -hmm. How long had your father known this Mabel Burke before they were married? Less than a month. He'd answered a Lonely Hearts ad in the paper. So I found out later by accident. Oh, I see. They both seemed embarrassed by the way they'd met. Was it a private ad or an organization? A club of some sort. The Rendezvous Club. They have an office on Atlantic Avenue. Mr. Dollar, it's not just imagination. Father's own doctor feels there's something wrong, too. That's why he sent me here. I'm not crazy. Easy now, easy. She killed him for his insurance. I know she did. Maybe, maybe. But there's not much to go on. Not at the moment, anyway. Think it's about time for a coffee break? Yeah, I imagine it's a little past time for Miss Wells. I couldn't. Really? I... Oh, yes, you could. Yes, you could. Go ahead now. Dig in. I'll be back in a few minutes. Have a word with you, Dave? Right, Johnny. Well, what do you think? I think it needs some looking into. How soon can you get Miss Wells and me on a plane for Chicago? An hour and a half. I've already checked. Good. I'll have her get a court order for an autopsy in case the coroner hasn't already asked for one. And we'll take it from there. Then you think the girl is telling the truth. I wouldn't bet on it. 
Expense account item two, $96.40. Transportation from Hartford and taxi tips and incidentals in Chicago. I dropped Norma Wells at her apartment, checked in at a hotel, and phoned the coroner's office. I learned that an autopsy request had been filed, but was being delayed pending a court order. I informed them that the daughter was available and willing now to cooperate with them. I left my name and asked the office to keep in touch with me. Item three, two dollars and ten cents. Taxi to the offices of the Rendezvous Club. Introductions arranged, mail forwarded, lonely hearts mended, and possibly murders planned. Well, hello. I must be in the wrong place. What do you mean? I mean, I, I can't see you as the lonely type. Oh, I'm not. I mean, I'm not a client. I work here. Really? For some reason, I'd always had the idea that these clubs were run by sweet old ladies of 75 or so. Oh, well, I don't exactly run it. Or at least I don't own it, if that's what you mean. Hey, you're not a client, for gosh sake. Any rules against it? Well, no. Well, how do I go about it? I mean, becoming a client. Well, you either write in or come in like you are now. Then you fill out a form, tell all about yourself, and attach a photograph. Mm-hmm. And Look, Buster, there's no use trying to kid you. Huh? We don't have a woman in our files under 45 years old. Well, maybe I got a mother complex. What? So I uh, fill out a form. Uh, what do you do with it then? Well, we'll keep it on file. Then we send out bulletins to the active members and forward letters back and forth. Or you can come in here and be introduced. And... Look, are you serious? Don't I act serious? Well, I don't get it. A young guy with your looks and... I bet you're selling something. No, no. As a matter of fact, I uh, just got in town and I'm trying to locate a certain fellow. I I was told he's a member of your club. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? What's his name? Jonathan Wells. He probably got his address. Jonathan Wells? Yeah. Have you got a file on him? Who are you? You're with the police. Police? Now, what gives you that idea? Well, I don't know anything about the man you're looking for. No? Well, uh, suppose we check through the file. It's not here. We don't keep the files here. Where do you keep them? They're not here. Well, uh, maybe they're in the next office. Through that door there. No, you can't go in there. Relax now. Take it easy. You have no right in there. I won't let you. Oh, oh, no. oh you stop now it. Now, you just stand right up there on that desk and stay out of trouble. Let me down. Who do you think you are, anyhow? You get out of here. You go get a warrant if you want to. Who was in here? Nobody. Do you smoke cigars? Of course I don't smoke yeah, cigars. Yeah, right there in the ashtray, still burning. Somebody just sneaked out through that door in the hall. Who was he? What's your name? Tetler. Danny Tetler. How long have you worked here? A year. Hey, I've got a hunch you're not a policeman. I didn't say I was. What about Wells? Have you got a file on him? No. What happened to it? I don't know what you're talking about. How about about Mabel Burke? Mabel Burke? Have you got a file on her? Of course not. What do you mean, of course not? She and Wells met through this club. Look, Buster, Mabel Burke owns this club. Johnny Dollar. This is Max Lancer, Mr. Dollar, DA's office. Oh? The coroner tells me you're cutting yourself in on this Jonathan Wells thing. I'm representing the insurance company. Wells carried a $50,000 policy payable to his widow. Yeah, so I hear. What about the autopsy? Any results? Not yet. The coroner's still working on it. I understand it was Wells' daughter who called you fellas in on this case. Yes, on the advice of her family doctor. I know, I talked to him. Only his version puts a different slant on things. What do you mean? Well, he thought she was suffering from temporary hysteria. He was only trying to calm her. He didn't think she'd really fly back to Hartford and stir up a mess like this. I see. Her father's sudden death must have been quite a shock to her. It may have caused her to uh, imagine things. Things like murder? Maybe. It's possible, anyway. What do you think? I think I'll wait for the results of that autopsy, Mr. Lancer. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Lonely Hearts Matter. Location, Chicago, Illinois. Expense account continued. (laughs) 
Item six, two dollars and ten cents for a late lunch at my hotel. I finished it, went up to my room and started trying to fit the few facts I had into some kind of a pattern that made sense. Max Lancer at the DA's office might be right. Maybe it was nothing more than just hysterical suspicion. And she'd admitted herself that she was hurt and jealous when he married Mabel Burke. Sudden death could still be natural death. And yet, all I could do at the moment was wait for the results of that autopsy. Yeah? Mr. Dollar. Mm, who is it? It's me, Norma Well. Oh, all right. Just a minute. Come in. Come in, Miss Wells. Thank you. <sighs> What's wrong? I'm scared. Of what? I don't know exactly. Oh? Well, here. Here. Run over here and sit down. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, oh, what do you mean you don't know exactly? Could I be... Be losing my mind, Mr. Dollar? If you were, you'd be the last one to think so. Now tell me what's happened. Well, I... I went to the coroner's office to sign the authorization for the autopsy. And then went back to my apartment. And a little while later, the phone rang. And when I answered it, there was nobody on the line. A wrong number, maybe. No. I mean... I mean, there was somebody on the line. But they didn't say anything. I kept saying hello. And then there was a click and... And the line went dead. And that's all that happened? No. A short time afterward, I, I heard footsteps out in the hall. They stopped at my door. And I kept waiting for someone to ring the bell. When they didn't, I... I finally got up enough courage to open the door. There was nobody there. I see. A few minutes after that, the phone rang again. The same thing as before. I couldn't stay there any longer. I ran out and got a taxi and came here. Well, who do you think might be doing a thing like that, Miss Wells? I don't know. But somebody is. I'm not just imagining things. Max Lancer, the DA's investigator, seems to think you might be. I know. He talked to me at the coroner's office. That's why I came to you, Mr. Dollar. You've got to help me, please. I'd be glad to, but how? Well, there must be something you can do. Yeah, yeah. I can wait for that autopsy report. And at the moment, that's about all I can do. Without some definite evidence of a crime, something stronger than mere suspicion, we don't have a leg to stand on. But, but suppose the report doesn't show anything. Well, then I wipe the egg off my face and go back to Hartford. But, but look, maybe she was, she was clever enough to kill my father in some way that wouldn't show up in an autopsy. Such as? I don't know. But I do know, as sure as I'm sitting here. That she married him and got him to take out that insurance policy with the full intention of murdering him. Well, such things have been known, all right. Somebody using a correspondence club to contact wealthy pigeons. Did you know that your stepmother owns that Lonely Hearts Club? Owns it? That's what the girl in charge told me. A Fanny Tetler. Do you know her? No. I've never heard of her. And neither Mabel nor my father ever mentioned that she owned the place. She apparently has somebody running it for her. A man, I think. Any idea who he might be? No. He slipped out before I got a chance to see him. Smoked cigars. He left one burning in the ashtray. Wait. Maybe it's Burton. Burton? Burton Creeley, her nephew. He smokes cigars. Oh, well, that's the first I've heard of him. Oh, he's detestable. He moved in on us right after Mabel and my father were married. He's the main reason why I left the house. I couldn't stand him. He was always after me. Bothering me. Is he still living there? So. Was he in the house the night your father died? Yes. At least he was when I got there. That was an hour afterward, as I told you. Does he have a job, work anywhere? I don't think he's ever worked. He lives off of her. Uh -huh. He and your father get along all right? Oh, my father could get along with anyone. He always managed to see the best in people. And then Burton was careful to, to act different around him. I see. I suppose you think that's some more of my imagination. Well, frankly, Miss Wells, I don't know what to think. If there was only some way to prove what I'm sure of. Well, let's wait for that autopsy report. Meantime, I think I'll go out and talk to your stepmother. What about me? Stay right where you are. Don't go out of this room. When I get back, we'll pick up some things from your apartment, and you can check in here at this hotel for a few days. <laughs> Expense account item seven. Taxi to Lakeshore Drive in the beachfront residence of the late Jonathan Wells. I was beginning to feel more and more like a fool. It looked as though Max Lancer might be right. Apparently, a jealous, hysterical girl had lost her head and stirred up a nasty mess, all without one single fact to back up her suspicions. 
I had a hunch the autopsy report was going to show death from natural causes. For two cents, I'd have thrown the case over. In fact, I didn't even see where I had a case. Good afternoon, young man. How are you? How do you do? Are you Mrs. Wells? Yes, that's right. Is there something I can do for you? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the company that holds the insurance policy on your late husband's life. Oh, well, you must be mistaken. Mr. Morningby represents that company, young man. Mr. Matthew R. Morningby. Uh, Mr. Morningby is the local agent. I'm from the home office in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, I see. Yes, I have my credentials right here if you'd like to see Oh, no, 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 that isn't necessary. I always judge people by their faces. And you have an honest face, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask you a few questions, Mrs. Wells. Well, I suppose so. I know this must be painful for you, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Oh, well, now, don't you worry about me. I'm all right. Of course, I miss Jonathan and all that. He was a terribly nice man, terribly. But I think of death as just being the doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Well, that's uh, one way of looking at it. You just come right in, young man, and ask all the questions you're a mind to. Thank you. You come right in here, and we'll sit down and have a nice chat. Oh, this is a very attractive house, Mrs. Wells. Oh, yes, yes, I think so, too. Jonathan built it years ago. He and his first wife lived here, you know. Of course, I've changed the drapes and things. Uh, just some of the little things sit right down there now. Thank you. And his daughter, too. Uh, she lived here the first month we were married, and then she moved into town. Oh, a strange little thing, really. Sort of uh, nervous and irritable. I've met her, Mrs. Wells. Oh, well, then you know what she's like. Oh, it's too bad, too. Would you like some tea and cookies, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, thanks. That's one thing Jonathan wouldn't miss for the world. His tea and cookies at four o'clock every afternoon. Every afternoon. Oh? The house just doesn't seem the same without him. No, I imagine it doesn't. That's how I won his heart, you know. With my cookies and cakes. Oh? Oh, he really did adore them. And it was such a pleasure... Baking things for a person who appreciated them so much. Yes. It makes you feel lonesome and lost not having anybody to cook for. Do you ever feel lonesome, Mr. Dollar? Well, I guess everybody does at times. Why, I... at the time I met Jonathan, I was feeling so lonesome I could just cry. Mr. Burke had died two years before. Mr. You know. Burke? Yes, he was my husband before Jonathan. That was in St. Louis, of course. I oh, see. He was a fine man, too. Walter Mabley Burke. Tall and handsome and impressive looking. Just like his name sounds. And a perfect picture of health. Right up to the day he died. His death was sudden? Unexpected? Oh, yes. A complete surprise. Acute indigestion, the doctor called it. Mm. Of course, I don't think he was quite as thoughtful as Jonathan. Jonathan was always so considerate. And he, he was a... Oh, my gracious, here I go, just rambling on and on. You didn't come here to listen to my silly little affairs. No, 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 they're very interesting. Well, I've always tried to keep busy and keep my mind occupied. That's why I started in business. The Lonely Hearts Club. Oh, well, you've heard about it. Well, I admit I felt kind of foolish at first about starting it. I mean, you know how people josh about those kinds of clubs. It was Burton's idea, really. He's my nephew, you know. Oh, dear, I wish he were here this afternoon so you could meet him. So do I. He's such a nice boy. He thought I'd do real well at that kind of business, and he was right, too, absolutely right. Oh, not money, you understand, but it was loads of fun meeting all those nice people, especially men, yes. I see. That's how I met Jonathan. So I was told. That's the way it happened. He wrote into the club, and I sent him my picture, and that's what started it. I remember when Burton showed me the letter, he said, Aunt Mabel, this one sounds like your kind of man, and he certainly was, too. Uh -huh. Does Burton help you with the club? Oh, well, he runs it, really. He's such a sweet boy, and he works so hard. I just don't know what I'd do without Burton. I don't know what I'd do. Yes, I imagine he's a great comfort to oh, you. Oh, you have no idea, Mr. Darwin. I suppose not. Well, I guess I'd better run along, Mrs. Wells. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. It seems like young folks nowadays don't often have the gift for conversation the way they did in my time. Well, things move faster today. Well, I certainly hope that company of yours moves fast, young man. Well... I have to start house hunting, you know. The estate and everything goes to Jonathan's daughter, and all I have is the insurance. Yes. Oh, it's such a bother, Mr. Dollar. The funeral and moving and all the details. Seems like I just have the worst luck with my husband's. I walked out of there groggy, my head spinning. No wonder Norma Wells was nervous and hysterical. I felt that way myself after only a few minutes of it. And I still had no case, not one piece of evidence. I'd had a pleasant chat with a sweet old lady, a little on the dotty side maybe, but that was all. Dead end. Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me in the hotel lobby. 
You'll notice I'm holding my hat in my hand, Mr. Dowling. How come? It's a symbol of humility. You were right all along. According to the coroner's report, Jonathan Wells died from a dose of ground glass. So it's murder after all. Then in that case, do something for me, will you? From now on, I'm your man. Contact the authorities in St. Louis and have them check into a death that happened there about two and a half years ago. A man named Walter Maberly Burke. Who's he? Mrs. Wells was married to him at the time. Uh Uh-oh. Another murder? No, just a matter of bad luck. She told me so herself. Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Johnny, what's up? Plenty, Dave. The Wells girl was right. Her father was murdered. We just got the autopsy report. He died from a dose of ground glass. Then I'll put a stop order on the insurance claim. It was filed this afternoon. And something else, Dave. A man died in St. Louis about two and a half years ago. I wonder if you'd have mutual records service check and see if he was insured. His name was Walter Maberly Burke. Johnny, yeah, I know. A... Jonathan Wells' widow was previously married to Burke. They were married at the time of his death. And he also died suddenly and mysteriously. Holy smoke. Just called her murdering Mabel. Oh, you haven't met her, Dave. She's just a sweet old lady who's had a little bad luck now and then. And she regards death as the doorway to a greater and more glorious life. Oh? Well, that sounds very noble. It would. If she didn't keep slamming the door. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Chicago, to the home office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lonely Hearts Matter. Expense account continued. Item 8, $7.65, dinner for Norma Wells, myself. It was brought up by room service and we ate alone in my suite. Norma didn't feel like facing the dining room. I was still trying to figure her out. When she'd come to me with a claim that her father had been poisoned by her stepmother for his insurance, I'd tagged her for a jealous, hysterical kid. And that still went. But now, with the autopsy report in, it was more than that. She was right. Jonathan Wells had been poisoned. And again, when she told me someone was hanging around her apartment, I only half believed her. But by now, I was about ready to believe anything. I'd have sworn I couldn't eat a bite. Well, you needed it. You've been going on nothing but nerve. And I'll still be. Until this is all over. Well, it shouldn't take long now. That autopsy report gives us the green light. The police will move in now, and we can put the pressure on. It's it's such a terrible thing. Why, why six months ago, when she married him, she was planning this right then. It looks that way, all right. Father was always so good to her. And yes, and to that worthless nephew of hers, Burton Creeley. What kind of a mind does a person have, Mr. Dollar? To do a thing like she did. Well, it hasn't been proved yet that she's the one who did it, Miss Wells. No, but who else could have? I don't know. More coffee? No, thanks. Well, whenever you're finished, we'll take a taxi over to your apartment and pick up whatever you need and then get you a room here at the hotel. I don't think you're in danger, but I imagine you'll feel a lot less nervous here. Oh, I will. And I do appreciate your your help and kindness, Mr. Dollar. Forget it. It's part of my job. Only this time, when you check in, you go to your room and stay put. What do you mean? When I came back from talking to Mabel Burke, Max Lancer from the DA's office was waiting for me down in the lobby. He said he'd phoned here to the room five or six times. Got no answer. I was here. I I heard the phone, but... Well, I didn't know if if you wanted me to answer. He sent a bellboy up to knock on the door. Well, I... I must have been in the shower. I was here all the time. Don't you believe me? Any reason I shouldn't believe you? Are you through eating? Yes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Expense account item nine, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi from the hotel to Norma Wells' apartment. Night had fallen over the city and the tall buildings of the loop shimmered above the noisy blaze of lights. Laughing groups of early dinner goers jostled through the scrambling packs of late shoppers. Auto horns, blaring jazz, newsboys, traffic whistles. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Yesterday never was. Tomorrow's only a dream, and today's nearly gone. So hurry it up and let's get going. We'll sleep when we're dead. Like Jonathan Wells on his cool marble slab in the city morgue. 
It's apartment C, the next door on the left. Right. <laughs> Have a key here somewhere. Sure you locked it? Oh, yes, I always... It's not locked. Well, you were scared when you left it. Maybe you No. Did. I remember locking the door. You sure? Yes. Now it's... Stay some... back. Is it, Mr. Dollar? Come on in. Oh. Oh, no. Yeah, it looks as though you've had visitors, Miss Wells. The whole place turned upside down. Why would anyone want to do that? Looking for something, probably. For what? I don't know. Suppose you look around, see if you notice anything missing. Mr. Dollar, I've gone through the whole place twice now, and I'm certain that nothing's been taken. But they had to have some reason to break in here, go through everything this way. I suppose so, but... Well, I'm positive there's nothing missing. All right. If there isn't, there isn't. Well, do you suppose that coffee's ready now? Oh, I think so. Come on in the kitchen. I guess you'll believe me now. Somebody was hanging around here earlier today. Mm. Just wish I could figure what they're after. Hmm... Looks plenty strong. There's sugar there on the table. I'll get some cream from the refrigerator. Don't bother on my account. I drink it black. Well, not me. I use plenty of both. Lots and lots of cream and two heaping spoons of sugar. Well, they must have had a reason to break in here. If it wasn't to steal something, then what was the reason? The sugar looks funny. Doesn't make sense at all. I guess I ought to keep it covered. Mm. The sugar... I was saying it looked funny. Well... Wait a minute. Maybe they broke in to leave something. Leave something? Yeah. Here. Give me that cup. And the spoon. What are you doing? Look. That's funny. It didn't even dissolve. The sugar dissolved, all right. Well, then what's that in the spoon? Ground glass. I phoned Max Lancer and had him send over a policewoman to accompany Norma Wells back to the hotel, get her checked in, and stay with her overnight. Then I called the Wells residence. The old lady answered the phone herself, and I asked for her nephew, Burton Creeley. She said he wasn't in. So on an off chance, I took a taxi to the office of the Rendezvous Club, Lonely Hearts Unlimited. There was no light showing behind the transom over the door. door was unlocked. I fumbled around for a light switch, but somebody beat me to it. Get your hands up! Well, at least I've found you in this time. What are you doing here? Who are you? Put that gun away, Creeley. Or if you're going to use it, you'd better take the safety off first. Safety? What are you doing? <laughs> All right, hey. let go of it, Creeley. Thanks. You think you'll get away with this, mister? You're crazy. Mm, my mistake. The safety was off. Sorry to rough you up, but I don't like people who go around pointing guns at people without any reason for it. You broke in here. That's illegal entry. I'll have you arrested. Why not? Why not? The phone's right behind you. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar. I'm a special investigator for the Northwestern Surety Company. What? I imagine the name is familiar to you, since they're holding a $50,000 life insurance policy on the late Jonathan Wells, with your Aunt Mabel named as beneficiary. What are you doing here? Looking for you, as a matter of fact. What for? I wanted to ask you why you sneaked out through the door there the other day in the office when I was here earlier. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, knock it off, Creeley. You got in such a hurry, you left your cigar burning there in the ashtray, the same brand you're smoking right now. Uh, I, I thought you were a bill collector. You knew who I was. You were listening there at the door while I talked to your secretary. Now, why'd you run out? Oh, all right, all right. I did know who you were, Mr. Dollar, but, well, you're misinterpreting things. No kidding. In what way? I was... Late for an appointment. I, I didn't want to get tied up. I figured you could find out anything you wanted to know from my aunt. I, I, I saw no necessity for talking to you. I see. Where have you been since then? Right here, most of the time. And the rest of the time? Well, what difference does it make? You weren't over at Norma Wells' apartment by any chance. <laughs> Are you kidding? I detest that girl. Why so? Because she's a smug, self-satisfied little phony. She's too big for a britches. What makes you think I'd be hanging around her? Somebody was. 
I don't get it. Somebody broke into her apartment this afternoon or this evening and turned it upside down. She hasn't got anything I want. They didn't take anything. They broke in to leave something. I found some ground glass planted in her sugar bowl. Ground glass? Sound familiar? What are you getting at? You mean you haven't heard about the coroner's report on Jonathan Wells? No, why? What has that got to Mr. do with... Mr. Wells died from a dose of ground glass. You, you mean he was killed, murdered? I don't imagine he ate the stuff intentionally, do you? I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, the police aren't having that trouble. I just can't imagine anybody. He's such a nice guy. He always got along fine with everybody. Including you? Yes. We got to be good friends. What about his daughter, Norma? I don't really know. She blew a top and moved out a month after Aunt Mabel and Jonathan were married. Why? Oh, Jealous, I guess. She couldn't stand it to see her father pay any attention to anybody but her. Did they quarrel much? Jonathan never quarreled with anybody. No, she just seemed to go around with a mad on most of the time. She's a rare one, that girl. What do you mean? Oh, she seems to think of herself as a princess or something. I understand you made quite a play for her at first. I suppose she told you that. Did you? I tried to be friendly to her, that's all. I, I don't know what she chose to call it. Mr. Dollar, I'm engaged to Miss Tetler, the girl that works here in the office. Mm -hmm. What do you do for a living, Mr. Creeley? Oh, I take care of this correspondence club for Aunt Mabel. I've got sort of a heart condition. I can't work too hard. I see. You know, it might be a good idea if you checked in with the police. They'll probably want to talk to you. Well, who do they think did it? Well, they haven't arrested anybody yet, but there are a lot of straws pointing in one direction. What direction? Towards your Aunt Mabel, I'm afraid. But that's ridiculous. Now, she may be a little vague, not quite all with it, maybe, but she wouldn't do a thing like that. They're out to frame her. That's what they're doing. Who else had a motive, Mr. Creeley? But what about his daughter? She stands to gain by all this. She inherits the estate. Maybe she faked that burglary, planted the ground glass in her apartment herself. Have you thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I've thought of it. Johnny Dollar. Max Lancer, Johnny. DA's office. How is she? Pretty weak. The hospital staff are doing all they can for her, but they don't give her much hope. Has she been able to talk? No, not yet. Maybe not ever. It was ground glass, all right. The doctor's sure of it now. The same as her husband. Why, Johnny? Why her? I'll guess with you. Maybe she figured we were closing in on her. The game was over and took this way out. We had nothing on her, Max. Suspicion, that's all we were going on. She'd had two husbands in the last three years. Both of them died from the effects of ground glass poisoning. And both times she goes for $50,000 insurance. That's all we had to go on, and it wasn't enough. But maybe she didn't realize that. I can give you a better theory. Okay, sound off. Somebody tried to murder her. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Chicago. To the home office, Northwestern Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lonely Hearts Matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 15, $2.60. Sandwiches, cigarettes, and incidentals, which I had sent up from a lunchroom across the street from the hospital. It was evening again now. I'd spent the whole day in the lounge down the hall from the room where Mabel Burke Wells was fighting for her life. Fighting and slowly losing. I tagged her as a murderess, responsible for the deaths of two of her husbands. But then she herself had been struck down by the same poison. And now only she had the key to the puzzle. A key she might never give up. Calling Dr. Kenworthy. Dr. Kenworthy. Dollar? Hmm. In delivery room. Oh, hiya, Creeley. Dr. Any change Kenworthy. yet to my aunt's condition? No. No, I just talked to the doctor. If anything, she's even weaker. She didn't even recognize me. I've been in the room off and on all day. She didn't even know I was there. Well, she's in pretty bad shape. Sit down. You look a little rocky yourself. Thanks. I feel that way. Aunt Mabel's been a real mother to me. This is quite a shock. Yes, I imagine. Doctor says it's the same thing that killed Jonathan. Yes, that's right. Well, that just doesn't make any sense, Mr. Dollar. Say, tell me something. 
Did anyone come to the house to see your aunt, either last night after Lancer left or this morning before I got there? And as far as I know, why do you think someone might have? I don't know. She'd already gone to bed when I came in last night. I left early this morning. It's possible, of course, but I don't believe anyone did. She never had any visitors. She's always been a lonely person, actually. Maybe that's why she started the Lonely Hearts Club. Yes, it was. I suggested the idea to her as a way to meet friends and be around people. She loved it. Why couldn't she and Jonathan's daughter, Norma Wells, get along? Ah, she's a strange girl. Always had a chip on her shoulder. I spoke to Jonathan about it once, but he just laughed it off. He said Norma just had too much possessiveness. Yeah, well, I guess it's natural. The two of them had been alone a long time until he married your aunt. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Well, the police think that Aunt Mabel killed him, don't they? They've got some pretty strong reasons for thinking so. And the way she is now, dying in her, I suppose they think she did it herself? It's possible she did. Is that what you think? Oh, I'm not sure I am. Oh, come on over, Miss Wells. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt. Just making conversation. You two know each other, I guess. Yes. Well, I think I'll get on a cup of coffee. See you later, Doc. I can't stand that man. So I gather. How is she? Not much change. Couldn't bear just sitting in that hotel room wondering what was happening. She hasn't been able to talk? No, not yet. I don't understand it. My father died less than two hours after he was first stricken. Difference in constitution, maybe. Different dosage. She's too mean to die. She's... I'm sorry I said that. It was cruel and heartless, but... That's the way I feel. I, I can't help it. When I think of my father, so kind and gentle, murdered in cold blood by that if woman... If she did do it, then why this? You mean the same thing happening to her? That's right. Remorse, maybe, if she's capable of it. Or fear. I don't know why. Maybe she's insane. I've always thought she might be. Oh, she's sane, all right. As sane as any of us. And what do you think happened to her? <sighs> oh, I don't know. We probably never will know. She'll die without talking, and, and there'll never be any proof. That's a possibility. That, that worthless nephew of hers will collect the insurance, I suppose. That's not my department. But under the circumstances, I think he'd have a legal claim. It's, it's horrible. Mr. Dollar. What is it, nurse? She's conscious, and she wants to see you. She was a dying woman. I could see at the moment Norma Wells and I walked into the room. I sent the nurse to find her nephew, Burton Creeley, and he slipped in quietly a few seconds later. The old lady lay back on her pillows, smiling to herself as usual, bright-eyed with a last burst of false vitality. Death was only minutes away. All of us knew it. And she knew it, too. My gracious. All of you look so serious. But it was nice of you to come. It keeps a body from feeling lonesome. You save your strength now, Mrs. Wells. What on earth for? body can't enjoy their last few breaths. They might as well not be living. Please, Aunt Mabel, let's... Don't you please me, Burton Creeley. Straighten your tie. You look a fright. My, certainly nice to see you here, Norma. I, well, I, I, I just... always said to Jonathan, it's just a crying shame that Norma and me can't hit it off better. <laughs> you just laugh and... Mrs. Say, Wells. Oh, be quiet, young man. I know what you're after. All in due time. As a matter of fact, that's why I wanted to see you. I've been in my senses for the last hour, but I just didn't let on. I wanted a chance to think. I'm about to die, you know. Aunt Mabel, don't talk that way. Oh, simmer down, Burton. Death is only the doorway to a more glorious life. Remember that. Mr. Dollar. I didn't do it. I know. I finally came to that conclusion myself, too late. You mean you're not surprised? No. Well, at least it's a help that I don't have to convince you. I'm afraid I won't have that much time. What are you saying? You heard me, Norma. I said I didn't kill Jonathan. 
Well, I was much too fond of him to do a thing like that. Who did kill him, Mrs. Wells? That's what I was puzzling over for the last hour. Then, when I figured it out, I had to decide whether to let sleeping dogs lie or see that justice took its course. And I... I... Easy now. <laughs> but I remembered how kind Jonathan had been and decided to... Aunt Mabel, don't, don't try to talk anymore. Those chocolates, Becton, that you gave me this morning, oh, that was an awful naughty thing to do, Burton. And now you have to be punished for it. Wait a minute, Mrs. Wells. Jonathan. Walter, too. Yeah, they were always so nice to you. I just can't understand why you did it. Mr. Dollar. Yes? You take Burton in hand. Give him... Give him a good talking to. Explain to him that... Mrs. Wells. That he... He must go around. Is she... Yeah. Well, Creeling... Get your hands up, Dollar. Huh? One move from you and Norma gets a bullet right in the back. Let go of me! Into the closet, Dollar. Don't go on, you fool, Creeling. Hurry up. Oh. Go on. Now, remember one thing, Dollar. I'm taking Miss High and Mighty here along. If they get me, then she goes, too. The door was solid, built to last. It took me several minutes to smash it open. The nurse in the corridor said Creedy and Norma Wells had gone down in the elevator. I grabbed the floor phone and called the main desk in the lobby. They said some man and a girl had just stolen an ambulance from the emergency driveway and headed west onto the Lakeshore Parkway. And at that moment, Max Lancer stepped off the elevator. Johnny, what's going on? Back to your car, Max. Come on. We could hear the ambulance siren for a while somewhere up ahead of us, then we lost it. Max kept the red light flashing and the accelerator on the floorboard. The speedometer needle edge past 85, touched 90, and hung there. We were nine miles up the parkway when I saw it. Parked cars, a crowd gathering, and the ambulance rolled over against the bank. Where are they? A man in the crew got out of it. They ran into the brush there. He's carrying a gun. Take the east side, Johnny. I'll go around the other way. All right, Max. And watch yourself. The undergrowth was heavy, a mass of dark shadows slashed here and there by beams of light from the headlamps of the cars on the road above. Max disappeared into the night, and I moved on alone. Minutes passed. Then a car light shifted slightly, and I saw them, only a few yards away, crouched against a tree. He was holding the gun pressed against his side. Hold it, Dollar. You're finished, Creeley. You better give up. You know what I told you. If I go, she goes. Johnny, he's going to kill me. I was holding my gun at my side, but I didn't dare lift it, try to aim it. One false move on my part, and he pulled the trigger, blast the life out of Norma Wells. Then she struggled slightly, tried to pull away from him. I had a one-second chance, and I took it. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Yes. I didn't have time to call the shot. I had to get it off fast. Yeah. Looks like it caught him in the heart. Expense account item 16, $231.25. Hotel and incidentals in Chicago and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $416.40. End of account, end of report. Remarks? A heart with a bullet hole in it. There's a real lonely heart. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the Callicles matter, which is just another way of saying the Greeks had a word for it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. 
Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Howard McNear, and Stacey Harris. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Robert Ecker, Mr. Parsons' secretary. You telephone this office for an appointment with Mr. Parsons. That's right. I'm an investigator, Mr. Ecker. I was sent here by Eastern Casualty and Trust. We understand David Parsons is missing. I want to talk to Mr. Parsons Sr. about it. Oh. Well, Mr. Parsons Sr. isn't in the office today. He's home ill. This is pretty important, Mr. Recker. Maybe I better call him at home. Why don't you come to the office? I'll try to arrange to take you out there. I don't want to be a lot of trouble. There'd be more trouble if I didn't. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25, Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Expense account item one, $200.05, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived at midnight, went straight to the Beverly Hilton, had a good night's sleep, and woke up to an early spring heat wave. By nine o'clock, I had placed my call to Parsons, Stocks, and Bonds. At ten o'clock, I met Robert Ecker in person. He was a man about my age with a thin face and good clothes. Judging from his office, the job of secretary was a pretty responsible one. I don't quite understand this, Mr. Dollar. What made you think that Mr. Parsons Jr. is missing? Is he around? You mean, is he in town? Yeah, is he in town? Is he around? Can I see him? Well, none of us exactly knows where he is, but he's not what you'd call missing. Well, now, that depends on how you look at it, Mr. Recker. We understand David Parsons hasn't been seen for ten days. Is my information wrong? Well, no, no, what you say is true. You mean you're here to look into the matter? That's about it. May I say something? Sure. When you're speaking of David Parsons in front of his father, Mr. Parsons Sr., I suggest that you don't use that word missing. I'll try to remember that. The connotation might upset him. I'm certain he doesn't regard Mr. Parsons' absence in the missing sense. Maybe you can tell me how he does regard it. I'm afraid I can't. Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't confide in me. How about David Parsons' wife? Sorry. How about your own opinion? I'd rather keep my opinions to myself, Mr. Dollar. There's nothing personal, but uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. is very adamant about certain matters. In other words, uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. does all of the thinking for publication. So to speak, yes. What concern does the uh, Eastern... Casualty and Trust Company have in this matter? Yes. Uh, what is the bonding company's concern? A hundred thousand dollars. It was an automatic write-up on David Parsons, Jr. when he entered the firm. I still don't understand. David Parsons had access to great amounts of money and transferable bonds here. That's why we're responsible, Mr. Recker. Is that an inference? If it sounds like I'm worried that David Parsons might have walked off with some money or some bonds, it's an inference. (laughs) That's rather ridiculous, isn't it? I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Recker. I regard it that way. Mr. Parsons is worth a considerable amount of money. A million dollars would be a conservative estimate of his fortune. His father, of course, is, well, Mr. Parsons Sr. Yes, we're well aware of Mr. Parsons holding. But sometimes things aren't what they seem. You know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I don't know exactly what you mean, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, uh, take these, for instance. Mr. Dollar. Take these. Just what? Here, these copies of Eastern Casualties policies on your desk, Mr. Recker. Now, let's see, you call me about nine. It's a little after ten now. That gave you an hour to dig them out, study them over, and answer for yourself the exact questions you've been making me answer. Isn't that about it, Mr. Recker? Yes. Yes, I'd say that's just about it, Mr. Dollar. Robert Ecker drove me out to the Bel Air home of David Parsons Sr. On the way, he spoke of the weather, the situation in Algiers, uh, the trouble he had making reservations for weekends in Palm Springs, 
and the low fuel consumption of his new Studebaker Golden Hawk. He avoided very carefully any further mention of David Parsons Jr., the missing son. I put a couple of direct questions to him, which he answered indirectly by referring me to Mr. Parsons Sr., so I let it go at that. Jenny? Jenny? Somebody must be around. You said your phone. I did. Jenny? Oh, hello. Hello, Robert. Nobody around? No one so far. They must be upstairs. He's been at it today. Called me over here an hour ago. Oh, I'm Mrs. Parsons. I'm Johnny Dollar. How do you do? I beg your pardon. You shouldn't, Robert. It was purposeful. Uh, Mrs. Parsons. I'm the one you're not supposed to meet, Mr. Dollar. I'm David's wife. I just received orders from upstairs that this matter will be handled upstairs. Is that so? Oh, yes, that's quite so. My father-in-law feels that he has extraordinary competence in this matter, as in all matters, huh, Robert? We'd better get along, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? No, I feel fine. I mean about your father-in-law handling it. That makes very little difference, Mr. Dollar. It's my husband who's missing, but his son. You're a, a policeman or a detective, aren't you? In a way, yes. You look like a very charming man, Mr. Dollar. Becker! Becker, is that you down there? Just a moment, Mr. Parsons. Hurry up! <laughs> you may have to practice some charm on him. Thank you for the tip, Mrs. Parsons. Not at all. It was nice to have met you. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Mrs. Parsons. We'd better get up there. Becker! Robert Ecker led me upstairs into a massive bedroom that could only have been decorated for a massive old man, which is exactly what David Parsons Sr. turned out to be. Six and a half feet tall, I guessed at it, since he was stretched out in bed. He had a pair of coal black eyes and white hair, liberally sprinkled with gray. He spilled a briefcase full of papers and documents off the bed, punched his pillow around, and glared hard at me. What's his name? This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Parsons. You see if he had any credentials? No, sir. Well, I... find out! Mr. Dollar. Sure, sure. Here, look these over. I looked them over. Hand them to me. Yes, Mr. Parsons. They could be forgeries. It could be a newspaper report or something like that. Go downstairs and use the hall phone. Call this company and see if they have anyone named Johnny Dollar working for them. Hurry it up. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Those credentials are genuine. You know it and I know it, Mr. Parsons. I'm not waiting around here while you call Boston and talk to someone there you won't believe either. Now, I'm at the Beverly Hilton. You call me when you've made up your mind to talk about this matter. Fine. Now get out. I got in town last night and contacted your office first thing. I wanted to talk to you about it first for several reasons. One, you're David Parsons' father. It's your company, not his, that can be jeopardized in a situation like this. Two, you seem the logical man to see to clear up the matter easily. Now that I've seen you, I'm not so sure of that. I'll have to go to somebody else. Wait a minute. What do you mean, go to somebody else? I mean, I'm not going to sit in a hotel room cooling my heels waiting for you to call me. I have to find out about this, and there are other people to talk to. Your son's wife, the whole household. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. The police, if I have to. I'd break you. I'd break you in half. Then I'd get pretty mad, and both halves of me would figure this thing out if it took a million years and a million dollars. Ecker. Yes, sir? Get out of here. Yes, sir. You've got five minutes. I've got five minutes and ten minutes and a million minutes if I need them. We have a report your son's been missing for ten days now. One of our brokers reported it. He happened to be one of your son's clients. Missing. All right, where is he? How would I know? I take that to mean you don't know. Do you have any ideas? Of course not. Have you had an audit of your books since he disappeared? What? Have you had an audit? Is there anything missing? Bonds, cash in the company? Becker! Becker! Throw this bum out of here and make sure he bounces a couple of times. Mr. Parsons. Throw him out! I've got you by a good 25 pounds, Ecker. Maybe you'd better leave, Mr. Dollar. I think I'll stay. Oh, if I could get out of this bed, I'd do it my... Ecker! Run along, Mr. Ecker. He'll calm down. I can wait him out. You leave without throwing him out and you're fired. Throw him out! I'll wait for you downstairs, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> All right. Sit down. What day is today? Friday. It was a week ago Tuesday. David left the house, according to his wife, and that's the last anyone saw him. No word, nothing since then. No police? Of course not, no police. I can hear you, I can hear you. Why? You know why as well as I do. An investment broker missing. What the papers wouldn't do with that? What's been going on? Nothing. We've been waiting to hear from him. No one's done anything? What is there to do that won't bring out the press? Look, I'm not worried about the press. I'm worried about your son, Mr. Parsons. Whatever happened to him has had a ten-day start. 
And nothing's been done about it. Now, how about the books? What about them? Have you had an audit? Now, look here, you Keep young... Keep your voice now, will you? I ask you a simple question. Have you found anything missing? I haven't looked. Where are you going? Well, if what you say is true, no one's seen or heard of David Parsons for ten days, then I'm going to get some help. What help? Police. I don't want any police in on this. How much does your responsibility come to? A hundred thousand dollars. I'll post it in cash. You'll what? I'll post that amount of money and assume your liability, if there is a liability. You'll never get a fair offer than that. I don't want this matter to get into the papers. Well? Look, Mr. Parsons, we have assumed liability and we can't transfer it at this date. It's, it's out of the question. So let's start our planning from there. I met Mrs. Parsons downstairs. I understand she's not supposed to meet me or see me. Now, is that right? Yeah. Well, you better fix up that part of it. That's so? Yeah. Suppose I don't. I'll see her anyhow. Get out of here! He was looking for something to throw when I stepped out the door and walked down the hall to the stairway. At the foot of the stairs, I looked around for Robert Eckert, who wasn't around. I found my head by the door, and then I ran into Mrs. Parsons again. Mr. Dollar. Yes? What's been decided? What's he going to do about David? Well, it's pretty hard to say what he's going to do about anything. What are you going to do? I was going to drive over to your house this afternoon and ask you to go to the police and make out a missing persons report. If you refuse to do that, I was going to the police myself and ask their help. Oh. Do you think that's the thing to do? I mean, a missing person report? Yep. I think that's the thing to do. I'll be home later this afternoon. He might hear us. All right. You say two o'clock? Fine. You cool off? Oh, for a second or two. <laughs> Some museum piece he is. Be careful of him, Mr. Dollar. He'll break your heart. He's your kind. You're his dish of meat. Yeah. I didn't pay much attention to that remark from Robert Ecker. I thought about Sven Gali and Rasputin and a couple of fellas like that. I didn't think of Parsons Sr. in the same class with them. But I should have guessed it. Ecker's trying to tell me, but I just wouldn't listen. Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. David Parsons. Well. I called Mr. Ecker and he told me where you're staying. I was just on my way out to your home, Mrs. Parsons. Well, I'd rather you didn't come to the house, Mr. Dollar. Couldn't I meet you somewhere? Well, sure. But better still, why don't I come by your hotel and pick you up? That'll be all right. Fifteen minutes, is that too soon? Well, that's fine. Uh, Mrs. Parsons. Yes? Your father-in-law know you're meeting me? If he did, I think he'd kill me. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. <laughs> Item 2, $4.55, one long-distance phone call to Dave Blaine, Chief Investigator for Eastern Casualty. I explained to him that in spite of our information that David Parsons Jr. had been missing for 10 days... People in Los Angeles connected with him seemed indifferent or irritated by an investigation. I told him how old man Parsons had tried to throw me out three times when I got around to suggesting that perhaps his son might have flown the coop with some money and bonds. Blaine told me to keep trying and keep on trying to get to the bottom of it. I took him at his word. It was a little after two o'clock when I saw Mrs. Dorothy Parsons pull up in front of the Beverly Hilton lobby. She wore a ribbon to hold her hair back in a convertible. A sundress showed off a pair of well-tanned shoulders. The dark glasses, the cigarette holder, and the smile did the rest in making her a very pretty woman. I suppose I look worried. I keep you waiting long? No, 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 not at all. What's the matter? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do, too. It, it just struck me. I'm here to see about your missing husband. Now it looks like we're going on a picnic. You don't have to wear sackcloth and ashes to do your job. No, really, do you? Well, it sometimes helps on a job like this. You disapprove of me, don't you? I disapprove of everybody. I have to, Mrs. Parsons. All the time? Forever? Only until the thing's straightened out. Until you separate the chaff from the wheat, I suppose. Yeah. Where are we going? Well, I thought you might like a drive down by the ocean. I'd rather be facing you across a desk. You shan't do that, Mr. Dollar. I won't allow it. 
Now stop looking so glum. How's that? Well, I don't know. I just don't know. Would you feel any better if you faced me across a luncheon table? That's as close to a desk as I can think of. Yeah, let's try that out. I gave her what I could of a smile and let her think it over. She drove well, keeping her eyes to the road, both hands on the wheel. She was a careful kind. The rearview mirror was adjusted two or three times, looking for traffic cops. We went off Sunset Boulevard and onto the road that is set right by the ocean. The sun was shining. The air was warm. And I got to thinking, what business did I have worrying about a missing man on such a nice day? Oh. What is it? Come on. I'm tired of driving. Let's walk along that lovely strip of beach. Oh, uh, now, wait please, a minute. Please, Mr. Dollar, please. It's such a lovely day in the air. So good. Walk with me. Talk with me. Just a little while, and then we can talk about all these other things, please. I married David when I was not quite 18. He was almost 30. You see, that was 14 years ago. 14 years. Go on. He joined his father's firm, and he's been there ever since. We live well, socially, economically. I guess I belong to the keep your social position in mind club, don't I? I don't know. What do you think of me? I uh, met you today to talk about your husband, Mrs. Parsons. But I've been talking about my husband. I told you about meeting him, about being married to him. What else is there to tell? Now tell me about missing him. What can I tell you about that? Well, where he is, for one thing. I don't know. Any ideas? No, none. You're so pretty, I almost believe you. Oh, you are a human being. But I don't believe you. I don't care. Tell me how pretty I am. I don't understand you. I didn't understand your father-in-law. David Parsons is missing. No one wants to talk about it, do anything about it, make any moves. Now, what is this? You're cross with me now. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I'd assume you'd want me to talk to somebody about your husband. You'd want to talk to somebody, too, that you'd, that you'd want him back, want to know if he's well, if he's in trouble. And what happens? You spend an hour on a sunny afternoon showing me your best profile, doing everything, but getting down to the business at hand. I don't get it. I'm sorry. I guess I don't blame you. What is it you want to know? When did you see him last? Last Tuesday morning at breakfast at home. Tell me about him. There's nothing to tell, really. He ate his breakfast, read his paper, put on his coat, kissed me and left. I called his office at noon about something or other and his secretary told me he hadn't come in. I really didn't know he wasn't around till Wednesday afternoon late. How's that? Well, Tuesday night, I I went out with friends. Wednesday, I slept late. I presumed David was in bed when I came in. I didn't look in his bedroom. Wednesday afternoon, Mr. Ecker called and asked to speak to David. Mr. Ecker told me David hadn't been in his office all day Tuesday. I checked his bedroom, and his bed hadn't been slept in Tuesday night, so I called my father-in-law. Why didn't you call the police? Why should I? It only seems reasonable to me. Go on. Mr. Parsons told me not to mention the matter to anyone, that he'd take care of it. He hinted... Oh, I'm bad at this, Johnny, because well, you have no idea... Of, well, I mean, Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't hint. He's a very blunt person. I met him this morning, yeah. But I'll say he hinted that David might have gone off with someone else. I see. Has he ever disappeared before? Oh, yes, many times. When was the last time? Oh, last fall. For three days he was gone, and before that it was in the spring. He was gone for a matter of five or six days. When he came home on these occasions, uh, what did he say? What did he do? Nothing. Oh, no, I can't believe that. I mean, if he's gone a few days without leaving any kind of word, when he returned, he must have had some explanation for it. Oh, I suppose he did. He might have said something about getting even. I, I don't recall. Well, look at me. Now, this is serious... I'm looking at you. You said you've been married to him 14 years. You said he joined his father's firm shortly after. Yes. What did he do before that? He studied and traveled. Didn't work? Well, he wrote or something. I don't know. What kind of a man is he? 
He's David Parsons, Jr. He's impeccable, brilliant, and honest. As a husband. Aren't you overstepping yourself somewhat? A lot of personal questions will have to be answered about him by someone. He's a very devoted husband and father. Except for those times when he disappears. Except for those times, yes. Do you suppose he'll reappear this time? Yes, of course. Why? Don't you? He's your husband, not mine. The wind's coming up. Yes. Do you like some lunch? I feel very much like going home. All right. Mrs. Parsons. Yes, did you expect me to make love to you out here this afternoon? What kind of question is that? It's to the point. Did you? Yes. Why? It's not a nice question to ask me. I think sometimes I'm quite attractive. Well, I think you must be attractive all the time. Thank you. Why didn't you kiss me? We uh, don't have to go into that. Unless, of course, you want to tell me why you stalled me all afternoon. Do you? Touché, Mr. Dollar. One thing more. When I spoke with you earlier, you asked my advice in this matter. I advise you call the police about your husband. Did you? You know I did. I also advised your father-in-law to do the same thing. He said he'd kill me and himself before he'd call the police in. You said, or I thought you said, you'd call him in anyhow. That you were concerned about your husband and wanted him found. Did I get that wrong? I don't want any police, Mr. Dollar. I don't think they're necessary. David will come back. No police. What made you change your mind? Your father-in-law? You said you only had one more question. I lied. I've got a thousand questions. I should call home. Come on. We walked up to the highway and climbed back into the car. She drove to the nearest filling station and public telephone booth. I waited in the car while she made a phone call. Some high school kids drove up in a jalopy in sweatshirts and jeans. They waved ten pounds of wieners at me for no reason at all and asked me if I'd like to go on a wiener fry. I told them no. An old man with a bamboo fishing pole came in. He dropped a soggy gunny sack on the pavement while he disappeared around at the back. I went over and peeked in. Three pretty good-sized perch smelled out at me. I looked off at the ocean, just in time to see a pair of surfboard riders catch the creamy top of a roller, climb up on their feet, and wave to their girlfriends sitting in the sand. Nothing was wrong with the world. Nothing at all. Life was going on just fine. David Parsons, Jr. had been missing ten days, and nothing was wrong at all. I lit up a cigarette. What difference did it make if a man was missing ten days? Not a bit. Especially to his wife, who looked her prettiest when she told me practically nothing about his disappearance. The ashes fell on my lap. I'm sorry I took so terribly long, Mr. Dollar. I had to call my father-in-law's home, too. There was a message for me. Look, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go over your head, your father-in-law's head, everybody's. When I get back in town, I'm going to tell the police about this. I just decided while I was sitting waiting for you. There won't be any need for that. Huh? David's come back. What? He's home. Now, that was the message. He'll be there when we get there. You see, all of your worry was for nothing. You and I, we could have had a perfectly lovely afternoon if we'd known this, couldn't we? If you say so, Mrs. Parsons. You all right, brother? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh. Take it easy. Better give me a hand with her. Can somebody call an ambulance? Yeah, sure. You you take it easy. I'll take care of her until... What? What? What, what is it? I'm sorry, mister. She's dead. Johnny Dollar. This is Dave Blaine, Johnny. Are you here in Los Angeles? No, I'm in Boston still. What happened? I was with Mrs. Parsons this afternoon, trying to find out what happened to her husband. She missed a turn in the road. How is she? Is she all right? She was killed, Dave. Oh, good look. Johnny, what can I do to help? Nothing, Dave. Nothing much to do now. Parsons is back, and... Well, now he's back, I'll wrap it up. Johnny? What is it, pal? She was a pretty nice person, Dave. I saw her die. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25, Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Item 3, 26 cents for a package of cigarettes which the night nurse at St. John's Hospital bought for me. She also brought in a sedative. That was the last thing I remembered until about 5 o'clock in the morning. Look out! Look out! Look out! Mr. Dollar! Shh! Hey! Here. Uh, You've got a bad dream. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Well, you just lie down. You, you... You need some rest. Yeah. Can I get yeah. you anything, Mr. Dollar? Some water? No. No, sister. No, no, thank you. What's your name? I'm Sister Amadea. You... You weren't here when they brought me in. No. Now you just go back to sleep. Uh, sister, wait. Yes? I... Like to talk to you about it? Of course. You mean the accident? Yes, yes, uh, all of it. I, I'd feel better. Well, we want you to do that, certainly. I came to Los Angeles for an insurance company back east. Mm -hmm. We had a report that a big executive in a stock firm out here was missing. I see. A man named David Parsons, junior partner with his father in the stock and bond business. Oh yes, I've heard of the Parsons family. I talked to a man named Ecker, old Mr. Parsons' secretary. Mm -hmm. Ecker took me out to see the old man. He was pretty nasty. Wouldn't talk much about his son being gone for ten days. Then I met David Parsons' wife. I told her I thought the matter should go to the police. She agreed with me. But later on this afternoon out by the ocean, she said she expected him to come back. She called the house and... They said David Parsons had come back. Oh. It was a strange afternoon, sister. I mean, we sat in the sand and talked about these things. I could have fallen in love with her. Maybe I did. I'll never know. Sister Amadea. Oh, Mr. Dolly, you're more shaken up than you think. I'll, really, you should... I'll never get used to things like this. Now you just sleep, Mr. Dollar. Go on, now go to sleep. The world becomes very heavy sometimes. I'll just go to sleep. Item four, fourteen dollars and ninety-five cents, one night in the hospital. When I got back to the Beverly Hilton, I bought a copy of the morning paper, ordered some lunch, and sat down to read about my accident. An unidentified woman was killed. An unidentified man was slightly injured in a car crash on Sunset Boulevard the afternoon before. No names, no details, no nothing. Strange. But even stranger was the appearance of Robert Ecker, old man Parsons' secretary at my door. Then I didn't know why his eyes were red-rimmed. Hello, Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, all right now, I guess. Come in. This whole thing's pretty terrible, Dollar. I... I just stepped up to see how you feel. Is, is there anything I can do for you? No, no, nothing, thanks. Mr. Parsons wanted you to know that he's concerned for you. Tell him I'm okay. How are things there? Young Mr. Parsons is pretty broken up. He's really back then. Oh, yeah. Well, then, I'm just about through out here. Could I see him? Mr. Parsons thought you'd want to. Yes. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, $178, airplane ticket, back to Hartford. Item nine, $43, hotel and board for two days in Los Angeles. Item ten, $6, cab fare. My plane was scheduled to leave at nine o'clock that night. I checked out about four in the afternoon and went directly to the home of David Sr. He looked a little ashen when I came in, but his temper hadn't improved much. He pointed a crooked finger at me. I've got this to say to you right now, Dollar. If you hadn't insisted on talking to her, she'd be alive today. She wouldn't have been with you driving that car. If she hadn't been forbidden by you to see me, we wouldn't have had to drive around in a car. You have a drink around here? Right there. I didn't come here to argue with you anymore. My job was to find your son. Evidently, he wasn't lost. Hecker told me I could meet him here about this time. You're pretty free with my whiskey. You can afford it. You want one? No, I get a jigger before every meal, that's all. Cheers. Well, am I early or what? 
David will be here any time now. Have any arrangements been made yet? You'll have to ask uh, Ecker about that. I don't know. I'd like to send some flowers, something. That's always the logical gesture. This is Mr. Dollar, David. Come in. It's my son, David. The man in the black suit wasn't what I expected in the way of David Parsons, Jr., somehow. He was tall and rangy, almost athletic. He had a good sunburn, a pair of square shoulders. I would have read him for an advertising man or a pro ball player. Certainly not for the investment brokerage business. We shook hands, he smiled wanly, and lit up a cigarette. Dad tells me you've been looking for me. That's right, Mr. Parsons. Where have you been all this time? Well, I took a freighter out of Los Angeles and rode it up to Oregon. Just a whim. Wanted to be alone and do some thinking. How come no word? <laughs> That's a whim, too. Are you trying to get into my personal life? No, no. Just curious again. Well, here's some reports I have to make out. If you'd sign them, I'd appreciate it. Go ahead, sign them. Let them go. Sure, sure. I have a pen. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Satisfied, Dollar? Completely. Uh, what ship did you take up there? Ship? Uh, the boat to Oregon. Oh, the uh, Laureen B. Wintermaker Timber Company ship. Oh, sure. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Thank you for your cooperation. I went back to my hotel, checked in once more, canceled my airline reservations, and put in a call to Robert Ecker. He wasn't in his office. A little arguing got me his home number. No one answered. I went out and spent $25 item 8 to rent a car. I drove it over to Ecker's apartment address. He wasn't in, so I waited. A half an hour later, he drove up, ran into his apartment for about a minute and a half, came back out and got into his car. When he pulled into traffic on Wilshire, I was one Buick behind him. He finally stopped at a place on Olympic Boulevard, the Parkway Funeral Home. I waited five minutes and then walked in. Robert Ecker stood in a semi-dark room, hands folded before him as if in prayer. He was looking down at the body of David Parsons' wife. Hello, Ecker. Hello. Came by to pay my respects. Sure. Sure. Who is she, Ecker? What was that? Who is this girl? She isn't Dorothy Parsons, I know that much. Who is she? <laughs> we better talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, we better talk. Her name's Ellen. Her name was Ellen Myers. We're going to be married. I'm sorry. She was one of those lonely people that you find in this town. I mean, she worked a bit in pictures and drew and painted a little bit. I don't know how I met her. I just know that she was fresh and lovely and she'd do anything for me. Or for old man Parsons. For me. She was mine. Everything else is his. She was mine. He blew up the other morning when I called up and said you were in town looking for David Jr. He said we had to steer you out. He didn't want you talking to anybody. So he arranged that she'd be there posing as Mrs. Parsons? He asked me to get someone. She was delighted with the idea. It was kind of a little game for her. Where's the real Mrs. Parsons? Oh, I guess I don't know. I'll find that out. Now, tell me who's the guy I shook hands with this afternoon who said he was David Parsons Jr.? I don't know his name. Someone the old man hired to play the part for him. Then David Parsons is still missing. Yeah. Why all the cover-up? Why doesn't the old man want him found? He does want him found. He wants him found in the worst way. He's been turning the country upside down looking for him for a week now. And something like 23 operatives from a private detective firm looking for him, but he doesn't want it to go to the police. He wants it out of the papers at all costs. Why? Parsons is going to merge with Little and Tennyson. You've heard of them? Yeah. The old man's got to take it easy. Heart attack. Parsons Jr. will get into the saddle when the merger happens. He'll take over the whole play. That is, of course, with the old man sitting down in Palm Springs dictating orders to him. In other words, old man Parsons wants his figurehead to be on deck clean and unsullied for the merger. That's it. What do you think happened to Junior? I don't have any idea. What happens to any of us who work for Parsons? 
We give him lip at first, we get mad at him. In the end, he shakes out all the dignity and honesty you might ever have, and he makes you his own personal robin. Look at me, Dollar. He got me to make my girl play all that out in front of you. Now she's dead, and I'm still a robot for her. Take it easy. And sure. How did you get on to Junior? Well, he didn't look broken up. He was a pretty bad actor. He also gave some wrong answers about being off on a ship and so on. Hey, look. You don't have to say anything about talking to me. Oh, but I will. I'll tell Parsons you pumped it all out of me. We'll worry him a bit. He'll figure out some other way to stop you. I told you once before, darling. He'll break your heart. Johnny Dollar. Ready with your Crestview number, Mr. Dollar. Good. Yeah? Mr. Parsons? Who's this? Johnny Dollar. What are you doing in town? Still looking for your son, Mr. Parsons. You met him yesterday. He's been found. He wasn't lost. I met the man you hired to convince me that he was your son. I know he isn't. Listen, if you're going to make trouble... I will if I have to. I have that guy's signature on two papers in my briefcase. It constitutes a witness forgery, no matter how you look at it. I'd be willing to call up a lawyer and see what kind of noise I can make. What do you want? I'll be out to tell you in 20 minutes. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25, Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Expense account item 9, $100, legal retainer. I hired an attorney named Robert Watson to arrange for a court order impounding all the records in the Parsons brokerage house. I also turned over to him the forge reports. After that, I drove out to see Parsons, still laid up in bed. Who spilled the beans? You did, mainly. I didn't believe that guy here yesterday afternoon. I didn't believe the woman who was supposed to be his wife. So let it go at that. I'm here to find David Parsons, Jr. Let's stop playing games. Don't get fresh with me, boy. I've crunched many a loud talker just like you. You want me to walk out of here and start jamming up your works right now, or do you want to listen? You've botched up everything so far. Do I handle it, or do we keep on like this? I'm going to kill you when I get on my feet. In the meantime, you're going to lie there and like it. I came out here to find your son. You arranged to throw me off his trail by hiring a woman to play his wife and a man to appear and pretend he was your son. Let's take it from there. I understand you've had private detectives looking for him all over the country. What agency? Universal Operators. Who's in charge of it there? man named Underwood. Have they got any leads? Nothing. Nothing for 12 days. Did he take anything? I don't know. We haven't made an audit. Well, there'll be an audit. I've got the machinery started right now. Who do you think... Shut up and lie down or you'll bust a blood vessel. Is Mrs. Parsons in town? I sent her down to Palm Springs. All right, it's 10.15 now. If I remember right, there's a plane from Palm Springs about noon. Call her there and tell her I'll be at her house at 2 o'clock. I want to talk to her. Are you giving me orders? I sure am. I want everybody in that household there. 2 o'clock, you arrange it. I'll arrange nothing for you. Now get out of here. Call who you have to call. 2 o'clock, Mr. Parsons. I left him fuming on the phone and drove my rented car downtown to the offices of Universal Operatives Incorporated. Mr. Underwood, the man in charge of finding David Parsons Jr., shook my hand and told me he could report nothing to me about the case. I asked him to phone old man Parsons, which he did. That changed his mind. He broke down and gave me an hour-long story on what they'd done to locate the missing man. When he was finished, it came out the same way. They'd run into blank walls everywhere. They had no idea where David Parsons might be. I told Underwood he and his staff were fired and that Mr. Parsons would confirm it. I left him fuming on the phone. Expense account item 10, $4, two drinks and lunch all alone. After that, I drove over to the residence of David Parsons, Jr. Mrs. Parsons was a tall, graceful woman in her late 30s, settled on a sofa in front of the fireplace. The clothes she was wearing, the house itself, the appointments of the formal room, all suggested a well-run, well-kept sort of life. I've answered so many questions from those private detectives. I'm sorry to put you through it all again. You must operate in a rather high-handed manner, Mr. Dollar. 
My father-in-law expressly told me the point here is not to let any of this get into the papers. The point here is to find your husband, Mrs. Parsons. He's been missing 12 days now. Well, I suppose I was the last one to see him. It was after dinner. He went upstairs. I didn't see him after that. This would be... The 13th. Yes, it was. Did he sleep here that night? His bed had been slept in, yes. Then he really disappeared sometime on the 14th. I suppose that's accurate. He wasn't in his office that day. Did he take a car? No. But I know the private detectives checked the cab companies He to could see have flagged one two blocks away. How about clothes? Did he pack anything? Not a thing. Money? I don't know. Okay. Can you think of any enemies who might want to harm your husband? Enemies? Oh, dear, no. Think a minute. Well, perhaps in his office, in his business, there's someone. But he never discussed what went on there with me. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? It was a rule. This is our home. That is David's business. We just never talked about what went on in his office at all. How long have you and Mr. Parsons been married? Eighteen years next July. Have you been getting along? Of course we've been getting along. We've gotten along always. Ever discussed the probability of divorce or anything like that? Certainly not. Can you think of any reason why Mr. Parsons would just walk out and not come back? None whatsoever. Have the people in his office been worried about him? Well, I believe Mr. Ecker's the only one who knows. The others think he's away on a business trip. In other words, the whole thing's been kept quiet. Oh, yes, of course. This merger situation is quite delicate. As you Mrs. know, Mrs. Parsons, were you very close to him? I beg your pardon. Don't beg my pardon. Just answer the question. Everybody seems to be worried about a merger, not about a man. Did you spend time together, do things together? Of course. We entertained frequently, we traveled, we had common interests. What? Well, home, of course. What else? I don't know what you mean. Did you enjoy each other, go out together, have fun? Oh, really? <sighs> Did he have a hobby? Well, yes, sort of. David liked to read and write a little. He fancied himself a scholar along some lines. What lines? Oh, literature. Of course, it was just an indulgence. Where did he indulge himself? He had a small study upstairs. Would it be possible to look at that room? Oh, yes, I suppose so. All right, I'll get to that in a minute. Mr. Parson, drink very much? Cocktails before dinner, maybe two or three after. Ever any long drinking jobs on the town? David never went off and drank, if that's what you're trying to find out. Oh, that's what I'm trying to find out. Is he in good health? Yes, perfect, I think. What's the name of his doctor? Uh, Stanley Warner, Dr. Warner. Okay. How about his attitude? What do you mean? What kind of man is he? Quiet, loud, what? Oh, I'd say David is, and always has been, a very quiet person. Like his work? Of course, he loves it. His home? I'm terribly afraid there's a great deal of insinuation in these questions you ask, Mr. Dollar. What have you been doing in Palm Springs? <sighs> Resting. Got a boyfriend? Mr. Dollar. Have you? I resent that very much. Naturally, with my husband here, I go out with friends there. David knows about it. You have a girlfriend? You're being ridiculous. No, you're being ridiculous. What? You sit here and describe the kind of association a man has with a drug clerk who sells him cigarettes, and you call it a marriage. Your husband disappears from the face of the earth, and you romp off to Palm Springs, forgetting all about it. You're insulted when I ask you what's wrong. You're hurt when I ask you how come, and you're annoyed when I mention it. What on earth do you want me to do? File a missing person's complaint right away. Get some help in here if it isn't too late. Too late? It could be, lady. It just could be you and your father-in-law have fooled around too long. She made the call. A half an hour later, two detectives from the Missing Persons Bureau were out here gathering facts. I tagged along. They questioned Mrs. Parsons, the servants, they examined the study as well as his bedroom. From all they could gather, David Parsons had nothing but the clothes on his back when he disappeared. By mid-afternoon, the police had started on old man Parsons and gone downtown to question the members of David Parsons' office force. The district attorney moved in quickly and negated my court order, impounding the books and records for a careful audit to determine if any money or bonds were missing. They promised to keep me informed. I went out on my own. Come in, please. Dr. Stanley Warner had a four-suite office on Wilshire Boulevard. He was a big graying man who looked as though he played a lot of golf and drank a lot of whiskey when he had the chance. I told him about Parsons being missing and asked for some details. Well, according to my records, I examined him the first of last month. He was in good health. Excellent for a man of his age and responsibility. 
Could you explain that, Doctor? No, I was thinking only by comparison. David Parsons is 40 years old. He's held a position of tremendous responsibility for many years. For a lesser man or for a frailer man, the incidence of organic disturbance in this age area increases considerably. David Parsons' case, that didn't seem to hold true. Doctor, are you talking about the pressure from his father? You know the old man. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about that, yes. He, he cracked up a lot of people. How do you suppose David Jr. escaped? He knew how to escape, at least for periods of time, get a complete rest. Was there any indication or any reason whatsoever when you examined him to suspect that he might suffer from some sort of uh, mental trouble? No. I'd say that when I examined him, he was in excellent mental shape, too. I see. Did you ever meet him outside the office? Socially? Yeah. Yes. Both belonged to the same country club. Played golf with him several times, seen him at dances, other affairs. Mm-hmm. He and Mrs. Parsons strike you as a happy couple? I'll answer that by saying that happiness is uh, intangible. I envied him, though, not because of his wife, you understand, but because with all, the, with all the requirements that were made of him, he was still a gentle, decent man. You ever appear with other women? Not that I know of. Did you ever have occasion to talk with him with his hair down? Once. <laughs> startled me at first. I was aware that he was a man of education and culture, but I was quite taken aback by his ability to quote the classics. It seemed incongruous somehow. I remember this day we, we met in the club. We had a drink. I don't think anyone was there except the waiters. I was talking to him, and suddenly he dropped off the conversation. He stared ahead, and then he began to quote a Greek, Callicles. Callicles? Yes. I was so impressed by the passage, I took the trouble to look it up myself and write it down. I have it. Yes. Here. I can still see him quoting that word for word. Read it. But if there were a man who had sufficient force, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. Go on, will you, please? He would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms, and all our laws which are against nature. The slave would rise in rebellion and be lord over us, and the light of natural justice would shine forth. <sighs> when did Parsons quote this to you, Doctor? Uh, Monday, the day before he disappeared. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. David Parsons. Did you read the morning paper? Yep. It spread all over them. My son missing. I've had calls from New York all morning long. The business merger's jeopardized, and it's your doing. Anything else to say? When I finish with you and your liability company, there won't be enough left to burn for junk. Mr. Parsons, before you shoot off any more steam, do you want me to give the papers the other half of the story? The one about you arranging for people to impersonate your son and his wife? Are you threatening me? I guess I am. Why, you... Why... Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Item 11, 10 cents, one newspaper. I lied to Parsons about seeing the paper. I hadn't seen it at all. But I could guess what had happened when they got hold of the story that a prominent broker had been missing some 14 days. It was all there, spread over the front page. I waited a couple of hours before I took old man Parsons on again. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? You should have given this matter to the police in the first place. I gave it to a detective agency. And what do you mean by firing them? Oh, they were just spending your money. And you're losing it for me with all this in the paper. I'm still trying to find your son, Mr. Parsons, remember? You aren't going to find him here. Something's come up. Maybe you can explain it. The DA's office impounded the books yesterday. $5,000 was withdrawn from your son's personal account. What do I have to explain about that? Wait. It was taken out the morning he disappeared. Do you have any idea why he'd withdraw a sum of money that size? No. Do you? Sure. Somebody could have been standing in back of him with a gun threatening to blow his head off. He might have had a date to go to a wedding and needed some tip money. What can you add? <laughs> You're getting mad, Dollar. Go find your answers someplace else. You don't care if he's ever located, do you? Dollar, let me tell you something. 
My son means that to me. No more. He's never had brains enough or energy enough to do anything by himself. I do everything. Always have. The only reason I want him back is to affect the merger with Little and Tennyson. You knew that right away. I suppose so. I just wanted to hear it said to believe it. Well, now you've heard me say it. <laughs> you know, one reason why I always run the show, Dollar. My face never looks like yours over anything. I got out of there fast. I went downtown with a tall policeman named Jerry Engel to interview a bank teller. I'm Sergeant Engel. This is Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, you phoned me. It's about Mr. Parsons. You took care of him when he came in here last Tuesday a week ago, is that right? I handled the withdrawal, yes. We'd like to see the slip on that, please. Yes, I, I looked it up. I have it ready for you. Have you known Mr. Parsons very long? Well, I don't know him well, really. Look at this picture. This man is the same who signed the withdrawal slip last Tuesday morning? Yes, that's Mr. Parsons. Okay. Tell us what happened. Well, he just came up to the cage and handed me the withdrawal slip. That's all. I see. Weren't you a little surprised when he made out a withdrawal slip for $5,000? That's a lot of money. Well, maybe I was a little surprised, but Mr. Parsons has withdrawn large sums from his personal account several times. I always assumed it was some sort of speculation where he needed cash on hand. When he came up to the cage to you, what exactly did he say? Oh, just good morning or, or something like that, and then will you please take care of this? Didn't he stipulate how he wanted the money? Oh, yes, yes, he did say that. I'm sorry. He took it mostly in hundreds and fifties. Any of these bills happen to be recorded? No, Sergeant. Uh -huh. Anything else you can remember about the transaction that might help? Mm, sorry, nothing. Well, well, maybe. Yeah? Well, you both know the kind of business Mr. Parsons is in. I mean, well, it seems like a hurried sort of business. Always phone calls, rushing, and so on. He was always... Always like that, it seemed to me. He'd come in here, do what he had to do, and rush out. Very brisk, you know. But that morning, he didn't seem in a hurry at all when he left. I mean, I had the distinct feeling that Mr. Parsons didn't particularly care in what direction he went. A recheck with Mrs. Parsons and the house servants established that Parsons had not left the house with the described money bag. The police went to work on that angle, trying to find out where he had purchased it. A supplementary bulletin went out with the news about the bag. The district attorney's men were trying to find out if he was involved with another woman, and if so, who. Parsons was reported to be in Toledo, Detroit, the Virgin Islands, and Boston. All the reports were untrue. Yeah, officer, that's him. That's the guy who was in here that night. You sure? Well, I'm positive that's his picture. Was he with anybody? No, he was all alone. He sat over there on that stool. How long was he here? Oh, he was here when we closed the joint. Did you happen to see where he went from here? No. Now, what kind of shape was he in? Drunk? No, no, he was real sober and quiet. Drank all night, but he seemed to hold his stuff okay. Did you talk to him at all? No, just took his order for drinks. He didn't seem to want to talk to anybody. I see. Did you happen to notice if anybody who was in here went over and talked to him? I think a couple of people tried. You know, you get that sort of thing in a joint like this, but he didn't say much to any of them, so they just left him alone. He just sat alone and drank? No, he was making a phone call all the time. He was here, a long-distance call from the booth over there. He sat at the end of the bar so he could hear the phone ring. How do you know he was making a long-distance call? Well, he handed me a 20 once and asked me to change it to quarters for him. All the quarters I had. About what time was this? Oh, I don't know exactly, but it, it took him two or three hours anyway. Do you know if he ever completed his call? He poured a lot of dough into the phone. I guess he did, finally. Did he have anything with him while he was here? What do you mean? Was he carrying a little black bag, maybe? Yeah, nothing but his overcoat. I... Yeah. What? He did say something to me at that. Uh, he asked me if I knew Callicles. Callicles? Yes, yeah, Sergeant. Uh, he was about three bourbons along by then. Mean anything? I've heard about that before, Jerry. Callicles was a Greek. Parsons quoted him to his doctor once. Something about a man breaking through and shaking off his chains. A pretty piece of poetry. Poet? I thought he was a bookie. Oh, excuse me. Well, Jerry, one thing for sure. Yeah, what? We know he was alive that night. Jerry Engel started a check with a telephone company. Their records disclosed that David Parsons had placed a call from the pay booth in the bar on the night in question. It had been a person-to-person -person call to a Kenneth Temple in San Francisco. We tried to place a call to the same number, but there was no answer. We waited another two hours trying to complete the call, and the operators were still trying when we drove out to the Parsons residence once more. Mrs. Parsons gave us a cool greeting. I certainly don't appreciate any of this. You're responsible, Mr. Dollar, for all this publicity. We don't have to go into that, Mrs. Parsons. We need your help now. 
We found out that your husband called a man named Kenneth Temple in San Francisco the night he disappeared. Oh? That name, Kenneth Temple, does it mean anything to you? No, I've never heard it before. Mr. Parsons never mentioned it to you? Well, I can't say for certain, but it's not familiar to me at the moment. Have you ever been to San Francisco? Yes. When? Twice. Going to and coming back from Hawaii two years ago. Has Mr. Parsons ever been in San Francisco? He was on the same trip. This name, Temple, maybe it was someone you met while you were there. No, I don't recall meeting anyone there at all. Sergeant. Yes? All this has been quite upsetting, quite nerve-wracking, really. I don't know what progress you people are making, but I do wish it would all be handled soon. Excuse me, please. Sure. This isn't getting us very far. I don't get it. Hello? Who? Oh, 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 yes, operator, just a moment. It's for you, Sergeant. Oh, thanks. Probably San Francisco operator. Thank you. This is Sergeant Engel. Yes? Oh, hello, Mr. Temple. This is Sergeant Engel, Missing Persons Division, Los Angeles Police. Now, we're trying to locate a man named David Parsons. Huh? All right. He's there now. Huh? He's going to put him on. David? Well, let me talk to him. Uh, just a minute. Is that an extension? Oh, well, yes. Please. I'll get it. Let me talk. Hold it a minute. Mr. Parsons? I've been pretty worried about you. Yes. Yeah, she's all right. She's right here. Okay, Mrs. Parsons. Here, take it. David? How are you? Oh, it's so good to hear your voice, David. When are you coming home? Your father and I have been... I read about it in the papers. Now, I want you to listen to me, Dorothy. Dad's going to ask you, so listen. But... Uh, listen to me. I'm listening, David. Do you remember all the times that I've asked you to talk to me? The times during these years when I wanted companionship, warmth, a, a home that was lived in. Each time I asked for these things, you were always too busy, too taken up with things outside my life. Do you remember all that? Oh, yes, yes, David, I remember all that. Well, this is the end of you and me. But your father... It's he... the end of father and me, too, Dorothy. You tell him that. He probably won't believe it, but you tell him the merger is all his. You'll have to get another figurehead. Why, you'd be so angry. Dorothy, what I'm trying to say is his anger doesn't worry me anymore. Oh, what about me? <laughs> I never worried you. But, David... I'm going away. A long sea voyage with Temple. You don't remember him, but he was a sailor I used to talk to aboard ship when we went to Hawaii. He has a boat now. I'm shipping on it. Well, when will you be back? I won't be back. David! Now, will you put that police officer on? Hello, Mr. Parsons. Uh, who is that? My name is Johnny Dollar. I've been trying to find you for two weeks. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. I found out quite a lot about you. I want to make sure I'm talking to the right man. I won't answer a lot of questions. Just one. That's not even a question. Calicles. Oh. Mean anything? I don't know who you are. I didn't even get your name, but you did find out. <laughs> if there were a man who had sufficient force, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. He would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms and all our laws which are against nature. The slave would rise in rebellion and be Lord Horus. So far as the police were concerned, there was nothing more to do. So far as the insurance company is concerned, we'll have to sit on a $100,000 bond and hope that David Parsons will return to his life in Los Angeles when he gets whatever it is out of his system. Expense account total, $1,100.59. Remarks? Just Mrs. Parsons, to me. She asked why he never talked about this to her. I told her he did. No one ever listened. She didn't understand that either. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, one of the most heartless, most vicious rackets an insurance investigator ever had to face... Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Lillian Biaf, Will Wright, Gene Bates, Carlton Young, Lawrence Dobkin, Bert Holland, Marvin Miller, and Herb Vigran. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Dean, Johnny. Mono guarantee. Oh, hiya, Ralph. How are things? Rough. My wife could kill me, Johnny. For the insurance? No, just for kicks, because she's mad, because she wanted a mink coat. In short, she's a woman. I couldn't buy her a mink. I don't make that kind of money. You know how it is in the insurance game. Oh, sure, I know, Ralph. You're down to your last yetch. So what happens yesterday? I lose 80 mink coats, silver blue, worth $100,000. Gone, snatched, disappeared. Warehouse robbery? Check. Bandley Furriers out in Los Angeles. My wife's about to blow her stack. She says if I can't afford one fur coat for her, then how come I can pay for 80 of them that I haven't even got? How do you reason with a woman, Johnny? I never try. Usually I just send flowers. I've already done that. She ran them through the garbage disposer. So now what do I do? Buy some more flowers. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, 4312 Spring Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Silver Blue matter. <laughs> Item 1, $152.40, telephone and incidentals and transportation to Los Angeles. I called the Mono Guarantee agent out there before I left and got a brief rundown on the case. Among other things, I learned that a man I'd known and worked with before, Detective Lieutenant Perimon Garcia, had been put in charge. And with Garcia on hand, I knew I could count on cooperation by the police. But I still wasn't expecting quite as much as I got. Flight 12 for Las Vegas, Salt Lake, Minneapolis, and Chicago, now loading at... I knocked G over the fur joint myself, Flight Johnny. Garcia! Oh, only way we get to see you. How have you been? Overworked, oh, underpaid, frustrated, report. disillusioned, unappreciated. In other words, fine. <laughs> Got your luggage yet? Uh, it's coming right there. Good. We ought to get moving. I've got a squad car outside. What's all the rush? We've got a guy downtown in the hospital I figured you'd want to talk to. Well, he'll wait, won't he? He'd probably like to, if he had any choice. He's dying? Kind of looks that way. He's one of the two night watchmen the gang slugged when they broke into the warehouse. And he's our big one, Johnny. He's all we've got. Has he been able to talk? A couple of sentences during the night. He's got to talk. What do you mean? He's the only one who got a look at them. When he did talk, what did he say? Gibberish, mostly. He did say one thing, though. They were kids. Just a gang of kids. Oh, that's going to make it rougher. Yeah, in a lot of ways. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Johnny. Come on, let's go. We took the freeway into town with the accelerator floorboarded and the siren screaming. Racing against time and against dying. Weaving in and out through the four-wheel madness that Los Angeles calls traffic. And then the other side of the coin. The solemn quiet of hospital corridors. The calm voices of the nurses. And the blank hardness of sterile white walls. We sat there beside a bed and waited for a man to talk or to die. But the slow minutes passed and he still did neither. So we waited. I guess that shot the doctor gave him is not going to have any effect. Apparently not. It's a crazy world, Johnny. No, just the people in it. I mean, yesterday, we'd never even heard of this guy. I still don't know his name. And 24 hours later, here we are, a couple of strangers sitting around watching him die. Yeah, it's here on his chart at the head of the bed. Albert Christmas. Strangers. Not even family or friends. He didn't have any family or friends. He lived alone in a furnished room. Worked alone, too, except for one partner. So, a gang of punks jump him and bust his head open. Duh, I'm a bad cop, Johnny. I get sentimental about things like this. How'd they work it, Garcia? 
It's a warehouse district. The streets are practically deserted at night. A police prowl car checks the street once about every 40 minutes, and they hit at 1.10 a.m., three minutes after the police had passed. Sounds professional. No, just a smart bunch of kids. The only fur they seemed to know was mink. They passed up a dozen or so chinchillas worth twice as much. How'd they get in? I don't know. Chrisman hasn't been able to tell us. They must have tricked him into opening the door. What about Chrisman's partner? He was making his rounds. They slipped up behind him and slugged him. He didn't see them. He didn't know what hit him. And nobody outside in the street saw anything? Saw them leave with the furs or anything? Nope. Or if they did, they're not saying anything. Oh, that's a rough one, Johnny. We haven't got a thing to go on. Except Chrisman here. The shape he's in, that's only a straw. If he recognized any of them, if he lives long enough to identify them. Yeah, at least the poor devil can groan. I don't know. I think he's closer to being conscious right now than he's been in the last hour. Maybe you're right. Chrisman? Order. He wants a drink. Yeah. Here you go. That enough? You want some more? Who are you? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator from Hartford. I'm Lieutenant Garcia, L.A. Police. The warehouse. The kids. It's all right now. You're in the hospital now. It's going to be all right. My head. Do you feel like answering a few questions, Mr. Chrisman? <laughs> it won't take long. Those kids, how did they get in? Telegram. Telegram? He showed me the telegram through the window. Yes. When I opened the door, one of them hit me. I... Did you get a look at the boy who showed you the telegram? Yes. Yeah. I, I saw him. Yeah? 18, 19. What did he look like? Five, nine... Ten, dark skin, black hair. Uh -huh. how, how was he dressed? Dark jacket. Hard to think. Any scars? Anything unusual about him? No. <clears throat> My head. Are you sure? Sure. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Any of the others? No. The only one. I... There was a mark. On his arm. What kind of a mark? My head. Oh, my head. What kind of a mark on his arm? It hurts too bad. I, I, I. Well, that's that. Yeah, he's passed out again. Well, we got a description. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Right in that area, there are about 50,000 kids who fit it. I talked with Mr. Banley, owner of the Furs. Then Garcia and I went down to the warehouse. It stood on the fringe of the river bottom section, fronting the railroad yards and backed up by block after block of weather-beaten slum shacks. We looked through the warehouse, at the racks where the Furs had hung, watchman's office where the gang had entered, but knew while we did it that we were only going through the motions. The police technicians had already been over the place inch by inch, and they'd found exactly nothing. Finally, we stepped out the door into the street, a drab gray street cluttered with things cast off and discarded, dusty and hollow. There's the story of this whole district down here, Johnny, right there in that store. Yeah. It's a backwash, a service yard. It's something you need but don't like to look at, so you shove it out of sight. People you need, but don't want around. It's the same with them. You grew up down here, didn't you, Garcia? Yeah, I grew up down here. That's why they gave me this case. I know this section inside out. And that's why I told you this one was going to be tough. I think I get the general idea. Those kids came from that slum there to the east. One gets you nine on that. The people who live there aren't on our side, Johnny. If they do know anything, they won't talk, is that it? They wouldn't tell a cop the time of day. I don't mean they're criminals. Most of them aren't. It's just that they always put themselves on the other side. What about juvenile gangs? Do they operate around here? There are dozens of them. And there's another thing. A few of these gangs are pretty rough, and people who might talk don't because they're scared to. Oh, it's a great setup, Johnny. A fine place to look for a hundred grand in furs. You know, 
I've been thinking about the fact that they knew exactly the time to hit. They must have staked out here somewhere. Sure, and probably right in the place you're thinking. Hey, that lunchroom across the street? Well, they had to be inside or the prowl car would have seen them. That's the only place open at night. Did you shake it down? Like I told you, Johnny, they won't give us the time of day. Uh-huh. What about me having a go at it? Yeah, maybe they wouldn't smell cop on you quite so strong. The owner's name is Red Wellers. He was on that night. See what you can get out of him if you want. I think I will. By the way, Johnny, I know you insurance guys make deals sometimes, no questions asked, just to get the loot back. Sometimes, yeah. Well, before you make any deal on this one, you better remember one thing. Chrisman may die. You say, Mac? Save your money. What do you want? Coffee? Yeah, I guess so. How's business? Buck or two a day. Father in the hole. Want cream? No, I'll drink it black. Want to sink it with it? No, thanks. Are you Red Willis? So that's it. What do you mean? You're in a fur case, ain't you? Maybe. I thought you was the same one, but I couldn't be sure seeing you across the street. You come up with that cop Garcia a while ago, didn't you? That's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, you come to the wrong address, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. Who was in the lunchroom here just before the robbery? I don't remember. Any young kids here? No. It was all old men with long beards. I see. Ten cents for the coffee. Yeah, they got you real scared, haven't they? Haven't they? I don't know any of these. All right, look. You know Chrisman, the watchman over at the warehouse. He comes in. He didn't know any of these either. What about it? Nothing. Except he's dying. I'm at the Rilkins Hotel if you change your mind. Room 312, Johnny Dollar. Sorry. I don't see no use of me dying, too. Follow me, Mac. Johnny Dollar. This is Red. Red Wallace, remember? Sure, sure. You run that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse that was robbed last night. Yeah, that's right. Now, look, Dollar, suppose I tell you what I know about it, what's going to happen to me. Nothing, as long as you weren't mixed up in it yourself. No, no, no. I mean the papers and the cops. If it gets out I talk to you, I won't last 24 hours. I think I can take care of that. What do you know about it, Red? That depends on what it's worth to you. I see. I'll have to sell out, get away from this section, so I'll need some dough. You follow me? All right. I'll see you taken care of. Now, just what is it no, you... No, no, got... no. I ain't safe. I'm talking from a booth. You stay right there at your hotel. I'll see you in a half hour. Right. Just you. No cops. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Beck. Mr. Beck? Yeah, six quarts of milk and two pounds of butter. Sure, right away. Uh, thanks, Mr. Beck. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 4, 20 cents, a phone call to my friend Lieutenant Garcia of the L.A. Police and a call to Queen of the Angels Hospital. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who was slugged by the gang of teenage hoodlums during the warehouse robbery, was still unconscious. And Chrisman, unless Red Weller was ready to talk now, was the only lead I had toward finding $100,000 worth of silver blue mink coats. I waited two hours and a half for Red Weller, but he didn't show. <laughs> Item five, $2.85, taxi to the warehouse district at the south end of the railroad yards. It was night by now, and the area was almost deserted. A lost, lonely district, shabby and worn, even in the softening darkness, and haunted now by fear. The only lights in the block were those shining from the windows of the warehouse office and from Weller's lunchroom across the street. Good evening. Hello. What would you like, sir? A cup of coffee, I guess. Oh, you're lucky. I just made some fresh. Good. 
Would you like some cream? No, thanks. No, that'll be fine. Is it foggy out? <sighs> yeah, a little. Not bad, though. Hey, this coffee's all right. You're a good cook. Thanks. The boss always has me make it when I'm here. He says I do it better than he does. I'll bet you do. Is the boss around, by the way? No. He, he called me and said he had to go out. That's why I'm working. I'm on in the daytime, mostly. Do you have any idea where he might be? No. No, he had to go somewhere, I guess. What'd you want to see him about? He wanted to see me. Oh. Do you know where he lives? Well, he's got an apartment over on Marina. It's about eight blocks from here. Think he'd be there? No, he, he wasn't going home. He, he, he was going out somewhere. He, he acted kind of strange. I, I don't know what he was going to do. May I, may I ask just what business you're in? Insurance. Oh. I'm a special investigator. What do you mean? I'm working for the company that insured those furs. Oh. The furs that were stolen the night before last from the warehouse across the street. <laughs> Something wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh? Can I help you gather up that silver? Oh, no, no, that's all right. I, gee, I, I don't know what happened. Just careless, I guess. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you live around here somewhere? Well, yes, yes, I'm Dalton. Uh, three blocks up. What's your name? Carla. Carla Monty. Why are you asking? How long have you worked here, Carla? About a year. Do many teenagers hang out here? What do you mean? Kids, 17, 18, 19. Do many of them come in here for coffee, hamburgers? Well, sometimes, yeah. I've never noticed much. Know any of them? No, no, no. I don't know any of their names. Are you sure? I don't ask them their names. Did I ask you your it's name? It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Well, I still didn't ask you. If you want to tell me your... What are you scared of, Carla? Nothing. I'm not scared. You're not? Of course not. Why would I be scared? For the same reason your boss is, Red Weller. He was scared when he talked to me this afternoon or when he phoned me later. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. That's why he didn't come to my hotel. He was afraid to. And why did you drop that silverware when I told you who I am? Because you're scared half to death. No. What's the matter with you people down here? What are you doing, crawling into a hole because a half-grown gang of hoodlums starts throwing their weight around? You don't understand. Then suppose you tell me about it. Do you think that's any kind of an answer in the long run? To pull the covers up over your eyes and let them do as they please and just keep hoping they'll leave you alone. All you're doing is making things worse. No, you don't know how it is. You don't have to live here. No, no, I don't have to live here, but I know how it is. Because I've seen it in other places where the mobs manage to take over. And if you let it happen here, then you'll really have something to be scared of. Maybe... Maybe they've already taken over. Who? Oh, a bunch of kids with a gripe on, running in packs so they feel safe? Is that the kind of mob you mean, Carla? No. They're not a mob yet, but they will be if they're not stopped. It seems to me you'd have some sense of responsibility to them, if nobody else. Maybe if other people had a sense of responsibility, kids wouldn't have to grow up in a place like this. Have you ever thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, I've thought of it. But it doesn't hold water. Well, you'd think so if you lived here. All right, so it's a slum district. And sure, these kids start out with a strike on them. But that's a pretty weak excuse for joining up at criminal bands and terrorizing a whole neighborhood. For slugging people and looting warehouses. Yes, I know. Most of them find other answers. It's only a small minority that turns to crime. But if you let them get away with it, others will join them and they'll grow until finally it's too late. Well, Carla, still nothing to tell me? I can't. I just can't. I see. Well, there's a quarter for the coffee. Keep the change. Good night, Carla. Wait. Yeah? Mr. Dollar. Suppose... Suppose I, I knew someone who, who might be able to help you. I mean, I mean, who might know something about the robbery. Innocently, of course. Uh, if you talk to this person and, uh, and they agreed to help you, could you... Well... Could you keep them out of it? Depends on the circumstances. I do all I could, that much I promise. I don't know. I'm not sure. You're not sure of what? Of you. Why, oh, I, I know better when I stop and think, but I've lived in this neighborhood too long. Lived with these people and... I'm bound by the law like any other citizen. And I won't break it to help somebody cover up a criminal act. 
But I figure it's up to me sometimes to decide whether a thing is a criminal act. And if a person seems to deserve it, well, I can be pretty lenient. You promise? What you just said? Yes, I promise. I've got to trust you. I've got to trust someone. Do you know such a person, Carla? Yes. Do you know where to find them? I think so. Well, I'm sure they'll be at one of two or three places. Not very far from here. And who is this person? Someone who grew up around here. A boy. Nineteen. What boy? My brother. Expense account item seven, two dollars and seventy cents, taxi. We went first to Carla's apartment where she lived with her brother, but there was no one there. Then we checked out a drive-in a few blocks away, a teenage hangout. No luck. Finally, we tried a pool hall down south of the yards, just off Alameda Street. It was our last hope. I know he comes here. It's not a good place for him, but a lot of the other kids do, too. And he wants to belong. Yeah, sure. Everybody does, in one way or another. Gosh, it'd have been different if our folks had lived, but uh, our boy just won't take orders from his sister. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. Thanks. Well, if he's not here, then I just don't know where he... Oh, wait. There he is. Down near the corner. The one with the dark curly hair. All right. Come on. Take it easy. Just tell him I'm a friend of yours and you want to talk to him. We'll get him off to one side. Whatever you say. Eddie! Yeah? Well, for the... What are you doing here, Carla? Eddie, Eddie, this is Mr. Dollar, a friend of mine. We were... I wonder if we could talk to you for a moment. What about? Well, you You just... know better than to come in a joint like this. But I want to talk to you, Eddie. Well, you can talk to me at home. Then. Go on, get her out of here, will you, mister? It might be a good idea if you listen to her first. I thought it was her that wanted to talk to me. Go on, get her out of here. All right. If you'll go with us. What for? I like it here. It's a nice place. Yeah? At least it's better than San Quentin. What are you talking about? A warehouse robbery. A hundred thousand dollars worth of furs. I understand you may know something about it. Innocently, of course. I thought you said this guy was a friend of yours. Well, that's right, Eddie. He's just... Who is he? He's an insurance investigator. Oh, so that's the pitch. He's promised to help, Eddie. If, if you'll tell him whatever you know, he'll protect Knock you. Knock it off, get... Carla. Now, look, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. I never even heard of no fur robbery. So take her with you and get out of here. This may be your last chance to get off before the boat sinks, Eddie. You're not leaving, huh? All right, then I'll leave. Eddie! Let him go. We can't force him to talk. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I don't understand him. I do. Item 8, 10 cents, phone call from the pool hall to Lieutenant Garcia at police headquarters. He said there was no change in Albert Chrisman's condition yet. He was still holding on and he still hadn't talked. But there had been another new development, a big one. And when I joined Carla in the taxi outside, she knew it by the look on my face. What's wrong, Mr. Dollar? Now look, how sure are you that your brother wasn't mixed up in that robbery? Well, I... I want the truth. I... I'm afraid he was mixed up in it. Then brace yourself, Carla. Your boss, Red Weller, who was going to tell me what he knew about it, was found murdered in an alley an hour ago. Johnny Dollar. Wake you up, Johnny? Oh, Garcia, no, just finished breakfast. Oh, you special investigators do live. Suppose that insurance company of yours could put me on expense account? Maybe, if you found that hundred grand worth of stolen furs. Just a matter of time, Johnny. Now you're talking like a police lieutenant. How soon can you come down here to headquarters? Well, what's up? Has the watchman talked? Crispin? No, oh, he's still in a coma. But I want to know some more about that kid you mentioned on the phone last night. Eddie Money? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. That was told to me in confidence. Look, Johnny, and... I'm going to talk to you like a policeman for a minute. A man named Weller was knifed to death last night. You told me yourself his death is probably tied in with that warehouse robbery. Another man is dying at Queen of the Angels. So, confidence or no confidence, I want to know about that kid. 
All right, Garcia. I'll be there in 20 minutes. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. Item 10, $1.45, taxi from my hotel to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. The early morning fog was starting to lift and the city sprawled beneath a slate gray sky. The filtered sun should have softened things, but didn't. Gray sun, gray world, drab and dreary, and a case to match. Teenagers, not a gang of hardened criminals. A bunch of wild kids who'd broken into a warehouse and stolen 80 fur coats, silver blue mink. A night watchman had been slugged and lay dying in the hospital. And a lunchroom owner named Red Weller had been stabbed to death the night before. So it couldn't be called kid stuff. That term doesn't apply to murder. Run those four cards through, Joe. See what you can make of them. Now come on into the office, Johnny. This madhouse out here gets you frazzled before you know it. Oh, you police detectives have it pretty soft, Garcia. That's news to me. Teletypes, photo files, record cards, crime labs. How'd you like to try working alone? On your expense account, I could suffer the hardship. Now, let's go in here. Have a seat, Johnny. Thanks. Yeah, did I put the fear of the Lord in you on the phone? Uh, you were real impressive. Well, the chief was breathing down my neck. Well, then I'll stop traveling. Getting aside, Johnny. I've got to know just how that Monte boy figures in this. Did I say he even figured in it at all? No. You just wanted some information on him. But he figures all right. You didn't come out here from Hartford to look up the nephew of an old friend. Oh, I've done crazier things at times. He's got a record. Did you know that? No. Petty stuff. No convictions. Huh. Gang brawls, auto pilfering, vandalism, intoxication. Interrogative attitude, sullen, hostile, antisocial. Yeah, that's quite a nephew you've got, Johnny. I like she with the family. What's the story? How did you get onto this case? Look, amigo, I made a promise on this. I hate to break it. It's murder, Johnny. <sighs> this kid's sister worked for Red Weller in that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse. Her name is Carla Monty. She's five years older than he is. They live together. Their parents are dead. So? So I put some pressure on her, and she told me she thought her brother Eddie might know something about the robbery. She took me to a pool room to meet him. How was he supposed to have known about it? Hearsay? No, no. She admitted later that she suspected him of being mixed up in it himself. Things he'd said, the way he acted. She asked me to help her try to keep him out of trouble. I think he's already in trouble, Johnny. Yeah, so do I. And I think she does, too. What did he have to say when you talked to him in the pool hall? Several things, but they added up to two words. Get out. When I wouldn't, he did. Hmm. Why do you think Red Weller was killed, Johnny? Well, I think those kids used his lunchroom as a lookout post to spot the prowl car that was patrolling that area. As soon as it passed, they pulled the job. The figure's all right. I think Red realized it when he thought back and knew who the kids were. I think that's what he was going to tell me. So they found out what he was up to and knocked him off to shut his mouth. Yeah, it adds up, Garcia. Oh. Now, tell me about her. Carla? Hmm. What's to tell? She's just a girl, like millions of others. Decent, hardworking, and real sweet. But there's something about her, something special. I, I don't know what, I don't know the words to use, but... Well, it's there, you feel it. And she's kept it somehow, in spite of everything. I guess I know what you mean. Do you? I told you once, Johnny, I grew up in that district. I know how rough it is. Well, maybe it's even worse for a girl. It is. I know. I had a sister. Oh, I didn't know that. She was a lot like this girl Carla once. Then the district got to her, and she got to be more like Carla's brother. Uh, what happened to her? One to five. Possession of narcotics. A couple of other pretty rough charges. She... She died in Tehachapi Prison seven years ago. I'm, I'm sorry, Garcia. Yeah. I don't want to see this girl, Carla, hurt any more than you do, Johnny. Maybe the hurt will break her, make her lose that something special. But I've still got to pick up her brother and bring him in for questioning. 
Expense account item 11, $1.90. Taxi to the Weller lunchroom to see Carla Monte. Lieutenant Garcia had a police detail checking known fences and borderline dealers specializing in furs. But so far, none of those contacted had been approached by any member of the warehouse gang. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who had been slugged during the robbery, was still in a coma, unable to talk. So Carla remained my best, in fact, my only lead to the case. The lunchroom was closed. I paid off the taxi, walked three blocks to Carla's apartment house, climbed the stairs, and knocked on her door. Yes? Who is it? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, all right. Just a moment. Come in, Johnny. What were you expecting? A major invasion? I don't know. I don't know what I'm expecting. Easy, Carla. Easy. It's not the end of the world. Eddie didn't come home last night. Oh. I tried, Johnny. I tried to be a mother and father both to him. What did I do wrong? Well, that's the kind of question that doesn't always have an answer. Have you got a drink in the house? Have have I what? Got anything to drink? Well, there's some brandy, I think. All right, get it. Well, I don't know if it's a good brand or it not. It doesn't matter. Bring two glasses. Pour out a couple of stiff ones. No, I, I don't... Go really ahead know. and pour them, two of them. Well, all right. Is this a snapshot of Eddie when he was younger? Yeah. He was in junior high school then. It was taken at summer camp when he won a medal for swimming. And that was the only year I could afford to send him. Here you are, John. Thanks. All right, here's a go. Oh, I don't think Now I drink would. it. All of it. All right. <coughs> Good. You needed that. Where do you think he is, Johnny? What's happened to him? Carla, you're going to have to face it sooner or later, and I kind of think now is the time. What do you mean? You've been worried sick for fear your brother would get into some kind of trouble. And you had reason to worry. It's finally happened. No. He's in trouble, all right. Plenty of trouble. You're not the only one looking for him. Who else is who do you mean, Johnny? The police. There's an APB oh. out. They want him for questioning in connection with a robbery and with the murder of Red Weller. Oh, no. Eddie wouldn't kill anyone. Maybe not, but somebody did. Some member of the gang that robbed the warehouse. And it looks very much as if Eddie is a member. Yes. I suppose he is. Now, look, Carla. Is there anything you haven't told me about the robbery, I mean? No, no. I, I was just suspicious, that's all. Because if there is, let's have it. It's too late to protect him now. The sooner he's taken into custody, the less likelihood of his getting any even deeper. He was out that night. He didn't come home until almost morning. I was worried about it, but I knew it wouldn't do any good to ask him. Do you know who was with him that night? No. Who would be the most likely ones to go along on a deal like that? Any of them. Any of those he's been running around with lately. Any idea where they hang out mostly? Well, just those two places I took you to last night. That drive-in and the pool hall. Look, if they did pull that robbery, where do you suppose they take the furs? Well, I don't know. Does Eddie have a car? No, but some of the other boys do. Uh-huh. Carla, would you mind if I look through Eddie's room? No, I don't mind. It doesn't matter. I guess nothing much matters now. It's gone so far that... Wait. It's Eddie. He has his own key. All right. Take it easy now. Be careful, Johnny. Since you're gonna have... What the devil are you doing here? Working for you, Eddie. Yeah? What for? I think you know. Eddie... Eddie, you've got to give yourself up. Before. Shut up. Because I got you to thank for this jam. This insurance dick comes around, romances you up a little, and you sell me right down the river. That's not true. How'd you know you were in a jam, Eddie? I got friends in this neighborhood. They keep me posted. Did the same friends tell you Red Weller was about to make a deal to talk? You're whistling in the dark, Dollar. Maybe. I imagine Garcia will find out, though, when he gets you down to headquarters. Get your hand off that phone. Oh, so you've got a gun. Eddie... Eddie, don't. Please. Keep out of this. Move back against that wall, Dollar. Put your hands flat against that wall. You're keeping there. Give me some clothes, Carla. Come on, make it fast. What are you going to do, Eddie? I said give me some clothes. All right, Eddie. You're wrong, though. You're making a big mistake, Eddie. It's no use running. You'll only... A... Eddie. What's the matter? Down there in the street. A police car just pulled up. You're lying. There we are, Dollar. I'll kill you, Carla. You're the one that brought him here. I'm trying to let him trap me. I think I'll pull a bullet on you before I leave. You fire one shot and you won't have a chance. They'll be in here before you can get out of the hallway. You better make up your mind, Eddie. Well, you've still got time. Stay where you are, Dollar. I'm trying to come after me. Eddie, please. Give yourself up, Eddie. 
Stop him, Johnny. I'm afraid it's a little late. Why did you let him go? There was no choice, Carla. He'd have killed you if I'd moved. Well, you'd better give me that list of his friends. The police will want it. Heaven help him. Yeah. That's about all that can help him now. Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Garcia, Johnny. Are the boys in the police car still there? There are three police cars here now. They've searched the apartment house from top to bottom. Any luck? No, Eddie got away. I didn't dare make a move to stop him. He was going to shoot his sister. Well, we'll get him, Johnny. Don't worry about it. I don't intend to. My job now is to locate $100,000 worth of stolen furs, not to go after Eddie Money. It's the same job, isn't it? Probably. Did you see that list of his friends Carla gave me? I just put out an APB to bring them in. Good. They weren't all in on that warehouse robbery, but some of them were. If they were, we'll take them. We've got an interrogation room down here to sort the sheep from the goats. Yeah, I know. But first, you've got to catch your goats. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California. To the home office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continued. Item 12, two cents, for the way I felt. I hung up the phone and walked to the window, stood there looking out into the street. The police were leaving the apartment to carry their search for fugitive Eddie Monty into wider territory. And Eddie's sister, Carla, sat huddled in a corner, forlorn, beaten, brokenhearted. From the window, too, the view was anything but cheerful. Dirty, cluttered streets lined by row on row of sagging tenements, drab and gray in the weakening light of late afternoon. This was the slums that had spawned Eddie Monty, raised and nurtured him, made him into a member of a gang, and had now sent him fleeing from the police with a gun in his hand. And the same slum had bred the others of the gang, who'd robbed a warehouse of 80 silver blue mink coats, slugged night watchman Albert Grisman into a near-death coma, and had murdered a man who'd tried to give them away. Why, John? What got into him? Why is he ending up this way? I wish I could tell you, Carla. I did something wrong. That's it, of course, but but why? Forget it. You did all you could. It wasn't enough. Well, sometimes nothing is enough. And nobody knows exactly why. I loved him. I I never thought of him as, as just a nuisance of a kid brother, the way a lot of girls do. Now, look. You did more than anybody could expect. You were a pretty young kid when your folks died. Too young to have to take on the responsibility of raising a teenage brother. But I tried. I tried hard, and I thought I was doing all right until lately, but now... So it didn't work, and what's happened is breaking your heart. Well, that can't be changed. But just remember this one thing, you did the best you could, and that's all anybody can do, so don't blame yourself. Tell me something, Johnny. Yeah? You're wearing a gun. I don't think Eddie knew it when he ran from here. Maybe you couldn't have used it to disarm him. Not when he was on the verge of killing you. But you could have drawn it and killed him. He was careless. He gave you several chances. Why didn't you? I don't know. Thank you, Johnny. I'd like to look through Eddie's room, if you don't mind. All right. I'll go with you. This way. It's down the hall. Thanks. Somehow I still can't believe it. Not the killing, at least. Eddie is just not that kind. Well, a kid gets under pressure sometimes and gets pushed overboard. Maybe we'll know more when they pick him up. What if he... What if he tries to resist arrest? You know the answer to that. Oh, I hope he doesn't. Well, here it is. This has been Eddie's room since he was 13. It ought to tell something. The main thing at the moment is to find something that tells where he might go to hide out. And I've also got $100,000 worth of furs to locate. But you, you go ahead and look around. Whatever you want. Okay, thanks. I'll be in the living room. You, you call me if you want me. For the sake of company, I switched on a beat-up record player in the corner. And I looked at six years of a boy's life, accumulated in one room. Comic books, hot rod magazines, school mementos, knickknacks, photographs. Junk mostly to anybody but the owner. 
I went through all of it, and through the drawers and chest and through his clothes. Nothing. I looked over the photographs stuck in the mirror tacked on the wall. Some of the names on the boys' pictures were the same as those on the list Carla had given to the police. There were a few pictures of girls and a lot of pictures of hot rods. I picked up an envelope of loose photographs lying in the dresser. They were views of a second-hand panel truck, and in all of the pictures, Eddie was standing beside the truck with obvious pride of ownership. One of the views showed the front license plate. I turned the envelope over. The film had been developed less than two weeks before. I called Carla back into the room and asked her about it. No. No, I didn't know he had a car, or a truck, rather. It may not be his, but I'll lay odds that it is. That look on his face is a dead giveaway. I don't know. He sure kept it a secret. He never brought it here once. Do you recognize the background in those pictures? No. No, I don't. It looks like a storage yard or, or an industrial place of some kind, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd call it that. Do you mind if I take these with me? Of course not. But why? The gang had to use something to haul those furs away from the warehouse. But if, if Eddie was keeping the truck a secret from me, it was because he was planning to use it for the robbery. That one or some other one. Johnny... He was in on it all along. Look, Carla, I've got a hunch Eddie is the leader of that gang. Oh, no. I think the truck was used in the robbery, and I think when we find it, we'll find the furs, and we'll find Eddie. See you later, Carla. <laughs> Expense account item 13, $1.85. Taxi fare from Carla's apartment to the police headquarters office of Lieutenant Garcia. Oh, Johnny, I've been trying to locate you. Oh, what's up? We picked up two of those kids on Carla Monte's list. Friends of Eddie's. Wow, that's a start. Not with one of them. He's in the clear. Perfect alibi. We have something on the other one, though. Want to help me talk to him? Yeah, sure. Oh, say, here are some photographs I picked up in Eddie's room a while ago. We should take a look at them, Garcia. All right, let's see them. The pictures were taken about two or three weeks ago. Now, if this truck is his, his sister doesn't know about it. Yeah, he sure got that owner look on his face. Yeah, he sure has. That second one there shows the license number, see? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You think they might have used this in the robbery, Johnny? It's a possibility. And we're not exactly swamped with angles. I was wondering, too, if you happen to recognize that background behind the truck. No. No, but it looks like it might be down in that area somewhere, the warehouse district. Look, why don't you get some copies made, circulate them, and see if any of your boys can tag the place. Oh, you insurance dicks do get ideas sometimes. Oh, right? you'd be amazed. All right, I'll do it. And now let's go down and talk to that kid. Interrogation room 519 was on the fifth floor. Bare walls painted gray, a business-like room without a doorman or compromise. Furnished only with the necessary table, chairs, and lights. We stopped in the ante room and looked in through the one-way glass window. The boy waited alone at the interrogation table, trying to put up a tough, defiant front, but failing by the tremble of a lip and the occasional flick of his eyes. Well, let's go in. Get it over with. The kid stiffened when he heard the door open, but he didn't turn around. He just sat there at the table, braced and waiting. You can take that chair at the side, Johnny. Okay, thanks. What's your name? You already know it. I said, what's your name? Mario Centaurus. That's your right name? Yeah. Where do you live? Roxman Place, my aunt. Ever been arrested before, Mario? No. Hey, you've got kind of a bad memory, haven't you? Why? September of last year. Arrest made by Officer C.J. Barton. Charge, possession of stolen articles. Hubcap, two auto radios, one camera. I wasn't convicted. I asked if you'd ever been arrested. Not convicted. It was a frame. I didn't have any evidence. No, apparently not. Witnesses for the prosecution refused to testify. Case dismissed. Here, well, what are you going to claim this time, Mario? Another frame up? I don't know why you brought me in here. I don't know anything about anything. That bad memory again, huh? I just don't know what you're talking about. It's lucky for us that Eddie Monty had such a good memory, isn't yes, it? Yes. What it's about it. Eddie? Huh? What, what do you mean? Is he a friend of yours? I know him. He's got a fine memory, that boy. 
Too bad you can't remember things the way he does. What are you talking about? Oh, that's true, all right. Eddie remembers everything that happened. What he did, what Mario did. I don't know what you mean. Oh, that's because of your bad memory, Mario. Why, Eddie remembers the name of every boy who was in on that job and just what each one of them did. What job? That warehouse robbery. Have you forgotten about that? I don't know anything about any robbery. Well, there's been a lot of talk. At least you've heard about it, haven't you? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you've just forgotten. I don't know what you're talking about. When did you see Eddie last? I don't remember. Have you seen him since the robbery? No. How can you be sure? You said you hadn't heard of any robbery. What? I haven't. Still, you haven't seen Eddie since the robbery. Well, I... Come on, Mario. Tell us about it. I guess maybe I did hear about it. So? Well, why shouldn't I hear? It was in the papers. Everybody's been talking about it, so what if I did hear it? I don't prove anything. But you said you hadn't heard. So I forgot. Guy can forget something, can't he? Yeah. If he's got a bad memory, he can. And Mario's got a real bad memory, Johnny. Not Eddie, though. He remembers how you guys loaded those furs into his truck. How you waited across the street in Red Wellers until the prowl car passed. How you slugged the night watchman, Albert Christmas. That's a lie. How do you know it is, Mario? You don't even remember it. Eddie does, though. He even remembers the next night. When you stabbed Red Weller to death to keep him from coming to me. No. No, I didn't do that. Of course you did. You don't think Eddie would lie, do you? It's not true. Makes sense to us. Is Eddie here? You pick him up? How would we know what he remembers unless we picked him up? Now, how do you think we got your name? Out of the telephone book? It's not true what Eddie says. Well, if you've got anything to say, we'll listen to it. But I don't think it's necessary, do you, Johnny? No, I think Eddie remembers everything. Let's get out of here. Yeah. He's lying! You listen to me. I'll tell you the truth. I'll get a stenographer. Johnny Dollar speaking, Lieutenant Garcia's office. Johnny, you're the one I was trying to reach. This is Carla Monte. Oh, I was going to phone you later. What's happening? Have they found Eddie yet? Not yet, but the police picked up one of his friends, Mario Centauri. Oh, Mario, I know him. Well, he's been to the apartment lots of times. Was he in on the robbery? Yes, he just made a statement admitting it. And what did he say about my brother? He says Eddie is the one who planned the whole thing. He must be lying. No, Garcia and I are pretty sure he's telling the truth. I'm sorry, Carla. I'm coming down to headquarters, Johnny. There's no use. There's nothing you can do here. At least I can be there when they bring him in or whatever happens. It won't help. You're better off at home. Now, no, please. Johnny. I raised him. Some of the fault must be mine. I can't desert him. I'm going to be there if he needs me. <sighs> okay, Carla. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office Moto Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silver Blue Matter. Expense account, final page. $100,000 worth of fur coats, silver blue minks, stolen in a warehouse robbery and still missing. A night watchman slugged during the robbery by one of the teenage gang still lying in a coma, unable to speak. And Red Weller, a man who tried to speak, lay in the county morgue, stabbed to death in a dark alley. But now one of the gang had been arrested, a 17-year-old named Mario Santores, and he'd finally talked. Sitting in Garcia's office, I read Mario's statement through for the second time. Well, what do you think, Johnny? I think the kid was telling the truth. Eddie Monty scraped up enough money to buy that second-hand panel truck and then talked the other kids into knocking over the warehouse. That ties in with what Eddie's sister said, that he kept the truck a secret, hadn't told her about it. And also the fact that Eddie seems to be a born leader type. They even mentioned it in one of his former records of arrest. Yeah, I think we can buy it that Eddie Monte is the leader of the gang. Yeah. All right, they picked their night. They cased the place from Red Weller's lunchroom across the street. And as soon as the prowl car passed, they made their move. 
They got the watchman, Albert Crisman, to open the door by showing him a fake telegram through the window. That's another thing that checks out Mario's story, Johnny. Mario claims he's the one who showed the telegram. That's right. Crisman kept saying, kid with a mark on his arm, and Mario's got a bad scar on his left wrist. That's what I mean. It checks out. Mario didn't know what Crisman had told us. All right, so they got inside, and then, according to Mario's version, it was Eddie Marty who slugged the watchman. Probably true. Then they jumped the other watchman in the dark and started hauling out the furs, loading them into the truck of Eddie's. They knew they had 45 minutes before the prowl car came back through. By that time, they'd finished and split up, Eddie driving the truck away alone and the others disappearing on foot. Yeah, I think that's about the size of it. And I think Mario's telling the truth when he says neither he nor any of the others know where Eddie planned to hide out the truck. And Red Weller, according to Mario, was murdered by another gang member. What was his name? Chewy Morel. Yeah. Well, if that's true, Eddie Monty is at least clean on the murder charge. If it's true. All you can tag him on is robbery and assault on that watchman. I'm kind of glad of it, Johnny. I feel sorry for that sister of his. So do I. She's a good kid. And she's carrying a real load of guilt. Thinks that she's responsible in some way. Oh, she was only 19 herself when their folks died. How could she be expected to hold him in line? And especially in that district. Yeah. She's on her way down here, by the way. Carla Monte? Yeah, yeah. I tried to talk her out of it. Well, uh, maybe she's as well off hanging around here, though, as she is waiting alone in that apartment. It's a rough deal for her, no matter where she waits. Well, at least we can tell her her brother's not in quite as deep as we... Excuse me. Yes, yeah, sure. Garcia speaking. Good. Well, who's the other one? Yeah, yeah, bring them on in and book them. I'll talk to them later. And now we... What? When? All right. Keep in touch with me. The boys just picked up Chewy Morel and the other two. And leaves just one to go. Yeah, the big one. Eddie Monte. And he's even bigger now, Johnny. What do you mean? That watchman, Eddie Slugged. Albert Crisman. What about him? He just died. So it was a different thing we had to tell Carla when she arrived at headquarters. Not that her brother would probably get off on a lesser charge. But instead that an APB was out that every officer in town had been warned. Be on the lookout for Eddie Monty, age 19, armed and dangerous. Wanted for murder. Expense account item 15, $12.50, rent on a hired car. One of Garcia's boys was certain that the background appearing in the photograph of Eddie's truck was somewhere in his district, but he couldn't tag the exact spot. So I decided to cruise that area street by street. Carla Monte, Eddie's sister, went along with me. There's an alley off to the right, Johnny. It might be worth a look. Yeah, it runs back toward a lumber yard there. That could be a lumber yard in the background of that photograph. Well, we'll give it a try. This isn't it, Johnny. Sally makes a right angle turn there before it even gets to the lumber yard. Well, we may as well check it on through. It seems to run clear on down to the railroad yards. Please let us find him. If it's the police, he'll fight. And he'll kill someone else. Be killed himself, maybe. It's out of your hands now, Carl. It's got to work itself out in its own way. There's nothing much anybody can do to stop it or change it. I know, Johnny. I keep trying to fool myself. All the time I know. Well, all you can do is hope... Look! That fence ahead of us there. Next to the railroad yards. Yeah, that could be the fence in these pictures. It looks the same. And that storage shed there at the right. That's in one of the shots. Yeah. And that pile of oil drums. This is it, Carla. This is where those films were taken. The truck was parked right at the corner of that shed. Well... It looks as though that off chance paid off. I'm scared, Johnny. Now that it's so close, I'm scared. Don't be. By off chance, I meant just finding the place. He may not have come back here since the day those pictures were taken. You don't believe that, and you know it. Look, Carla. That house back at the corner has a phone. There's a wire running in from the pole. Go back there and use it to call Lieutenant Garcia. Give him the location and tell him to hit the radio and have this whole area blocked off. Got it? Yes. Tell him to cover the railroad yard, too. Sew up this whole section tight and tell him to make it fast. Johnny. Yeah. Eddie may be watching us from around here somewhere right this minute. I waited until she'd gone. Then I got out of the car and walked toward the shed and the sagging wooden fence that bordered the railroad yards. It was nearly dark now. The high floodlights had been turned on above the crisscross network of gleaming steel tracks. Shadows play tricks at such a time of evening, and I got sudden movements now and then from the corner of my eyes, but, well, yet nothing really moved. The only sound was the sound of my own footsteps. I stopped several times and stood watching and listening. 
but nothing moved. There was only silence. I reached the door of the long wooden shed and found it padlocked. But looking in through a broken window, I could see the lock didn't matter. The shed was empty and long abandoned. Between it and the fence was a drive leading toward the rear. And behind the shed in a loading area, I found Eddie's truck. And in the back of it was $100,000 worth of furs. All right, darling. Uh, Get your hands up. Eddie, you're in a rut. That's the first thing you said to me the last time we met. I ought to killed you there in that apartment. Isn't one killing enough? I don't suppose you know it, but Albert Chrisman died this afternoon. I know. I got a radio in the truck there. That's where you've been hiding out all the time? Look. If I wanted to answer questions, I'd go turn myself in. You may be better off in the long run if you do. Now, I get... You here alone? No, no, your sister's with me. Oh, for the love... What does she want to do? Watch me get it? Why don't you give me that gun, Eddie? It's only a matter of time, you know that. You don't have a chance. Oh, I think you I got a pretty good chance right here in my head. Chance at what? To break Carla's heart? Smash her into the dirt killer, maybe? Shut up. What more do you want to do to her before you're through? I'm not planning to be through. Oh, that's great. But the police are doing some planning of their own. They gotta find me first. I found you, didn't I? And I ought to kill you right where you're standing. Is that all you gotta think about, Eddie? To kill somebody and go on killing until one of them kills you? Shut up! Let me think. Think about Carla if you want to think about something. Think about the things she's done for you, the years she's worked for you, worried about you. Yeah, that dame was born to worry. Nobody's born to worry. They inherit worries like you were inherited by her. I didn't ask her to do it. Life didn't give her any choice. But it's too late now to talk about that. It's all over, Eddie. This is the wind-up. Come on, now, give yourself up. You haven't got a chance. Oh, and I would have if I gave myself up. Don't you hand me that stuff. The police have got this whole section surrounded. Carla went to call them 20 minutes ago. If I thought you were trying to hand me... Keep your mouth shut. Eddie, you don't have a chance. Johnny, Lieutenant Garcia's here. Be careful, Eddie's here. You dirty... I hit the dirt and rolled under the truck and came up on the other side with my gun in my hand. I could hear Eddie running away, but I couldn't tell where he was. Tony, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Eddie went over the fence into the yards. Where are you? Here, the corner of the shed. Come on, let's go after him. He can't get through. I've got men working this way from the other side. Where's Carla? Back there somewhere. Come on, we can get through the fence here. Carla, stay where you are. Don't follow us. There he goes, Johnny. Behind that line of freight cars. All right, come on. He can't get too far that way. There's a train coming. There he goes. He's going to try to beat it. The crazy Eddie! Santa Maria! I don't know, Johnny. There must be better ways to die. Expense account item 16, $300.60. Hotel and miscellaneous in Los Angeles and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $541.25. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Well, I guess Carla made the remarks for me. I don't know, Johnny. Those 80 fur coats, they'll go back into stock now. And they'll be sold to women who will wear them to parties and dances and nightclubs. And they'll be happy in them. And they'll never know about Eddie, or about me, or what happened here tonight. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week... The matter of the medium, well done. And a seance or two that I think you'll like. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Shawnee Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Edgar Barrier, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Tommy Cook, and Richard Crenna. 
Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of your...